Good morning, it's 9 a.m. and we'll call this meeting to order. Carrie, will you please take roll? Chair Brooks. <laughs> Vice Chair Arascata. Chair. Regent Boylan. Aye. Regent Brager. Here. Regent Brown. Here. Regent Carvalho. Here. Regent Cruz Crawford. Here. Regent Del Carlo. Here. Regent Downs. Here. Regent Goodman. Here. Regent McMichael. Here. Regent Perkins. Here. Regent Tarkanian. Here. You have a quorum present. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'd also like to recognize Deputy Attorney General Chrissy Harris, who is with us here today, um, to ensure that we are following within the guidelines of open meeting law. Um, thank you again for being here. We appreciate your guidance. At the request of President Hetlins and President Sandoval, um, agenda item number 10 has been withdrawn from the agenda. Um, this matter will come before us again at a future board meeting. I'll now move on to agenda number uh, one, which is public comment. Is there any public comment in Elko? There is no public comment in Elko. Thank you. Is there oh, any public comment in Reno? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Jason Geddes, G-E-D-D-E-S. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And in my 16 plus years of service on this board, uh, I found uh, Carrie to be one of the most um, hardworking, diligent uh, people in the system. And you know, whenever you step into a meeting that your agendas are right, the information behind your agendas are right, and every regent can walk into the room and make an informed vote, an informed decision, because all of the information that she provides to you and for you in advance of the meeting and at the meeting. And I just want to endorse uh, Carrie's recommendation and encourage the entire board to vote for her to be the permanent chief of staff. And hey, Carrie, I see you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any additional there is. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Theo Meek, M-E-E-K, and I too am here today to strongly support the appointment of Carrie's Chief of Staff to the NC Board of Regents. As a former NC employee, I had the incredible privilege of working frequently with Carrie, and I must say she is an absolute inspiration. Her leadership is nothing short of outstanding, and her dedication to her role is unparalleled. What I believe truly sets Carrie apart is her incredible grace and patience, especially during those moments when I, as a junior, uh, stumbled and came close to missing internal deadlines. Instead of reproach, she offered understanding and a genuine willingness to assist, fostering a supportive and collaborative work environment that brought out the best of everyone, all, of traits, all traits of which are unteachable and unfortunately rare in today's modern workplace. In the face of marked turbulence and challenges, both within the board and external, I witnessed Carrie remain a steady and level-headed force, providing stability during times of incredible instability. With Carrie at the helm of Chief of Staff, I have full confidence that the board will continue to navigate challenges with confidence and resilience. Her remarkable leadership and expertise make her the ideal candidate for this crucial role and an invaluable asset to the board. I wholeheartedly endorse Carrie's appointment as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents. Her professionalism and knowledge will undoubtedly contribute to the success and progress of our system in the years to come. Thank you for considering my endorsement. I encourage the Board to appoint Carrie as Chief of Staff. With her guidance, the Board of Regents will continue to make a positive impact on the community it serves. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment in Reno? Yes. Uh, for the record, my name is Peter Reed, and I'm the director of the Sanford Center for Aging at the UNR School of Medicine and a professor of public health. I serve as chair of the Faculty Senate at UNR for the 2023-24 academic year, 
And recently, I had the honor of being selected by the faculty senate chairs across NG institutions to serve as the chair of the Council of Faculty Senate Chairs. I'm deeply grateful for their confidence in selecting me to serve as a key point of contact for the Chancellor and Board of Regents representing faculty across the system. I will work hard to present perspectives to you as regents that represent the collective and respective priorities across the system as shared with me by Senate chairs and other faculty constituents. I also invite you to draw heavily upon the collective and individual knowledge and wisdom available from faculty across the system. And she faculty, both academic and administrative, have undeniable expertise in a wide range of relevant substantive areas and have extensive experience in academic leadership. As such, faculty are a critical resource to you as regents, as well as a resource to the chancellor, campus presidents, and other campus leaders. The Council of Senate Chairs represents faculty from every campus, as well as every academic discipline and functional area on campuses. Thus, as a body, we offer entree into the rich resource of faculty knowledge, skills, and experience. This resource can be formally leveraged at both the system and campus levels through a robust and active commitment to shared governance, engaging faculty prior to making decisions on policy, procedures, or hiring of leaders. Senate chairs were pleased that Chair Brooks and Vice Chair Arascata took advantage of this opportunity for faculty input this past Monday, requesting our input on attributes for the acting chancellor position. Informally, there are opportunities as well to support <laughs> transparent communication with faculty as decisions are being made that affect their lives, to have regular meetings between campus leaders and faculty leaders with a bi-directional flow of information, and initiating creative opportunities for campus leaders to listen to faculty campus-wide. Each Reed, of these are informal opportunities. Dr. Yes. Reed, I, I apologize for inter interrupting you. Um, we, we have exceeded the, the two minutes for, for public comment. <laughs> But I appreciate you. Okay, I, I apologize for that. Yes, yeah, this is my first time presenting this. I thought one page would be uh, within the time limit. So I appreciate your consideration of these points and encourage you to embrace shared governance as an opportunity for collaborative leadership across the system. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Cavanaugh, C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. For the past year, I served as faculty senate chair and the NFA vice president at TMCC. During that year, rumors that President Hilgerson was attempting to negotiate a way out of her periodic evaluation were brought to me on multiple occasions by concerned faculty. In March, the TMCC NFA officers asked the president about these rumors directly, and she assured us that she would be completing her periodic evaluation and pursuing another four-year contract. The concerned faculty were reassured by the fact that the periodic evaluation process had begun including the submission of the president's self-evaluation and the appointment of the evaluation committee. Now, in the middle of July, when the academic faculty are off contract and difficult to reach, we learn that the president is, in fact, requesting a waiver of her evaluation and a one-year extension of her contract. Speaking on my own behalf, again, because getting a meaningful survey of faculty opinions in the middle of July is impossible, I have concerns. The president has not at this point formally announced her separation. She has merely suggested that she will do so if she is granted the extension and a waiver of her periodic evaluation. The purpose of Title II, Chapter 2.2 is to prevent institutions from wasting time on the evaluation of a president whose departure is imminent. If the president wants to leave TMCC, I do not begrudge her that. This is the second time in the past year that the president has seriously discussed leaving, and I am extremely sympathetic to the desire she has expressed to be closer to family. But if she is one foot out the door, it would be better for the institution to simply move on. If the president wants to retire effective the end of her current contract and therefore waive the periodic evaluation, then I wish her well. But if the extension is granted, the president would not be re retiring for nearly two years. In that case, the periodic evaluation should go forward as scheduled to maintain compliance with Title II, Chapter 2.2, which states that a periodic evaluation should occur at least every four years. The periodic evalua evaluation process is not simply an evaluation of one person's performance. It is an evaluation of the institution, its success metrics, and its culture under that person's leadership. It is a beneficial process for all involved and should not be issued. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jim New, N-E-W. I am president of the TMCC chapter of the Nevada Faculty Alliance. President Hilgerson's request for both an extension of her contract and a waiver of her periodic evaluation is flawed. 
Chapter 2, Section 2.2 of the Procedures and Guidelines Manual permits the board to waive the periodic evaluation if the president has announced their separation at least 12 months before the contract expiration. There is no mention of contract extensions in this policy. To qualify for a waiver, President Hilgerson must retire at the end of this fiscal year, not the next. The same policy, however, also requires these comprehensive evaluations to occur, quote, at least every four years, unquote. Even if President Hilgerson's contract is extended to June 30th, 2025, this policy still requires the evaluation in fiscal year 24 since the last one was conducted in fiscal year 20. As mentioned before, this is the second time in less than a year that President Hilgerson has projected her desire to leave TMCC. Last October, she was a finalist for a presidency in Washington. It is clear she doesn't want to stay, and it will be difficult for the employees to have confidence in her leadership for an extended period. I urge the board to either grant the extension but conduct the evaluation, or grant the waiver with the proviso that the separation is effective on June 30th, 2024. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Regents Chair Brooks and members of the Board of Regents. My name is Kevin Melcher. I am here to speak to item three, appointment Chief of Staff of the Board of Regents. I'm in favor of approving this item and urge your strong and unanimous support for appointment of Interim Chief of Staff Kerry Nikolajewski to serve as Chief of Staff for the Board of Regents. My background is in education, education administration. During my career, I was involved in numerous local and state boards and committees related to education at all levels. While living in Elko and now back home in Reno since my retirement, higher education and nonprofits have been my focus for serving and giving back to local communities in the state. My experience with governing boards extends from serving on the NC Board of Regents, Nevada State Board of Education, and now the Northwest Commission for Colleges and Universities, as well as numerous local nonprofits. I have learned over the years that in order for a governing board to be successful, it is critical to have strong professional staff leaders with institutional experience who can assist in making sure boards are prepared with necessary materials and other meeting preparations. The Chief of Staff for NC Board of Regents is critical for successful and smooth board operations. I know Carrie Nikolajewski through my work with NCHI and have watched her perform exceptionally well in the past number of years and during some very difficult times. Carrie Nikolajewski has always worked hard in collaboration with fellow staff to support members of the Board of Regents so they are able to perform their work efficiently. Nevada System of Higher Education is in a critical time of rebuilding, and I believe it is crucial to make sure quality employees are retained and their knowledge and skills are utilized. I urge the Board of Regents to vote and approve Kerry Nikolajewski as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents. Thank you for all of your outstanding service to Nevada. Good morning, Angela Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R, and I will speak on agenda item three, appointment chief of staff to the Board of Regents. Carrie Nikolajewski has worked admirably and tirelessly for this board for 21 years in several different positions and the past two and a half years as your interim chief of staff. This position has a daunting amount of responsibility, but carries attention to detail in board operations, policy and procedure, and the open meeting law are unparalleled. Carrie is willing, ready, and able to serve this board with the highest quality of professionalism. I support this appointment 100% and look forward to helping her provide the highest quality of service to this board. I thought it was important to highlight comments from Scott Wasserman. He said, having worked with Carrie during my entire tenure in the board office, I am personally aware of Carrie's dedication to the Board of Regents, her highly qualified skills for this position, her strong integrity, and her unwavering work ethic. Carrie is uniquely qualified to be successful in the position of Chief of Staff as she understands the operations of the board as well as the role of the individual regents. She thoroughly knows the operation of the board office and the interaction of the board office with the system, the campuses, other public officials, and the general public. Given her role in the board office for almost 20 years, Carrie has a vast amount of experience and knowledge of the complex issues that the board has and will continue to face. I encourage the board to review the 15 public comment sub submissions supporting this nomination. Past and present leadership, coworkers, and friends 
all support this appointment. Because they know Carrie is the right person for this job. I also want to note that many current employees hesitated to provide public comment today, but I promise you, Carrie has an army standing with her, ready to help her succeed in this position. Thank you. My name is Dr. Sarah Kyes, K-E-Y-E-S, and I am speaking on behalf of UNR with regard to the dual enrollment program. I am the faculty coordinator for UNR's dual enrollment U.S. history courses, and my comment this morning pertains to the University High School Reciprocal Partnership as at the center of UNR's rigorous dual enrollment program. In the U.S. history course I coordinate, the best example of this reciprocal partnership has been our collaborative development of the year-long family history project. This rigorous project tasks students with researching, analyzing, writing, and presenting about their family history. By the end of the year, each student has written the equivalent of 20 pages for this project alone. And that's not counting the pages they write for their essay exams and their short assignments. That's a significant amount of writing for college students, and let alone for high school students. But for the most part, the dual enrollment US history students, supported directly by their high school teachers, who were in turn supported by me, met this rigorous goal. And these students met this goal because the high school teachers and I worked out a plan and a schedule to support them along the way. And because of the creativity of these high school teachers, students produced final products I hadn't even considered. These projects took the form not only of papers, but also websites, documentaries, podcasts, and even Pinterest pages. Overall, what I saw when I looked at these projects was overwhelming evidence of not only the rigor of our course, but also students' ability to achieve at the college level. But that's not all. Students also benefited personally from these projects. Through their research, many students were able to uncover and to celebrate the sacrifices their families had made for Nevada and the United States, whether as first responders or through military service. Some of these projects were also histories of Americans working to access the American dream of people who came to this country for the promise of opportunity and advancement. And through expanding access to college level courses, the UNR dual enrollment program is doing its part to help students achieve that American promise. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Dr. Jim Weber and my colleague I'm a professor at UNR, and I'm the coordinator for English 101 and 102 in the dual credit program. I understand concerns have been voiced about teacher preparation and qualifications, and I'd like to provide my perspective. When the program began, I wasn't sure how I'd replicate our preparation for new instructors, which includes a summer orientation, graduate coursework, and professional development. But as I worked with teachers, I realized two things. One is that we could deliver the content of our graduate course, our mentoring, and our professional development through biweekly meetings with new teachers. Returning teachers participate in assessment and mentoring, and the Clark County School District recognizes these meetings by awarding continuing education credits for teachers' participation. Two, teachers come to the partnership with expertise in instruction, with mo which most of our new instructors don't have. When we combine the teachers' strengths with the programs, we can do things we couldn't do before. For example, over the last two years, everything from the major projects to the informal assignments of our courses have been revised when we developed year-long courses. We can now see when we have incorrectly assumed that students already knew how to do something, and our adaptations for concurrent enrollment have helped us teach our on-campus students more effectively. We don't get to have these kinds of conversations on campus because there's not dedicated time. I share this example to show how my perspective has shifted. My focus now is not whether concurrent enrollment is equivalent to on-campus teaching, but rather how the partnership has improved our program. I'm grateful for the investments NSHE and UNR have made in this program, and I want to continue to develop the partnership. I would be happy to share our materials so you can see how we prepare new teachers and develop returning teachers over multiple years. As someone who has prepared new instructors, for the last 12 years, I can say that the concurrent enrollment process is more robust than what we do on campus. Thank you. Mr. Chair. 
Quick question for Council King. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam uh, King, is it uh, legal or justified that employees on the on the clock who are being paid are taking that time to step forward to gush all good things about a, a certain person who is an applicant an applicant for a job? They're being paid by uh, the government, or you can say, oh, you know, taxpayers. Is it correct that they can do that? Linda King, Associate General Counsel for System Administration. Regent Boylan, that would be a matter between that particular employee and their supervisor and handled at the campus level. And the supervisor is the person that they're standing in favor of. So what do you mean by that? I don't understand that legally. In well, when you're in your job, everyone has a chain of command and has someone who's going to be approving their time away from their duties. So that would be an individual employee matter that would be handled through their supervisor. And they team. would have to have had permission to get that done. So each Most one likely. of them has asked permission of the applicant to allow them to sing praises of the applicant during a board meeting. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that we have an applicant, um, and I don't know that permission from, from the individual that they're speaking of is... is necessary. We do have a waiver on file for the particular agenda item that the public comment is referring to. But as far as your, the crux of your question as to whether or not those employees have obtained the permission to be off the clock, so to speak, it would be a matter that would be handled at their campus level. And I wouldn't have any knowledge as to those individual cases. Campus level, it's a board level. It's from the board. This is a position for the board. Correct. But you've, ah. you've asked about the individuals who are making public comment, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, so you've asked about individuals who are at the campus level, whether or not they have permission to step away from their duties to make public comment, which is part of the process for matters within, their, within your jurisdiction, the board, as the ultimate employer of these individuals. I think that it probably is permissible, but whether or not those individuals have worked out through something with their supervisory chain of command, I would have no knowledge of that. Interesting. Thank you so much, ma'am. Is there any additional public comment in Reno? There's no additional comment in Reno. Thank you. Let's move to public comments here in Las Vegas. Good morning. Molly Apple, A-P-P-E-L for the record. I am the Nevada State Faculty Senate Chair, but I speak today as an ENCHI educator and proud former K-12 teacher. I ask my regents and presidents to approach today's dual enrollment discussion from the understanding that high school teachers are our colleagues in this work. High school teachers have immense subject knowledge and more often than not, far more pedagogical expertise than faculty in higher education. And she should promote opportunities for genuine exchange and collaboration between dual enrollment educators and college educators teaching the same courses, rather than strictly operating in a top-down oversight model. And I think some of my colleagues up in Reno that their uh, public comment has spoke to the benefits of this. Doing so will not only result in helping Nevada students earn college credits, but gain the sense of belonging that helps them get to graduation. And I'm very happy to speak to how I've piloted some of these approaches with my English composition colleagues at Nevada State. Approached with this mindset, dual enrollment has the potential to be a grassroots vector for improving education overall in our state. Additionally, given the number of ENSHE students our high school colleagues teach, I encourage everyone at ENSHE to support CCEA's current efforts towards gaining fair and equitable pay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tony Giddens, G-I-D-D-E-N-S. I am the Nevada State Apprenticeship Director. 
And I'm here on behalf of the Nevada State Apprenticeship Council to request some assistance from the Board of Regents under NRS 610.030, uh, which highlights the creation of our Apprenticeship Council. Uh, two members of that council are from the Nevada State Higher Education System. One is a representative of a community college located in a county whose population is 700,000 or more, which is appointed by the chancellor of the Nevada State Higher Education System. And the other is a representative of a community college located in a county whose population is less than 700,000, also appointed by the chancellor. As of today, our Northern Nevada representative has been absent, uh, non-existent for over a year, and we just recently lost, or I'm sorry, our Southern Nevada, and our Northern Nevada, we just recently lost about a month and a half ago. Uh, so I'm approaching you today to request some assistance in getting those members filled. We really appreciate working with our uh, system of higher education and learning and developing programs that better assist our Nevada residents in learning trades and jobs that will provide them with great living uh, and work opportunities. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bill Robinson, uh, technically chair of the UNOE Faculty Senate. Uh, I wasn't going to speak because you pulled the agenda item off that I was uh, going to talk about, but it's related. I do, last time I already spoke in favor of Gary and um, I'll do that again as long as I'm here, that there's there's no way you could find anybody who'd be better at that job than, than she's going to be. Um, dual enrollment. I just want to put in your heads, we have, one of the fundamental problems we have in our system is competition, who goes where, who can do what, who can go where. I live Foothill High School, I go past there every morning, it's walking distance from CSN. It's a mile as the Scorpion runs from NSC. It's 400 miles closer to um, UNLV than UNR, but it seems to be the UNR. There's a big sign out front that says, we're UNR, dual enrollment. If you're worried about quality, having somebody be able to walk across the street and sit with that faculty member and sit in their classes and work with them seems to be the better way to go. And it seems to me that if we end up with four different institutions trying to all function in that one high school, that we're not gonna be as optimal as we could be, that that'll be wasteful or, and we system is, every study you've ever had done of the system says, there's too much duplication, too many, too many people in the same place at the same time trying to do the same thing. So I'm in favor of dual enrollment. I, I love that idea. But maybe this is another opportunity to look at how we manage in the system to get the best effect for the least cost. Just thank you. For the record, uh, Nicholas Voskov, that's V as in Victor, A-S-K-O, V as in Victor, Chairman Brooks, and members of the Board of Regents, it's my pleasure to offer these public comments in support of the appointment of Carrie Nikolajewski as Chief of Staff to the Board. I have known Carrie for more than 10 years, dating back to when I served as System Counsel and Director of Real Estate Planning, and she was serving as Special Assistant and Program Coordinator for the Board. Carrie's talent and passion for public service and higher education was evident from the beginning. Her career progression at ENSHI and within the board uh, staff is a testament to her talent, work ethic, and loyalty. Later, when I served as system general counsel and Carrie served as deputy chief of staff, we worked closely almost daily on issues ranging from agenda preparation to board governance. Carrie's knowledge of board policy is second to none and I always sought out, leaned on, and valued her opinion. I know firsthand from working in the system office that the position of chief of staff is a challenging one. The duties are diverse and include everything from agenda management to open meeting law compliance to serving as corporate secretary and even travel agent for members of the board. For, but for several reasons, I am confident that no person is better prepared than Carrie to succeed as your chief of staff. First, Carrie is easy to work with and is the consummate professional. 
She brings a team first approach to her work. She manages and leads from a human level and she promotes joy in the workplace. <clears throat> when others are cynical about the role of higher education in society or the ability of NC to accomplish important things, Carrie is not. In my experience, to be successful, attitude is equally important as abilities and Carrie's is second to none. Second, Carrie has successfully performed the job for the past two and a half years. I think it is fair to say that the past few years have been a time of immense change and challenge for the system and board office. Through it all, Carrie has been a rock and is a rare and valuable source of institutional knowledge. Uh, I encourage you to offer calorie, Carrie a salary that is more than the minimum for the grade established for the position. Doing so will send a strong signal that the entire NC staff, to the entire NC staff, and women in particular. Sir, that thank this you for board, your public comment. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, you've exceeded the two minutes that, uh, that a lot for this, but thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Regents. My name is Winter Lipson, L-I-P-S-O-N. I stand before you to voice my support for my boss, Carrie Nikolajewski, to be permanently appointed as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents. In August 2020, Carrie assumed the Chief of Staff duties while still employed as the Deputy Chief of Staff. In January 2021, she was officially appointed as Interim Chief of Staff and has been serving as Interim for over two years. At this year's April 21st special meeting, the board voted to split the chief of staff and special counsel position. Now it is time to rally around Carrie, support and reward her dedication and leadership, as that would only continue to benefit and strengthen the board and the system. With that, I would like to take this time to highlight some comments submitted by Carrie's current and former colleagues. Former acting chief of staff Scott Young wrote, I work closely with Carrie daily. I was impressed with her knowledge of all aspects of board operations. It is also of inestimable value to have a leader possessed of a long institutional knowledge with the board. There is no substitute for experience. Carrie is that person. A 12-year executive at UNLV shared, she demonstrates the highest levels of professionalism and is a skilled leader. She provides clear vision, direction, and feedback, and she is attentive to details. A colleague in the system office said she has served the board well in an interim capacity multiple times and has spent over 20 years with the NCHI, working with nearly 50 regions in that period of time. That kind of commitment and institutional history and longevity is hard to come by in this day and age. You as a board need that kind of stability behind the scenes. We just heard from former NCHI general counsel and vice chancellor for legal affairs, Nick Vaskov, and I wanna highlight something that he said in his written comments. When others are cynical about the role of higher education in society or the ability of NG to accomplish important things, Carrie is not. That last statement is an important one to leave off on because at times being a public servant is not easy. And when the going gets tough, one can start to lose faith in this line of work. Carrie is the person I turn to when I feel downtrodden in my job. No matter how challenging things become, and we have some very difficult times over the past few years, Carrie's faith in the board and system has never wavered. Allow Carrie the opportunity to own this job and lead our department within a permanent capacity. Let's move forward with this so we can be successful in supporting you as you support Enchi and the state of Nevada. Thank you. Is there any further public comment here in Las Vegas? Okay, so I know that this is um, a little bit out of order. Uh, Regent Breger, would you uh, do us the great favor of, of leading us in the pledge? Thank you. Thank you. We can begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll now move into agenda item number two. These are consent items. Um, certainly the consent items uh, 2A through 2C um, can be um, really taken together and, and, and acted um, in one motion unless there's a request to pull one or more items um, from that consideration. Mr. Chair, Laura Perkins here. I, I didn't have time to text. <laughs> Um, I'd like to pull um, number B, not for discussion, but just to single it out, um, and, and uh, if you don't mind. No, Regent Perkins, I don't, I don't mind at all. Are there any other regents who would like a consent item to be pulled for discussion? 
So I think what we'll do then is that um, I'll entertain a, a, a really a motion to approve consent items 2A and 2C. I make the motion to approve 2A and 2C. Is there a second? A second. Was that Regent Downs? Yes. Thank you, Regent Downs. So the, the, the motion is from Regent Boyland to approve consent items 2A and 2C, seconded by Regent Downs. Is there any discussion in that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or yay. Aye. 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 Those who oppose say no or nay. Consent items 2A and 2C have been approved. We will now open up the conversation for consent item 2B. Uh, Regent Perkins, why don't you start us off with that? Um, first of all, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, item number B. However, I'd like to also say congratulations to the faculty, um, to Dr. Pollard, and all the people that worked to make this happen, the legislature, um, our esteemed leader, the acting chancellor, and all the people that made this happen. Thank you, Regent Perkins. Is there a second to the motion to approve 2B? Second. I will second. Regent Carvalho. So we have a, a motion from Regent Perkins, a second from Regent Carvalho to uh, approve um, item 2B. Uh, is there any discussion in that? Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to echo what uh, my colleague, Regent Perkins said, congratulations to Nevada State University. Uh, that this, is, this has come a long way and I'm very proud of the work that you've done. So thank you, President Pollard and everybody at Nevada State. Is there any other discussion? Okay, seeing, seeing no, no other discussion, um, again, this motion was um, generated by Regent Perkins, seconded by Regent Carvalho to approve consent item 2B. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye or yes. Aye. 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 Those who do not approve, please signify by saying no or nay. And uh, consent item 2B passes. We will now move right into agenda item number three. This is the appointment for chief of staff to the Board of Regents. Chair. I would like to make a motion, and Chair. I move Regent to Goodman. appoint Ch Carrie Nikolajewski as our chief of staff um, for the Board of Regents. I would um, second that. So, <clears throat> In front of us is a motion generated by Regent Goodman, seconded by um, Regent Breger, to approve the appointment uh, of Carrie Nikolajewski to serve as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents. Um, we will now move into discussion. Regent. Linda King, Associate General Counsel for System Administration. If Regent Goodman could clarify whether or not her motion includes, as the agenda item states, the contract terms that are associated mm -hmm. with the position. I would like to restate my motion uh, to state moving to approve Carrie Nikolajewski as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents and approval of the proposed contract terms. And the second keeps the second. Late. Okay, so the new motion on the floor um, is by Regent Goodman for the consideration and appointment of uh, Carrie Nikolajewski to serve as Chief of Staff to the Board of Regents. And in that is the approval of the proposed contract terms that was seconded by Regent Breger. And we will now move into discussion. Regent Boylan. Thank you, sir. Um, my first question really is, and my first statement is, the salary that's being offered for a staff position, which is basically an office manager position, is being is twice, maybe three times that of some faculty members at our R1 institutes. This is ridiculous. If anybody has looked at what's being offered, 
our congressmen and congresswomen don't get that salary. This seems to me just a farce. It's a friendship thing to hand over a bunch of money and a title to someone. The position has not been evaluated. HR has not supplied the board with a position description questionnaire. HR has not described anything at all about uh, a conductive search being uh, a competitive, sorry, competitive search being conducted. And we have no real evaluation of the applicant. We are wanting to evaluate a president of a, uni of a college, Dr. Elgerson, and we, there are people asking that she should be evaluated and not be evaluated, etc. But in such a case, in a case as, as this, this is all about trying to stop us having our own council and chief of staff position. And we can see the effects of that on this board. Has the applicant been evaluated? I have not seen any evaluations ever. Has the applicant been evaluated for this position? This position is offering a tremendous amount of money with less than sufficient work for that position. Are you seriously telling me as a board and anybody who stands up for this that this position means more to education than a faculty member? This is ridiculous, and that's all I can say. I've seen this develop over the years, and I've seen, in my opinion, that this was just a friendship move, everybody gushing about the applicant. We have not had a private or a closed session and to evaluate the applicant. So I, for one, am strongly against this, and I think that I did ask for, to make a motion before Regent Goodman did, but that's okay, because I was going to table, ask for a motion to table this. This is not the appropriate time, and we do not have enough information, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. There was so much to um, un un unpack in, in some of that that I think it might be best to hear from council to be able to articulate some of the questions that it seems that you have regarding the position and regarding salary. So I'll ask council to weigh in on uh, sorting out some of the, the questions that were raised by Regent Boylan. Thank you, sir. Linda King, Associate General Counsel for System Administration. Um, I took some notes, so <laughs> I'll attempt to address the, the points um, that you've brought up that, to the extent that I can from a legal perspective. Um, I do believe that uh, Ms. Nikolajewski has been in the interim position for approximately 27 months and has had evaluations during that time, as well as over the course of her 21 years of service to the Board of Regents. Um, as far as a position description questionnaire and an evaluation by HR, your briefing paper reflects that that was done. That was done at the request of the legal office as we reviewed this agenda item to ensure because the position of chief of staff has changed quite drastically over the years, we wanted to have a current evaluation of the position. HR did what that evaluation, which in human resources parlance is often called a comp and class evaluation, and HR determined that the position of chief of staff, which is the separated position without special counsel, remains in the grade three and G executive salary range. And that information's in your briefing paper. Um, the position of chief of staff without legal duties was originally classified in that um, salary range dating back to 2007. Um, as far as a competitive search, uh, interim positions, as this board knows and was comment and has commented upon in your April 21st meeting, um, are generally distinguished from an acting position so that an interim candidate can be considered for permanent appointment without a search. Uh, your handbook supports internal promotions for act administrative faculty positions uh, without any type of search. Um, so this would be an appropriate action to take today. Uh, from a legal perspective. Let's go ahead. So, uh, <laughs> Chair Brooks, thank you. This is, when you say faculty 
administrative faculty position. What exactly do you mean by that? This is not a faculty position. And also, you, when you say that HR gave us the information, it was at 8 o'clock the night before last. We have supplied all this information at the last moment to just bamboozle yeah. us and force us to make a decision on such short notice. Now, another thing I have. One regent asked for this to be put on the agenda, while three regents asked for it to be removed. But the power of one region, thanks to the chair, is more, more so than that of three regions. And that, of course, is something that he'll have to answer to, or not. But when you say a faculty administrative position, how do you yeah, say that? Let me, let me clarify, because I'm using a term of art from your handbook. Um, there are different classes of employees. There are administrative faculty, academic faculty, and classified employees. Yeah. So there are three subsets. So I think that sometimes when legal uses terms of arts, it can be, confu <clears throat> it can be confusing because you, when you think of faculty, you think of professors. You think of people in a, in a traditional <clears throat> teaching and research role. Yes, ma'am. But the contracts that, for example, although you select your chief internal auditor and although you select your chief of staff, those individuals are under the handbook an administrative faculty member, just like I am and just like your chief general counsel, Mr. Martinez, is. Yes, ma'am. So the contract is called an administrative faculty contract. And for those positions when they're interim, you can make a permanent appointment with a thorough justification and an HR evaluation without a competitive search, which of course normally is your general rule, but that is an appropriate exception. Um, and I think that covers what you mentioned, but I know that Chair Brooks would like to address the other point. Go yeah, ahead. Thank you. So, thank you, sir. Um, uh, I mean, thank you, ma'am. Regent Boylan, just, just so that we're clear on process yes, and procedure, there is no process or procedure in which regents have the capability to motion via email a agenda item that will be heard. In fact, it is quite possible that placing more than five regents in an email and asking for something very specific to come that will be that will appear before us in a meeting could be could possibly be a violation of OML. No, sir. Well, well, keep going. Excuse yes, me. I'm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, regardless of whether you agree that that there could be an issue there or not. The fact would remain that there's no process to generate a motion via email to table an item. And that would only take place during a meeting when an agenda item is heard. And so I hope that suffices your, your, your question that you pose regarding that. There is a distinction in that and regents making a request but they are not the same. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And then with your permission, let me go on to say, I know the steps, I know what's in our policy, I know what's in the handbook, and it was a request by three regions. It was not so much a part of the policy. If we are going according to policy, there is no such position in our policy, in our handbook, and HR has stated wrong that that is a position according to, I have the uh, exact, um, there is a position for a council and chief of staff. There is no such position for chief of staff. What is in our handbooks and policy according to you that we should go by, that we should have a council and chief of staff. We haven't done that, but we are chasing this position, chief of staff which is not in our handbook, which is not in our policies, which is nowhere to be found. But if you want to go and say that you're doing things by policy, then let's really do things by policy, sir. I, I, I appreciate that, Regent Borland. So if you were to take a look at perhaps some of the supplemental material that did come in, and, and by the way, it's very reasonable to, to, to offer that while I agree it's unfortunate when regents get inundated with supplemental information, prior to a meeting, sometimes 24 hours, 48 hours. It's a lot for us to be able to digest so that we're able to make a responsible vote if, if a vote is required on an agenda item. 
It's certainly not unusual, though, for supplemental information to come to us 24 hours before a meeting, particularly at a time where um, there are plenty of folks from the system office who are taking various various leave and, and, and time away from their work. Um, the, in that supplemental information, you would find that there has been a separation approved by the board so that we have two very distinct positions with inside the um, system office regarding the board specifically. One is a chief of staff. The other is council. They are no longer the same. And so while there has certainly been some conversation that we have brushed upon in, in other meetings about what that council position looks like, um, there, there shouldn't be any, any level of confusion based on the votes that, that we, we took in, I think it was April, that we did break this into two very distinct positions. And so I just, I, I hope that answers the, the question regarding regents receiving supplemental information late. And also I hope it addresses the fact that we have, we did vote on this, it, it did pass. Um, and again, I would defer over to council in terms of the very specifics of that, because I, frankly, I don't have that off the top of my head. Uh, if I may ask council a question. Thank you, sir. Uh, to make any changes to our policy and handbook, we need uh, three fourths of the regions to make those changes. And those changes would be, okay, we are removing this council position and chief of staff position. I do not recall, uh, please help me someone, when did three fourths of this board say, yeah, nine people say out of 13 that we are changing this position. It is in our policy and our policy demands that we have three fourths, that is nine regions voting to make any change to the policy. So please help me there. I'm just a bit confused with that. Thank you, Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the record. Um, your most recent question ties into the other points that you've previously mentioned, and I want to be sure to address all of them. So I'm going to back up for a second because I do think that I can help clarify. Um, first of all, your bylaws provide for access, Regents access to the agenda at Article 5, Section 8. So there is a distinction in three Regents requesting an item to be placed on the agenda. Because this item was already on the agenda, any action with respect to that item needs to actually happen in the public meeting. Um, so I hope that that provides additional clarification in addition to what the chair has mentioned. Um, the late information, um, again, I'll reiterate that legal had requested the HR recommendation. Um, human resources at the system administration is staffed by one individual and she was on vacation. So I interrupted her during her vacation. So I'd like to say thank you to our HR director, Sherry Olson, for taking her time out of her well-earned annual leave to assist me in providing the recommendation. Um, with respect to the role, um, the, in your April 21st special meeting, um, you voted to separate out special counsel. So special counsel will now be a position under the chief general counsel's office. So chief of staff, that was a vote that happened. I've, I've gone back and I've reviewed that meeting a, a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> and there was some supplemental information that was provided in that meeting, with that meeting agenda that talked about the differences between those two roles. Um, and your chief general counsel, Mr. Martinez, explained on the record at that meeting why you have handbook references that call the two positions chief of staff and special counsel. That was added, the words special counsel were added into the bylaws where the chief of staff position is described and the duties are described. It was added by a predecessor chief of staff and special counsel. And it was added outside of a public meeting. It was not added by a vote of this body, which would have required a two thirds vote. So that action is void. And when an action is void under the law, it's as if it never occurred. 
So you do have a chief of staff position that's in your bylaws, that's in the handbook and in the code, and you do have a description of those duties. Um, you'll note that when that change was made um, by the former employee, it was made um, under a provision that allows for what's called non-substantive changes, which are usually just to correct a grammatical change or to make cleanup, housekeeping, um, you know, correlating changes to the board so that things read correctly, or perhaps there's a numbering problem. Um, but adding a position, <laughs> a, a duplicate position, and changing the title of a position is not non-substantive. It actually is substantive. So that action is void. So Chief General Counsel Martinez mentioned that on the record at the April uh, 21st meeting, and he also uh, reiterated for the board that what was going to come back were the revisions that were necessary after, after your vote to split out the special counsel. So what will be coming back to you in August, if it's the will of the chair, uh, is an agenda item that states what I've just stated, that that action was void, adding the special counsel, and asking the board to give staff direction to go back and basically strike that where, everywhere that it is listed. And what we're doing now is working with HR to put together a PDQ, the position description, uh, for the council position in the general counsel's office that's going to be a shared position and that will pro provide legal counsel to you all. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Um, one moment, Regent Goodman, because I'd, I'd like to call upon someone who hasn't um, had an opportunity to speak. Regent Perkins. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, about the reference that was just made to, uh, Laura Perkins for the record, about the reference that was just made to the uh, position not being uh, codified or being null and void, we, by precedent, this body has codified it because we voted over and over again to select this position. We even put out uh, announcements and because of because we did that, it becomes codified by law because we've done it over and over and over again for the last, when did this position come on board? Like uh, 2016, 2014? I can't really remember the date, but because we've taken action on it over and over again consistently, that codifies it itself. The other questions I have is, um, since HR is on vacation, how can we ask, how can we question HR about this decision if they're not here to defend themselves? And, okay, and I'll, I'll keep going if, that, if you want to answer that question later. Um, the, Re, um, excuse me, Regent Perkins? Uh-huh. Hey, I, um, just, just so that you're aware, and I know that with our technology, there's a bit of a delay, but I think perhaps it, it would be beneficial for the, for the entire board to um, hear from counsel regarding, um, you know, the, the question or statement that you just posed regarding what is considered to be codified and, and, and what is not. Linda King, Associate General Counsel for System Administration. Um, Re Regent Perkins, you've mentioned that you've, that your position that the hiring of a chief of staff, the, the title of a position chief of staff and special counsel is codified by law. Um, that is not the legal position of the Chief General Counsel's office. Um, could you indicate where you received that legal guidance? You can read. I'm sorry, Regent Perkins, we, we couldn't hear you. Would you please repeat that? I said, because I can read, I've read the, the cod what, I've read the definitions of codification. Um, as your legal counsel, it is not the position of our office that there is a codification of a position that is chief of staff and special counsel. And even if there had been, you have voted to separate that position at your April 21st meeting. Um, with respect to human resources, um, if you do have questions with respect to the recommendations that they've made that are in your briefing paper, um, we do have folks, and including myself, that could are prepared and ready to speak to that. Okay, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'd like to, well, I don't remember voting to separate the positions because we'd have to do that twice, correct? Because um, that's what Chief Counsel Martinez stated in, at that April 21st meeting, he said that we would get a, the, we, it would come back before us, 
with um, a job description. We don't even have a job description, which should have been supplied by HR. So it's very difficult. And please don't get me wrong. I think um, Ms. Nikolajewski is an excellent chief of staff, and that's not the point here. It's to follow up a particular process. And it seems like that process has been um, overlooked or picked or um, uh, cherry picked to, to fit the parts that you want, the dynamic that you want to show. And uh, I would, I would really be curious about a position description just because how can we, how can we determine a salary if we don't even have the duties? And secondly, if we're going to separate the positions as you state, um, it was chief general counsel and um, chief of staff. That salary is the salary that we're looking at right now is for both of those positions. So if you split the positions, it doesn't seem quite justifiable to um, not split the salary also. So that's why we need those, those descriptions, those job descriptions to figure out, okay, is the job 25%, you know, um, legal or is it 60% you know, board uh, board business. We just need those. I feel I need those to make um, an informed decision, um, which is our you know that's our primary duty here as regents. Um, Linda King, Associate General Counsel, System Administration. Um, I'll go back. I wish I had a transcript I could go back to. <laughs> well, a litigator by nature, so. I have a transcript. Did you want me to email it to you? Uh, no. Um, I, I will go back and I will reiterate um, the, the duties to the chief of staff position are listed in your bylaws, and they were also included in the April 21st supplemental agenda item materials. Those are the materials um, that HR utilized to prepare the position description that it used to do the comp and class evaluation to determine that the chief of staff position should remain in its classification as grade three and she executive salary, which it has been uh, since 2007, despite the fact that the position has evolved over time um, with different titles and different duties. Um, so the, the recommendation that we have currently in the briefing paper from HR is based on a PDQ that was prepared. Um, as I mentioned previously, the PDQs don't come to the board for approval. That's a process that's involved through HR and the supervisor, and that process has been completed by HR. Um, so like with your um, internal auditor and the positions that are selected by the board, those PDQs do not come back to the board for approval. That's an internal process that happens in HR. Um, thank you for that answer, but it still would be good to see that um, that evaluation and the specific job duties and how they weigh out at, like based at 100%, how they weigh out uh, the chief of staff position versus the um, uh, chief counsel position or counsel to the board position. Yeah, thank you, Linda King, again, for the record. Um, and, and that PDQ um, for chief of staff, the recommendation that, that the, it's a grade three is based on 100% chief of staff. Um, the legal duties have been separated out in that evaluation, and those legal duties will then be evaluated in a PDQ under the Chief General Counsel's office, which we're working at to determine, since that'll be a position that not only works doing legal uh, services to the board, but also will provide legal services to system administration, we need to work out what division of labor will happen with the special counsel. But the chief of staff duties under the PDQ are 100% chief of staff and were evaluated at a grade three. I hope that's helpful. Um, that is, may I ask, uh, well, actually, from that minutes, from the minutes of the April 21st meeting, it says, I hate to call, um, in, the, in the written notes, it says, Regent Carvalho clarified that this, um, that no one is changing the position today. Chief General Counsel um, Martinez stated that that is correct because any change require bylaws and handbook revisions. So is that not true anymore? What happened between April 21st and today? Yeah. Um, that's a rhetorical question. Um, so I just really, uh, I would just like us to follow our own policy. And if our policy doesn't fit us anymore, then we have the means to change that policy by a, a, a two-thirds vote. So it's 
it just seems um, sketchy. Uh, Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the record. I'll back up and address the, um, we'll, no one will be changing positions. That is correct. People were not changing positions. Um, I believe that if you go back and look at the audio, I think there was some confusion among the board members um, with respect to Ms. Nicola Juski and whether or not after that vote she was going to become chief of staff. Um, so I think in context, people weren't changing positions. And when Mr. Martinez said staff will be directed to go back and evaluate what revisions need to come forward. Um, as I've mentioned before, that's been done. We've made that evaluation. And what will be coming back is a request for the board to strike the special counsel addition where it appears in the bylaws. It was a non-substantive, it was not a non-substantive change and it should have required board action and it did not, so it is void. Chair Brooks, I'd like to call the question, please. Call the question. Re Re Regent Arascata, I mean, we um, certainly still probably have some, some discussion regarding this, but if you're calling the question, then we will have to take a vote as to whether or not um, we will move right into the question of the motion. Um, is there a, a second to call the question based on the motion from uh, Vice Chair Arascata? Vice Chair Arascata, there, there currently is not a second to call for the question, and therefore we will continue with discussion regarding this agenda item. Not a problem, thank you. Regent Perkins, it, it, I, I, I just wanna make sure <clears throat> that um, I, I could not tell if there were some additional questions that you had um, and so I, I want to bring this back to you. And at the same time, I'm wondering if, based on the questions that you posed regarding policy, procedure, the separation of the two positions that, that the board voted on in April, and other processes um, directly related to why we would um, have this uh, on, on agenda um, to really solidify the position. Um, I wanna make sure that, that our council has provided you with the answers that, um, that you need to better help you make a determination in terms of the way that you're, um, you're, you're looking at this. They answered the best they could and I appreciate those answers. Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I believe that this whole uh, discussion right now is uh, an excellent point as to why we should receive briefings prior to our meetings. I think it would really help us out a lot if everyone received a briefing uh, from the chancellor or vice chancellor or whomever we decide as we move forward with this new position. But uh, I, I think it would be extremely helpful and probably alleviate a lot of these questions. Uh, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I. I I come, I work for the city for many years and you have to trust staff. And uh, when legal says something, I trust what legal says as staff. When HR gives a recommendation, I'm trusting what HR says as staff. And, um, you know, I've always been a manager that uh, appreciates people in their positions and lets them do their job. And I think that, you know, we really need to take a step back and, and listen to our staff on this. I also wanted to say that, um, I am. Uh, I did not make this motion uh, because uh, Ms. Nicola Juski and I are, are friends. I've never had any kind of uh, real social interaction with her. I, I, I made this motion because um, you, you all know I was hoping for a chancellor. That's okay. We didn't, and you win some, you lose some. But 
this office and this system needs some leadership. And, and the system needs someone at the helm right now as we move through this process. And for 27 months, she's been doing the job. I've just been on here for six months. And these six months, I, you know, I've seen her do an excellent job. And so the reason I wanted to push this forward is because I feel it's necessary for staff to have the leadership that, that they need. And, and so that is why um, I, I put this item on the agenda. I think it's imperative that we move forward, we bring people on in permanent positions so that we can um, work more effectively as a system. So thank you. Regent Downs. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Regent. Go ahead, Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Regent Downs, for the record. So um, I would really, I could use a lesson sometime in trying to find position descriptions because I looked through, as I, this was discussions been going on, uh, various parts of the website, and I can't seem to find that. Um, I guess I'm a little, I don't say, um, I feel like this is a very rushed uh, since we don't have, we're going to come back in August with how it's going to be split out, but we're going to vote on it now. So we vote for the person to be in the position. We'll find more out about it next time. It seems kind of, uh, kind of backwards. Uh, the other concern I have is how the pay was established and, and how it looks outside the system. The, the, so the lot for the chancellor search, we had um, the previous chancellor, I believe, and I could be off on these numbers a bit, was around 400,000 a year. And this next chancellor was gonna be 450. And um, so in, my, in my time at, in administration at, at my college, we had a, um, a VP general counsel at the community college, and I believe that his salary was significantly less than this proposed salary. And that was for, uh, being the general counsel and administrator. Um, I believe it's less than this position is uh, proposed to pay more than the governor's salary. And um, I just, oh, I would ask, I mean, I, we were given by Ms. King uh, assurances that this was properly placed in the right category. It just, it concerns me how that's gonna look. Uh, so I would just say, I think HR is, very generous in the compensation. Uh, Regent Downs, it's um, Chair Bridge for the record. So I just wanted to see if there's something that I can um, sort out for you in terms of what our council reference in an upcoming meeting regarding the council part of this. Um, I, I, I just wanna make sure that, that all regents understand that in April, the separation of these two positions was complete. We have a position as chief of staff and we have a position as council. And so there is no, there, there, there really, um, we certainly shouldn't um, have confusion in terms of when that was split up and why it was split up. Although I do understand when it comes to the council piece, we were certainly having some robust conversation regarding what that looked like. And we were provided with several different options and there seemed to be some brainstorming going on in terms of what it could look like. And the board has, has yet to solidify um, exactly what this council piece is. However, based on our meeting, our votes, and, and everything that council has provided to us in terms of conversation today, the board has already solidified that we have a chief of staff position. In terms of the um, compensation for that position, there was an equity study that was done by, by Huron, who is frankly part of another agenda item today. Um, and then it was examined by HR in terms of the classification of this position. And if we take a look at what their minimum um, what their minimum compensation was to their maximum, we would find that HR recommended what would be the most minimum in terms of compensation regarding pay. And if we were to take a look at the previous pay for this position in conjunction with 
having, if there is solidification of this position, what that would look like, it would look like a 20% a increase. And I'm offering that because when we approved the um, chief auditor position during our last meeting, there were a, there was a compensation piece that came up. And in that conversation, um, there was a, a, a difference of about 41%. Um, and so <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not sure if that provides any clarity regarding the position and that we have two positions, um, but at least I, I felt it was important to offer that. And I certainly would, you know, <clears throat> ask our, our council if, if, if that's correct and if there's any additional information that should be provided just so that there's clarity in terms of the position and compensation. Linda King, Associate General Counsel. That, that is correct. And I think that it's important to understand the position historically. The chief of staff position has been at the grade three and she executive salary um, band of salaries at that pay range since 2007. So that was when the position did not include legal duties. Um, no chief of staff took on legal duties until I believe it was 2009. Um, so that was one of the probably primary factors in um, legal seeking out the recommendation from HR was to evaluate does the position chief of staff, as it's being performed right now, um, maintain that classification? And the response from HR after the analysis they did, most of which is comprised in your briefing paper, was yes, it does. I appreciate that clarification. I just want to reiterate that, as, as what Regent Perkins had stated, that the, my understanding was, was as well that we were going to see more about this before things were made permanent. Uh, so, so that's where I feel this is rushed, kind of putting the cart before the horse. So I would like to see a little more uh, explained out and fleshed out before we make big commitments. Um, I appreciate that, Regent Downs. Uh, I, I guess a follow-up would be... <clears throat> Um, maybe a perspective when we speak about making a big commitment that, that we recognize that um, Carrie Nikolajewski has been in this position for about 21 months, and she's been part of this, this system for, I believe, over 21 years. And I'm, I, as I sit here as a, as a, as a regent working through some of this, um, would, would certainly appreciate um, any type of clarity regarding when, when the conversation is we should evaluate something before we make a big decision, what other processes should um, uh, be a part of, should take place um, in, in doing that? Um, and it's, it's not anything that has to be answered right now, but I'm just, I'm just as we're having the conversation, I'm, I'm wondering that myself. Oh, I mean, if you're asking me the question, I'd like to see the breakout that we were told that we we're going to see before we move forward. We're, we're, we're given some clear guidance or responses from Mr. Martinez back in uh, April, and we haven't seen it. So when I see this suddenly show up on the agenda, so did I miss something? I mean, this hasn't come up. We haven't seen the second half of this. So now we're supposed to make a conclusion before we've seen the, the, the complete story. Thank you, Regent Downs. I'm going to, uh, I appreciate that, Regent Downs. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to defer to council just, just, just for a moment again to, to, in, to respond to the, the, the question of other things that should be taking place regarding this position that, that perhaps the board does not have the information on. I, I, and from a legal perspective, I don't think there's anything further that I have to place on the record. Regent Brown. Uh, Regent Brown, for the record. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so on Wednesday of this week, I was in the Las Vegas system office, and it was around 1 p.m. 
Um, and I had expressed my uh, concerns with this agenda item only because it did feel rushed. And where I understand that um, Chief of Staff uh, Nick Lajewski has been there for 21 months, an interim position is one to three years. So we're well within our interim statute. Um, and it also just felt like at 1 p.m. Wednesday, when our meeting was at 9 a.m. Friday, we had no supplemental information. And I, f I, I, I did ask that they can, that there was some consideration to move this just to the next, uh, time we meet, which seems to be monthly. So four, four weeks later, um, just to give the board some time. Um, I also made a recommendation because we did have this, this meeting on April 21st. We just approved the board minutes. I made a recommendation that during that meeting, regents were able to express some of their um, goals for the chief of staff role. They were able to highlight some of the position, things that they were looking for, and that I would really love to see a summary of those roles so we can match them to the current uh, job description. So I understand that I made that recommendation commission at 1 p.m., but that was seven hours before we got supplemental information about this item. So where it was a late request, the supplemental information was also late. And I, and I want to make it public knowledge that nobody in, in this chain was okay with this information getting to us this late. And I understand that it was mitigating circumstances with you know, people being on leave, but maybe that should have been a sign that we shouldn't put this on this agenda item, knowing so many people within Enchi's um, staff were actually on leave. So with that being said, um, I would like to offer a friendly amendment to Regent Goodman. Um, I would like to actually separate uh, her motion, one for the... Uh, and, and to remove the salary and the, the second por portion of this. And then so we can debate whether we want to move forward on the appointment. And then we can uh, have a conversation about salary compensation and the rest. Um, and I bring that up because um, looking at the 2021 job advertisement for a chief of staff and special counsel position, the minimum requirements was a JD and the salary range was 180 to 220. And so two years later, minus a JD, minus a special counsel, that math doesn't math to me. And so I would appreciate a friendly amendment to separate the two so we can have that conversation separate and not, um, and then have a have a initial conversation on the actual appointment. Thank you. Regent Goodman. Regent Brown, would you mind repeating your friendly amendment because I was talking while you were saying it? Not a problem. Um, I, I, oh, sorry. Thank you. I, I, my apologies, Regent Brown. Linda King, Associate General Counsel. Um, this board is governed by Robert's Rules of Procedure, and because you've already started discussion on your motion, a friendly mem amendment. Um, as you heard from your parliamentarian and your board orientation is not appropriate at this time. Um, it, as I think has happened in the last couple of meetings, what would be more appropriate right now is if Regent Goodman wished to um, do something with her motion, she is at liberty to do so. Um, otherwise, that motion is has the floor and would continue. I appreciate that. Then I would like to um, ask Regent Goodman if you wouldn't mind withdrawing your amendment or withdrawing your motion and making a new motion that will separate the two where we can have the discussion on appointing our chief of staff and then have a second discussion on the HR components of the appointment. I would like to amend my motion to uh, approve Carrie Nikolajewski as chief of staff today the position only and discuss the uh, salary and um, um, the uh, HR component of the uh, position at our next meeting. Thank you, Regent Goodman. I, I believe the um, first part of this process is a withdrawal of the original motion 
However, um, our, our outside representative from the AG's office is here and, and ready to offer some guidance. De Deputy Attorney General um, Counsel Chrissy Harris for the record. I just want to just reiterate uh, what uh, Ms. King mentioned um, is still correct. So we would need a withdrawal of the motion and a withdrawal of the second, um, not necessarily the amendment. So I just want to make sure that that's reiterated. I, I would like to withdraw my motion and I'd like to make a new motion that is approving Carrie Nikolajewski as our chief of staff and we will discuss the uh, salary and HR, HR component of her position at a later date, in the next meeting, hopefully. And I would withdraw the original second and create a new second in regards to that motion. Is that okay? And okay, so every step withdrawal is, is noted, but just for purposes of the record, just restate now what your new motion is and that, that will give the opportunity um, for there to be a second if there is one. I'd like to make the motion to approve Carrie Nikolajewski as our chief of staff for the Board of Regents and... Uh, I second Susan Brager. Does that suffice um, legal needs in terms of the way the motion was stated? So far, yes. Thank you. Is there a component of that motion, though, that still should state something regarding the second piece of this or can that be absent in the motion, which it sounded like it was when you asked for clarification? So my understanding is that your motion is only addressing the approval of, um, our, of our current interim and the second piece of the uh, salary will be, is outside of your motion, correct? Because that's how I interpret it. Okay. Um, Linda, Linda King, Associate General Counsel. Um, so with respect to your comment, Chair Brooks, if there's anything else, um, in so moving to make a permanent appointment, um, I would recommend that you have a, you're, not, you're going to discuss the compensation contract terms later, but I would recommend that you make an effective date. Um, as, as you include that, and I don't, I don't know that it's logical to not do that and move an effective date to the time that you discuss other contract terms. I believe that all this is appropriate within the scope of the agenda item as it's drafted, but I defer to um, our DAG for um, the final say on that. An effective date is still appropriate um, as far as clarifying that in your motion. Um, I just want to confer Thank you. We appreciate the guidance. I just want to confer with with with, with council because while we recognize that um, we should probably have a date inside this motion, um, I think that's that's a, a part of a, a discussion we would have to have regarding scheduling because we don't have a set date now for an additional meeting um, other than what will come before us, which is a, a special meeting we'll call regarding the interim chancellor search. We still. Oh, 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 okay, and so uh, council has just advised that in, instead of having an exact date, it would be a, a discussion that would take place at the next meeting of the Board of Regents. That way there's no specific date that has to be provided in the motion. I'd like to amend my motion to include that at the next Board of Regents meeting, we will have a discussion regarding Your, the appointment could be effective upon the next, the permanent appointment would be effective upon the date of the next meeting. The although permanent appointment will be effective a, upon the date of the next meeting. Right, although we don't have a date certain. Thank you. <laughs> the second accepts that. Thank you. And I was trying to take notes as, as, as these conversations were taking place. So I just want to, I, I, I just want to clarify really what the motion, part of this motion is that um, this will be to approve Carrie uh, Nick Wojewski as our, our permanent chief of staff effective at the next date, or effective at the date of the next meeting for the Board of Regents. However, I did not hear the component piece for compensation in terms of future discussion. 
Regent Gregory? Wouldn't that just be a new business item for the next meeting or no? I, I don't believe so because our council has advised that there it would be better in stating this motion that there be a date. And then our system council advised that we don't, if we're still trying to figure out what the dates are, because we don't have anything scheduled yet, although we do have a, a quarterly meeting in September. Now, perhaps we can use that date as the effective date for compensation, and we can always call a meeting. I, I don't know if we, um, Miss, let me ask you this. Can, can we, just so that we can confer with council, I know that there's a motion on the floor, but we're still designing the motion, obviously. Can we, can we have a five minute administrative break so that we can um, properly um, be able to articulate exactly what this motion is in terms of the separation and a potential date to cover the second part of the agenda item, which would be compensation. So long as um, advice is only being asked directly to council and that, of course, as, as just a reminder, regents are not having off record discussions. Thank you, I appreciate that. We'll take advantage of your guidance. Once again, we will take a five minute administrative break. We appreciate everyone's patience and um, we'll, we'll continue with the meeting. I'll, I'll give everyone another a minute to get to their seats and then we'll move forward. Thank you. We appreciate uh, appreciate everyone's patience, including um, regents who are up in the north. Um, we did need a few minutes to confer with council in terms of the, the proper way to formulate this motion so that it best suits the needs of, of not only OML, but how we would move forward as a board. With that, I will um, bring this right back to Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to withdraw the motion to restate. And do I need uh, Regent Brager? Go ahead. I will second that. Thank you. you have to withdraw your second. I, my, I mean, I withdraw my second. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. Um, my new motion is I would like to approve Carrie Nikolajewski as our permanent chief of staff, effective at the next Board of Regents meeting, special or otherwise, at which time the contractual terms, including compensation, will be considered. I second that. So it's been moved by, by Regent Goodman and seconded by Regent Breger to approve uh, Kerry Nikolajewski as our permanent chief of staff, effective at the next uh, Board of Regents meeting, special or otherwise, at which time the contractual term, including compensation, will be considered. Is there any additional discussion in this? Reg uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Carvalho, prior, I, Regent Carvalho oh, I, I do have um, Regent Del Carlo, who is um, slated uh, also. Um, so as part of discussion, we'll move right to Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. And um, actually, I was going to make that friendly amendment, but my colleague, uh, Regent Brown, beat me to it. And I, I think we're proceeding well, and I can certainly support all of this. And I do certainly support Carrie as our permanent chief of staff. And I just agree with some other colleagues though that some of this little process got a little messy and a little backwards. And, and it really would have been helpful to have some of that April 21st uh, um, material brought forward to this, this um, meeting. And, and when we do have this again on the agenda, if you could bring all of that material forward that we didn't have today, it would be really helpful because um, I think we, we really need to follow our code as best we can. And some of the things that our chief, our general counsel today had said, I had never heard of before the way you explained it. So um, I just think, you know, this is, well, I feel like we're making sausage today, but at the end of the day, we're going to have a, a fine product. Thank you. Acting Chancellor uh, Dale Urquiagua. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Dale Urquiaga, for the record. My comment was actually to provide some information on the salary question that was posed by Regent Brown. I think it's no longer germane, and you'll receive the information uh, at your next discussion. Thank you. Regent Arascata. I apologize. Vice Chair Arascata. 
Good. No comment here. I'm well, willing to continue. Regent uh, Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to reiterate some of the things that have been said, um, I, I think that there was an understanding among many on the board that at that um, April 21st meeting, um, there would be additional information coming back to us, at, um, including the, the PDQ. And I, and I know Ms. King has, has addressed that and said that that's not normally the process. That, that was in our supplemental material, and I think that that was something that was important for many, um, many of my colleagues to see, including myself. Um, and also there were uh, comments made regarding seeing the, the um, revised bylaws in place as well. I don't, I don't think it was as clear to us, including me, that there were changes that were made um, to our bylaws that were substantive. Um, and that, that gives me a little bit of, of alarm. And I, I don't know if we can um, somehow um, look into that at some point. Um, and, I, and I certainly appreciate my, my colleagues' um, willingness to, to uh, listen to everybody and, and change the, the motion to suit everybody's concerns. I, I truly appreciate that. I, I agree with you that trust is a big part of this process. Um, and I think maybe we could all learn to, to embrace that a little bit more um, and try to work together. And, and as, as Regent Del Carlo said, the sausage, I, I, I think that's just really funny. But, um, but that's all part of this process is the, the, the open dialogue that we all have to be able to come to a consensus that works for everybody. And so I, I, I'm encouraged that we see that here today. Um, and, and like I said, I, I truly appreciate um, the, this working together. Um, and I certainly appreciate um, Ms. Nicola Juski's um, demeanor and grace in all of this and professionalism. I, I can imagine how difficult it is when you're sitting here and everybody else is talking about your, um, your job performance and pay and everything else. So um, thank you for, for letting us talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I do just, like I said, want to reiterate that I think that there was an understanding from many of us that there were going to be additional conversations before we got to this point. And um, I think that uh, I also want to say that I appreciate Regent Goodman's um, putting this on new business. We do need to move forward with some um, permanent leadership among our uh, our uh, board and, and system office. It's, it's been a very difficult time. And um, I understand her need to do that. I, I just think that there was some confusion among many of us as to um, why we didn't see what we thought we were going to see before we got to this point. So I, again, I'm just saying the same things over and over again, but I appreciate the time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, I would be very, very brief. Um, I really appreciate listening to my colleagues and board members um, today. And um, I just wanted to say that, Carrie, you are very much respected. Um, every regent that I've talked to about you and your work outside of this agenda item before this day, everyone is appreciative of your work and no one's discounting that. And um, I did want to say that there was some clarity issues of what was going to go forward, but I don't believe it was intentional. I really, truly believe that we, um, we had some, some different understandings, and um, I have some ideas to fix that going forward. Um, I really like the briefing idea. If someone would give us a brief um, or even a debrief, I think that will help clarify and, and build our relationships and our understanding. And um, I also wanted to tell um, um, Regent Goodman and Breger, I, I was, when Regent Brown brought that up, I was like, that just made me feel good, like a weight off my shoulder because I never discounted Carrie. But when I saw the um, um, $209,000 salary, when we we're just barely approved 12% for our professors and staff that are, you know, 
have doctorates are making seventy five thousand dollars. That would that was not that you don't deserve it, Carrie, because you've put in the years and it's a scholarship. Scal I'm not debating that, but it took my breath away and I needed time to process and understand the job description. And so um, I just wanted to share um, that I really appreciate how this could have gotten really ugly. And it just shows that we are a board that cares and we are a board that can work together effectively if we take the time to listen and learn and come to consensus. So um, on, I just want to say thank you to the board for working through this. I'm proud of us. We did it. Is there any other discussion? So it has been uh, moved by Regent Goodman and seconded by Regent Breger to approve Carrie Nikolajewski as our permanent chief of staff effective at the next Board of Regent meeting, special or otherwise, at which time the contractual term, including compensation, will be considered. What I'd like to do is, um, for purposes of formality on an agenda item that has created this much discussion, is um, ask for a roll call vote. So, oh, I'm sorry, that would make sense. Um, Winter, would you please uh, provide us with a roll call vote? Gladly, thank you, Chair. Regent Cruz Crawford. Yes. Regent Del Carlo? Yes. Regent Downs? Yes. Regent Goodman? Yes. Regent McMichael? Yes. Regent Perkins? Yes. Regent Tarkanian? Yes. Vice Chair Arascata? Yes. Regent Boylan? Yes. Regent Brager? Yes. Chair Brooks? Yes. Regent Brown? Yes. Regent Carvalho? Yes. Motion passes. Perfect. So we will now move to agenda item number four. This is a handbook revision and- Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. May so I make a comment, please? Please, yeah, for may, sure. May sorry I be about excused, that. actually? <laughs> just kidding. Um, I um, just wanna say that you don't often see yourselves um, the way others see you. So the public comment that I read and that I heard was very heartwarming. Um, I think we struggle with that as human beings, recognizing the good qualities in ourselves. Um, I want to thank my team, who is stupendous, uh, Angela Palmer, Winter Lipson, and Juliana Kennedy. I could not do what I do without them. Thank you to the board members for your supportive comments, and I want you to know, everyone, that I'm on your team, and I'm here to support your work, as is my team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now move to agenda item number four and I'll call upon our acting chancellor, Dale Urquiaga. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Dale Urquiaga. Um, item four um, should be a walk in the park following item three. Um, the, the board will recall that in January we received three legislative audits, uh, each with a set of recommendations. We responded to those audits in April and that a final plan of um, corrective action is due to the legislature, um, Legislative Council Bureau, uh, in October. And because there were three audits, we broke the responses uh, into three working groups. So I want to begin by acknowledging um, the staff, including um, now former Chief, uh, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger um, and Rhett Verhees, who have been working on those groups um, over the last few months. Um, and I'd also like to take this moment to recognize Lindsay Sessions, who, um, as I have mentioned to the board, has been named the Acting Vice Chancellor for Finance and Budget and Chief Financial Officer, doing double duty as the DRI controller. So, so all those folks um, brought you today's um, 
policy revision, which is just on one of the audits. Uh, the foundation audit contained two major findings. One is really internal record keeping about um, how thank yous are done, uh, and the foundations will deal with that on their end. But the other um, finding uh, was about aged gift uh, accounts, if you will, and um, the auditors suggested that some policy is necessary to ensure that the institutional foundations review those gift accounts over uh, their life uh, and uh, document the results of that review. And so this is a pretty simple addition to the existing policy governing the foundations, simply requires that that be done annually. And this is to prevent aging out of accounts when the, perhaps the donor's intent is no longer um, valid. So um, the staff and I can recommend this to you without hesitation. Uh, and my only caveat is that in September, um, you'll have, or perhaps at a special meeting, you'll have a raft of, of the other policy recommendations dealing with self-supporting funds and the capital improvement projects. They are much more complex, um, and they are taking the teams more time to work through. Uh, but for today, um, I can, on, on behalf of the team, um, and with my gratitude to them, uh, recommend this for your approval. Thank you. Do, do members of do members of the board have any questions or comments? Move to approve. Second. I second. Okay, so there's a, a motion to approve the revision to board policy, uh, Title Four, Chapter Ten, Section Ten, to implement an annual review of foundation-related gift accounts. Um, this motion was. Um, this this motion was moved by Regent Tarkanian and seconded by Regent Perkins. Is there any discussion on this? Regent Perkins? Actually, I was just going to make the motion, so strike that. Thank you. Regent uh, Carballo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, while I appreciate the, the brevity of this addition, I, I'm just a little concerned with what um, documenting the results and documenting an action plan mean. Um, as this is in response to, to a legislative audit, I think it's important for us to understand what where this documentation of the results will be and, and where the action plan will be. Does it come back to the board? Um, is it just housed uh, at the institution level? I'm, I'm just not clear on exactly what, what is meant by document the results and document the action, an action plan. If I could get some clarification on that. Uh, Acting Chancellor uh, Dale Ikiagua, is there... Um a way to expand on that? Um, for the record, Dale Urquiaga, so um, I would, by way of explanation, I would only say that this section of the handbook deals with the president of the institution being responsible for the system of internal accounting, and therefore this section is about the president's responsibility for maintaining these records. The board receives an annual accounting um, I don't mean that in the mathy sense. I mean accounting as in a report at its December meetings. But this section of the code um, still points at the president. And so it would be the president's responsibility to receive this action plan and documentation. Regent Carvalho, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, based on the discussion that you started, if there might be a way that you'd like to see this um, almost highlighted in, in, a, in a report that's presented to the board or some other fashion in which you feel like this information would properly come before the board in terms of a reporting process. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for um, guiding me in that because it's, that, that's, that's what, I'm, what my direction would be is I, I think it would be uh, appropriate um, since this um, the transactions of the gifts uh, will be disclosed, as it says above, um, will be disclosed to the Board of Regents Audit C Compliance and Title IX Committee, that if there is, um, if there are results um, for the gift accounts for, for those um, 
lapsed accounts, that's not the right word, but aged accounts, um, that those results and the action plan might be reported to, to the audit committee. I think that might be appropriate if, if possible. I, I just think in response to a legislative audit, uh, the board should have a bit more oversight in this area, even though I realize it, it, it could be a very small item. I, I do want to take the, the legislative audit um, um, seriously, not saying that, no, that you're not doing that, but um, I, I do think there needs to be a reporting mechanism to the board in some way. Thank you. Regent Brown. Uh, thank you, Regent Brown, for the record. Uh, my colleague um, covered my, the majority of my, my question. Um, I will echo, I'd like to see it in future reports if this is something that will be asked for in future audits. Um, but I was also hoping to get maybe an example of what kind of uh, aging, of what an aging gift looks like. Um, my first thought went to our previous meeting when um, UNR spoke about their gift that is now producing money in order to pay for their building. And so I was wondering, it, that's where my first head went, like, would that have been an aging gift until it started producing? Um, so if I could just get one quick example just to, to for my situational awareness, and then if we can also, I just echo uh, Regent Carvalho on the including in, in the reports that the president's already give us. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Dale Arkiaga. Um I feel a bit like an aging gift today. Um, so if I could have one minute to run to my office and get the audit, I can show you an example that was called by the legislative auditors if someone would like to vamp in my absence. Um. Regent Brown, I can answer the, the first part or, your, or the second, not about the aging, but the other one. Um, the report will come back to the audit committee um, seasonally. Yeah, correct. So. Thank you. I was just um, echoing uh, Regent Carvalho to add this particular line item with aging gifts on, on there. Yeah, so I appreciate that. Regent Boylan. Regent Carvalho. Oops. So I, since we have a motion and a second, would it, is it appropriate? And I, I would hope that the chancellor could be here for guidance on this, but do, or maybe Ms. King, I, I don't, does this need a, do you think that this needs an amendment? I mean, I'm, if, I would like to amend the, the motion um, to include that um, a, a review of all gift accounts um, and the results of, of that review and an action plan would come back to the audit committee um, annually. Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the record. Um, we're in the same um, position as the last item where you would withdraw probably the easiest route would be to withdraw the motion, withdraw the second and restate your motion. I withdraw. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Regent Tarkanian. I withdraw my second. Thank you, Regent Perkins. Mm. Good afternoon. Uh, just here to support you, Chancellor. If you were, if you're not able to find that information, I can give an example. Sir, just for the the purposes of, of record uh, keeping. Red Vertries for the record. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Taylor Key, I got hi, Red. Right. Um, I have the audit. Um, okay. I'll give a couple examples, and you can tell me if I read them wrong. Um, the auditors found uh, page 14 of their audit document um, at UNR 2.3 million in gift accounts in 137 uh, gift funds in 137 accounts with no donations or expenditures for a period of at least three years. So it's not a specific one, but it's a number of small. 
and at UNLV, 1.1 million in gift account funds in 192 accounts. So we're talking about small gifts here, not the major gift that you, to which you are referring. Donor intent is clearer in a gift like that. So these are relatively small. Did I get that right, Rhett? Yes. I, I Rhett Virtues for the record. I, I just add that a lot of times these are uh, donations for scholarships that have very strict criteria. And it's very difficult sometimes to identify individuals who meet that criteria. And so they will sit for long periods of time. And a lot of times a donor passes and therefore it becomes very difficult to actually get a donor to agree to change that criteria or to, to redirect that to another scholarship account. Which was what I've seen in the past. A lot of times we try to get them to redirect those into general scholarship accounts instead of a specific criteria for you know, with some other type of educational activity. Mr. Chair, who is this young man? I don't know. Um, my name is Rhett Vertries. I'm the Assistant Chief Financial Officer. Oh, okay. Thank you. Nice, yeah. meeting you. nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Great day. So we had, uh, just for clarification, um, Regent Tarkanian did make a motion to, to approve. It was seconded by Regent Perkins. Um, uh, Regent Carvalho had raised some questions and asked for a friendly amendment. Uh, seeking the advice of, of, of counsel. Counsel advised that it would be best to withdraw the motion, in, in which case Regent Tarkanian did withdraw her motion. Regent Perkins did withdraw her second. And so now we sit with the agenda item still before us um, with, with, without a motion. And I, I wanted to offer um, uh, perhaps Regent Tarkanian to um, restate a, a motion that suffices the needs of uh, or, or the request of uh, Regent Carvalho's request to make a friendly amendment, if if you'd be inclined to do so, I would make the motion to uh, approve the motion with the friendly amendment. Second. Thank you, Regent Tarkanian. Um, the motion with the friendly amendment is seconded by Regent Carvalho for the purposes of of our record keeping, I believe that we would want to have in that, that motion um, the actual words of the friendly amendment. Um, and I believe what Regent Carvalho was looking for, Regent Arcanian, was that the, um, specifically, that the gift accounts and any action plan be reported to the, to the audit committee annually um, and that was what the friendly amendment uh, was based off of. Are you asking me something now or are we okay? Um, I'm, I'm, thank you, Regent Tarkanian. I'm, I'm asking if you, would, if you would please verbalize the friendly amendment, which is to, um, it's, it's the motion that you made in terms of the approval of a revision to board policy, Title IV, Chapter 10, Section 10, to implement an annual review of foundation-related gifts and that the gifts accounts and action plans would be reported to the audit committee in that annual report. Chair Brooks. Thank Deputy you. Attorney General Chrissy Harris, for the, the record. <laughs> It might just be easier, and I know that there's already a motion <clears throat> and a second on the floor. It might just be easier for Regent Carvalho to make the motion, um, as she's as, it's, as she's very particular as to uh, the specific uh, details of the amendment to go in, just for purposes of the record and clarity of the record. So that would still require uh, Regent Tarkanian to withdraw, Perkins to withdraw the second, and then Regent Car um, Carvalho can make the motion. I'll withdraw my motion. I'll withdraw my second. Regent Carvalho, would you like to make a motion on this agenda item? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will make a motion um, to approve this addition um, to, uh, to Title IV, Chapter 10, Section 10, um, which would read annually institutions are required to complete a review of all gift accounts, document the results, and document an action plan with the added verbiage of and report any results and an action plan to the audit committee. 
annually. The most was that uh, Regent Tarkanian, did I hear you second that motion? Yes. Thank you. And so it is, it is moved now by Regent Carvalho and seconded by Regent Tarkanian to approve the revision to board policy, Title IV, Chapter 10, Section 10, to implement the annual review uh, of foundation-related gift accounts um, and that the gift accounts and action plans will be part of the report um, annually to the Board of Regents. Is there any discussion on, I'm sorry, just for clarification, um, I, will, I, will, I will say that the, the motion is to bring this annually to the audit committee, uh, not the full board. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, um, I'll ask Carrie for a, a, a roll call vote, just, just for the purposes of for formalities regarding this agenda item. Regent Del Carlo. Uh, aye. Regent Downs. Aye. Regent Goodman. Yes. Regent McMichael. Yes. Regent Perkins. Aye. Regent Tarkanian. Aye. aye. Vice Chair Arascata. Yes. Regent Boylan. Aye. Regent Brager. Aye. Chair Brooks. Yes. Regent Brown. Yes. Regent Carvalho. Aye. Regent Cruz Crawford. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Carrie. The, the motion passed. We'll move on to uh, agenda item number five. This is a handbook revision, um, and this will be uh, presented by uh, President Sandoval. Good morning, Chair Brooks, Vice Chair Arascata, members of the Board of Regents, Chancellor Kiaga, for the record, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno. Before you today is a request to update the board policy for Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 37, to include the University of Nevada, Reno, for enhanced 12-month contracts for academic nursing faculty. And an oversimplification of this, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Regents, is that um, right now, we don't have, our Orva School of Nursing doesn't have the ability to offer 12-month contracts. We're the only nursing program in the state that does not have that ability. This amendment would allow us to offer our faculty 12-month contracts. Uh, Dean Cameron Duncan is available in Northern Nevada to, to answer any questions or provide testimony. Thank you. Thank you, President Sandoval. Rita Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a, a, a question on this um, that perhaps um, should be directed at the chancellor or, I, or perhaps somebody from UNR knows, but I'm, I'm wondering why it's, it states that the following provisions are applicable only to these specific um, institutions. It's, I, I, I would, I, I'm, just curious why it would be only those institutions and not all of our institutions. Uh, this is Dale Archiogra for the record. The chancellor has no idea. And um, I see the dean shaking his head. Um, perhaps I'll, I will pass the hot potato to legal counsel. <laughs> Linda King, Associate General Counsel. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't have right now um, any of the history of the original provision. Um, so I would surmise to say that the, it stood applicable to the institutions as it was drafted. And now you have another institution coming forward to be added to that and that others could do the same with a proper justification. Uh, Vice, go ahead, Vice Chancellor Patty Charlton. Okay, for the record, Patty Charlton, acting associate or Vice Chancellor of Academic and Student Affairs. So, actually, given my history with the system, I can say that this was actually a provision that was added many, many, many bienniums ago when NCHU was requested by the legislature to double the nursing output 
of um, registered and qualified degree uh, nurses. And so at that time, uh, the institutions that were noted uh, actually asked for that provision, and it was actually uh, subsequent to some legislation. And so there was a high, high demand in Southern Nevada initially, and so that's where that uh, original provision came from. Thank you. I, it seems like this might be a, a, a small um, policy that that perhaps we can we can revise. But but given that, um, I I would move to approve um, uh, President Sandoval's request um, to revise board policy uh, to include UNR for enhanced twelve month contracts for academic nursing faculty. I second it. So it's been moved by Regent uh, Carvalho, seconded by Regent Boyland um, to approve a, a revision to board policy, Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 37, to include UNR for enhanced 12-month contracts for academic nursing facility. Is there any discussion? Uh, Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. I don't know who to address my questions to. Okay, so are the um, uh, region downs for the record? So are the the nursing faculty? I mean, I, I get from what I read about this, this is what they want. But are, are any going to be forced to go on to a a year round contract, or are they able to stay on a regular B contract? Sure, Cameron Duncan for the record. I'm the uh, interim dean for the Orvis School of Nursing. Uh, I did an informal survey with our faculty members to see the interest in this before bringing this forward, and the majority of nursing faculty did want to change to this contract. Reason being, the majority of faculty are already teaching overload during their off-contract semester, so it made more sense to have them on contract and be able to fill those courses consistently rather than having to use LOA faculty. Uh, what, I, what I believe the best approach would be is for our current faculty who want to stay on a nine-month contract still be allowed to stay on a nine-month contract, but moving forward, it would be ideal for us as a school in order to cover all of our courses throughout the year to hire onto this B3 contract so that we, we have that consistent um, faculty teaching consistent courses semester after semester. I guess one of my concerns would be, could we see this work its way into other areas of the university and, and NSHE itself? I mean, the, the traditional schedule is what it is for various reasons, but uh, when we do offer the summer classes as a, and, and uh, I believe nursing is a funded one and the other ones are all, but, but um, do you see this growing into other areas? You know, I'm not sure that's a question that I can answer. Uh, I think it would be best to look at the other institutions who are already using these contracts to see if that's the case in the other schools. Um, did it spread to others? But the nursing program, it, as you said, it's a, it's a funded year-round program, whereas the majority of programs are not year-round, though they may offer classes during summer. So I feel that draws a distinction between nursing program and some of the others. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Arascata. Thank you, Regent Brooks. Uh, Dr. Duncan, out of curiosity, having or going from a nine-month to a 12-month contract, would that benefit the hiring? Would it become more attractive for the hiring for the retention of faculty? Yes, uh, Cameron Duncan for the record, absolutely. It would help with both retention and recruiting of new faculty members. It's already very difficult for us to uh, recruit nursing faculty who are qualified to teach because of the salaries that they are offered on that nine-month contract. This, this change to their uh, compensation will make it more competitive and hopefully easier to recruit. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Is there any other discussion? Regent Borland? Thank you, sir. Uh, I like uh, the questions that uh, Regent uh, Down just uh, asked, because I have a question myself, and it's a simple one. Uh, no, by the way, nice meeting you, uh, Dr. Uh, up there. He's smiling. That's good. Um, Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. <laughs> that, uh, the people are not going to be forced to work 12 months. Are you telling me people would rather make money than have time off? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, uh, yes. Wow. If I can, sure, if I can add to that, the majority of our faculty members already 
take up an extra course or several courses during their off contract semester. So really this would not change the amount that many of our nursing faculty members are actually working. It would just guarantee us having consistent faculty members and also compensate them for the work that they're doing. Thank you, sir. Great answer. Is there any other discussion? I just want to point out, sorry. Regent Dow? Yeah. Sorry to jump in there. <laughs> but I just, for the rest of the board, to do realize there is a financial component to this uh, that would increase the um, expense of the program by 50%, if I'm correct. It will increase the nursing faculty's current pay by 50%. It wouldn't increase the cost of our program necessarily by 50% okay. for a few reasons. We have costs that are not related directly to uh, academic faculty salary, and we also have faculty members who will not be switching contracts. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. Um, I'm a little dense, and so earlier Regent Carvalho asked about other universities that this is offered in. What other institutions have the 12-month nursing? Because I'm sorry, I'm just confused. Sure, Cameron Duncan for the record. UNLV, Nevada State University, and um, College of Southern Nevada are the three schools that currently have this. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? So the, the question also on the adoption of the motion that, um, again, was moved by Regent Carvalho, seconded by Regent Boyland, to approve a revision to board policy, Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 37, to include UNR for enhanced 12-month month contracts for academic nursing facility. Those who are in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye or yay. Aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying no or nay. The motion passes. We'll now move into agenda item number six. Uh, these are procedural guidelines, um, revisions, and we will hear from uh, President Whitfield. I was looking to see what time it was. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Vice Chair, uh, members of the board, Chancellor. Um, UNLV is requesting your approval today to reallocate the distribution of the registration fee for the 23-24 and 24-25 academic years in order to fund the shortfall of for the 12% COLA uh, cost of living uh, adjustment that was approved at the June 30 uh, special board meeting. During that special meeting, institutions were asked to document their plans to fund the shortfall and this, com this component of our plan to redistribute student registration fee was included as supporting materials in that agenda item. In order to accomplish this, we need the board to approve to modify the distribution of student registration fee in the plan, which was approved at that May 20, at the May 20 uh, special meeting. Specifically, this modification would increase the amount allocated to the state supporting operating budget to address the COLA funding uh, gap by $5 per student credit hour, and the amount allocated to the capital improvement fee would then be reduced by $5 per student credit hour. I think it's vitally important to, to note here that there's no impact on the amount that students get paid. This is just simply a redistribution of the funds that we collect. If approved, this will only change how the registration fee is allotted within the budget, and there, there's no change in the amount uh, for uh, student access. Um, the last point I'll make is that while investing in campus infrastructure, which that's what um, taking uh, away those five dollars would would represent, um, UNLV has determined that funding the COLA is a high priority and is willing to defer projects that would be counted under uh, the capital improvement fund uh, until the next biennium. We respectfully uh, request this change and I'm happy to answer any questions, and I think my CFO is here as well. Thank you. Is there any discussion, uh, questions for President Woodfield? Mr. Chair, Laura Perkins here, if I may. Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
The only question I ha um that was one of the questions what the, the last statement that you made um how do you foresee this affecting the capital um the capital improvement funds is this going to put uh buildings like at risk or um improvements at risk or will they be compensated somehow Uh for the record Keith Whitfield president of UNLV um we will still have funds in that account it just won't be as much um, so we'll have to defer. We're going to think strategically about how um, we will prioritize uh, different uh, actions that need to be taken. Um, but it's it's one of the only sources that we have. So we'll be thinking about the other things that will be done. We have a very aggressive um, set of things that we'd like to do for the university. Um, but that's just something for, for now that we're going to have to defer. Um, thank you, sir. And very creative way to think of funding the COLAs. I agree with you. It's very important for our, um, our faculty to realize that they are important to us. Regent Brown. Thank you. Uh, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, I just wanted to echo what my uh, colleague just said. I think this is a a really smart way to deal with the COLA gap. And I want to commend uh, CFO Vach for her um for her way to uh, to get UNLV here, I know her time at UNLV is sunsetting, but uh, I think this is will be a, a a good last one of the last things that we get to see. Um, and I just want to say that this is um, was a really smart way to handle it, and you will once again be missed. Regent Borland, thank you, sir. Wow, that threw me. Who's going to be missed? Are you going away somewhere? What? Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I know that. All right. So, sorry about that. My my question then would be, and it's just come to me. It didn't come to me before. The money that we get from selling properties, my old thing that I was after, I still haven't got the answer where all that money is gone, but does some of that money that you sell go back into capital improvements? that can be used for, as you say, and maybe increase the funds? Is that possible? Uh, making her work. I'm, I'm, I'm giving the nod to uh, CFO Vach um, because the, the basic answer is, is that these are different categories where money comes and is specified for certain activities. Yes. The capital improvement fund is to be able to do enhancements at the university. I think you may be talking about I don't know what the name of the account is, but but it's for other real estate that comes in, and that it's then a specific account for those kinds of activities. Of course, there she is. Oh, look at that! I got it right. How about that? <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. If there's no other discussion, then uh, we're, we're, I'm happy to entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the. Okay. Nice. Well, did I, do you want, did you want me to finish the motion? I mean, um, I think that was Regent McMichael that already seconded. There, if if you could, um, for purposes of the record, if you could restate the the motion um, of a to approve. Okay, I would like to mo um, I move to approve procedures and guidelines manual revision distribution um, of. Student fees, academic years, 2023 to 2024, and 2024 to 2025. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Regent Perkins. So it's been moved by Regent Perkins and seconded by Regent McMichael uh, to uh, approve a revision to the Procedures and Guidelines Manual, Chapter 7, Section 17, to reallocate the distribution of, of resignation, registration, registration fee for academic years 2023 through 2024, and 2024 through 2025. Is there any uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those uh, in favor, please signify by saying aye or yes. Aye. 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 Those who oppose, please signify by saying no or nay. Uh, that motion has uh, been approved. We'll now move into agenda item Number seven, 
uh, the refunding series agenda item, and we will hear from President Pollard. A good morning, Regents, Mr. Chair, Darian Pollard, uh, for the record. Um, I would love to speak to this issue, but it's not my brilliance that's bringing it to you, so I believe in letting uh, demonstrate, just as we saw previously, when you have smarter people working with you to ask them to speak. I'd like to ask Senior Vice President Kevin Butler to come to the, the stand. Uh, he is demonstrating, just like his colleague at UNLV, even as you are walking toward retirement, uh, very thoughtfully, uh, you are still thinking on the best interests of the institution. So I uh, want to ask him to speak to this move that will better position Nevada State for the future. Mr. Butler. I hope I don't screw it up now. Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Butler, Nevada State College. Um, so... Just shortly after I got here in 2013, uh, Nevada State College was approved to enter into a lease purchase arrangements with the state of Nevada to construct the second and third buildings on the Nevada State University campus now. Uh, the currently known as the Rogers Student Center and the Kasner Academic Center. Under the terms of that arrangement, the state treasurer issued certificates of participation on behalf of the college and then Inchi entered into uh, an agreement with the state treasurer's office for the college to make payments against the issuance. The term of that agreement also required that Nevada State College at that time maintain a stabilization account with a balance of $1.8 million in order to ensure that the resources were there to service the debt. Ten years have gone by and now we can refinance this debt. Um, Looking at the current financial analysis, um, we could save about 8% from our annual uh, debt service payments. Um, the, since this is a state issuance and there are other state entities involved, they have um, this whole refunding process, um, the state is really driving the timeline on this. And the goal is to get everything done. Um, we provided a timeline in your materials and get this uh, deal to close on November 15th. Um, the university also um, renegotiated the terms of that agreement um, with the treasurer's office because we had some concerns about some taxation related issues. And the results of those um, conversations were that we were able to reduce the stabilization account from one and a half times the maximum annual payment to one and a qu quarter times the annual annual debt service payments. Uh, so the new required balance is estimated to be $3.8 million instead of $5.1 million. So a savings of about $1.3 million. So really wanna thank um, the staff of the treasurer's office for their understanding and their action in this. I'd also like to thank uh, NG Bond Council, Kendra Follett and uh, NG Financial Advisor, uh, John Peterson, both of whom are here to help me answer any questions that you have. It's a good deal. Are there are there any <laughs> are there any questions? I'd like to make a motion um, to approve the adoption of a resolution approving documents pertaining to the issuance of obligations for the purposes of refinancing certain facilities for NSU and authorizing the chancellor to finalize and approve any necessary modifications and to execute certain lease purchase documents in conjunction with the, with the refinancing. Second. Second. I second. Second. No, Carl seconded it. I was <laughs> well. I'll yield. Okay. Um, uh, great. So, the uh, it is it is moved by Regent Carvalho, and um, why and and Regent McMichael has has kindly su strongly suggested to me that Regent Del Carlo did in fact um, second this motion. Um, to request approval of the adoption of a resolution approving documents pertaining to the issuance of obligations for the purposes of refinancing certain facilities for NSU, Nevada State University, and authorizing the chancellor to finalize and approve any necessary modifications and to execute certain lease purchase documents in conjunction with the refinancing. Is there any other, dis is there any discussion? 
Seeing no discussion, those, uh, those who in, are in favor of this, please signify by saying aye or yes. Aye. 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 Those who oppose say no or nay. The motion passed. Prior to moving on to agenda item number eight, which is the uh, salary equity study, we'll take a, a five to 10 minute ad, ad, administrative break. Thank you. Okay. So we'll continue and we'll move on to agenda item number eight, which is the uh, salary equity study. Um, and I will ask uh, Acting Chancellor Dale Urquiagua um, to uh, lead us off in this conversation. Uh, we are being joined today uh, on video, I believe, um, by a representative of Huron, um, but I wanted to give you some context um, in case you didn't get this far through the briefing papers. Um, over this last year, we had two things come up at the system administration office. First was about the evaluation process. The Senate, the faculty Senate for system administration, system and computer services asked me when I was appointed to this job if I would um, update the evaluation process with training for supervisors. And so we knew we wanted a consultant to come in. They helped us create sort of new domains and categories for evaluation, and we conducted some training. We're still working through that process. It's a bit of a shift for us, um, but it is an improvement. And the other thing I noticed when I got here, because as you have heard over the course of recent weeks uh, with regard to the salary increases, um, which we refer to as COLAs, um, salaries have been stagnant within INCHI at large and within system administration for a number of years. Minor incremental changes um, by the legislature or when an individual uh, asked for a review of their position or requested an, quote, equity adjustment. And so those were done as one-offs um, and not a systemic review. And we try to use the salary schedules um, uh, for, the, for, as you heard this morning, administrative faculty. Virtually all of the positions at system administration are administrative faculty positions. We have two classified positions. And so it was clear to me that we needed to have an outside set of eyes help HR, because as you've heard, we have one person in HR currently. We're trying to hire a second. Um, and to just to look at um, issues of equity, had we caused any um, inequitable uh, payment structures by our actions being sort of one-offs, um, and were we within the, the grade bands? And so the second piece of Huron's work, which you'll hear about today, was about that. And those are not normally things that would come to the board. Those are um, internal administrative. Things like this are done at your colleges and universities as well. It's just it hasn't been done here in over a decade. Um, but in the spring, when we made the adjustments to two presidential salaries uh, to align them to the new salary schedule minimums, um, questions arose about presidential pay and equity and compression. So I added that to the Huron study as well. So they gave us sort of a two-part review, um, and they provide that information to us under privilege until we have a chance to go through it all. The board has seen those memos under privilege. Um, they are not public, and, and that is um, because of matters of litigation. They are, Huron is not held responsible um, because it is our privilege then not, uh, and that they are not looped into that. So um, that's the context of uh, what you'll hear today. Um, you've seen the short answer results. We're in a good place in terms of any inequities um, or challenges. We have some work to do at the SA level um, with certain positions, but I was relieved to note that there are not systemic compensation issues um, in, in either study. So with that um, preface, I'll introduce Kurt um, from Huron, because I think I see him online, and I'll let him walk you through this uh, agenda. Thank you, Mr. Great, thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? I wanna make sure. Yes, great, thank you um, and good afternoon. My name is Kurt Dorschel. I'm a senior director with Huron Consulting. Um, today, I'd like to provide you an overview of the approach that we took to the equity analysis uh, for system administration, human resource services project um, and provide some context. Um, first, by way of introduction, um, while there are different federal and state regulatory frameworks that apply to this type of inquiry, 
um, pay equity analysis is generally grounded in this idea of comparison of similar, similarly situated positions. Um, and what that means is that any differences in pay should be grounded in um, objective factors related to the role and the performance of the role, not related to demographic factors, including gender or race. Um, so that means when we see pay differences, we should see them related to differences in job function, job scope, complexity, or expectations, differences in relevant incumbent education, experience, qualifications, or seniority. That's the skill that's applied to a job and differences in performance as evaluated through a standard process. So the way that we approach equity analysis depends on the type of roles in scope, the size of the population and the available data. Um, in all of our analyses that we presented, uh, we used employment data provided by NSHE related to jobs, to pay grade assignments, market matches and salary. Huron did not review individual skill related factors such as education, experience, qualifications, or performance. And that's that's very important part of this context. So let's begin with the staff analysis. Using that available information, Huron did not identify systemic compensation inequity based on gender or race for NSHE staff positions. Keep in mind, NSHE is a relatively small organization. We looked at 141 positions as part of that analysis. Um, but those 141 positions represent a wide variety of jobs. There are administrative jobs, finance jobs, IT jobs, and multiple levels. There are also multiple jobs within NSHE that have what we would call a single incumbent. That means only one person does that particular job. And so in some cases, it's hard to find enough individuals to do a statistical analysis at that job level. There just are not enough people doing the same work in the same title or same level. So to account for that variation and still be able to provide some overall assessment, what we looked at was pay grade penetration. And what that means is we look at how far into the assigned pay range jobs are paid on average, and is there any variation based on gender or race in, in, that, um, in that pay range penetration. Um, so based on that analysis, there was no statistically significant uh, variance in pay grade penetration based on gender or race. So that means that those variables do not predict a statistically variation in how far someone has progressed in pay range. While we didn't identify any systemic inequity using that approach, we did identify some instances of pay compression um, where we have suggested that NSHE take on some additional analysis uh, to determine whether adjustments are warranted based on some of those factors um, that we didn't look at, some of those skill-related factors. Going forward, <clears throat> Huron recommends ongoing periodic review of job grade assignments. Uh, that is what pay grades individuals are, pos are uh, individual positions are assigned to as well as the market matches. So that's what external market data positions are matched to in order to uh, ensure that this um, equity is, is sustained. I'll turn then to the president analysis. Uh, and we separated the uh, analysis of the presidents from the staff analysis because of the unique nature of the role. Um, we can't apply the same approach. Um, and again, for context, I want to emphasize that the scope of this particular engagement was not an executive pay program design or an audit of individual decisions that were made uh, regarding pay setting or pay adjustment. So again, using in available information, Huron could not identify systemic compensation inequity based on gender or race for president positions. To keep that analysis in context, Leadership pay analysis is different in some ways from staff pay analysis. Uh, so first, um, there are many more factors that inform the scope, complexity, and expectations of a job. Um, and as a result, it can be hard to find equivalent positions. 
Second, leadership positions and setting pay for leadership positions often puts higher weight on factors like education, experience, and qualifications. Um, but there's also more nuance in those factors for leadership positions. For example, how much relative value of, of a past leadership experience uh, that a candidate brings is, is weighed into a pay setting decision. Third, performance in leadership has more dimensions um, and is often measured over longer time horizons. Um, so as a result, leadership pay setting and adjustment is usually not based on a strict formula or equation. Um, the eight and she presidents uh, spans essentially six different types of institutions, two research in universities, DRI, one state college, and four community colleges, though those span four, uh, excuse me, three different size institutions, small, medium, and large. Those positions currently cross two executive pay grades. Again, trying to provide some reference point, Huron did look at market uh, compensation using data from the AAUP. Um, that data comes from 2020, 2021. So there is a time lag, um, but all of the presidents are currently paid at or above the 2021, 2020, 2021 market median for their institution type. Um, when we look at the market ratios relative to those market medians, um, there is a distribution um, across the entire range. So the market ratios, again, that's individual pay divided by the market median, didn't show a pattern of differential pay based on gender or race in those market uh, ratios. Um, again, this is descriptive, not statistical analysis. Beyond this, as I mentioned, Huron did not evaluate individual education, experience, qualifications, or past performance. Um, all of these factors are assumed to have been taken into consideration during the arm's length negotiations that happen as part of um, assuming a new role and those the offer process. Huron was not part of those conversations. We did not review the individual frameworks that apply to each of those uh, or, or did not evaluate the appropriateness of each of those decisions. Similarly though, um, Huron does recommend ongoing market analysis um, of total compensation for president positions. This includes base pay, benefits, pay supplements, um, and perquisites to ensure that pay is set and maintained relative to the appropriate comparisons um, by leadership role and expectations by institution type size and geography. That's a summary of the two components of the project um, and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, from Regents regarding the equity study? Mr. Chair, if I may, Lord Perkins here. I gotta learn how to text faster. Regent Perkins. Thank you, sir. You mentioned in the um, in the presentation descriptive versus statistical. Can I get a little bit more information on what the differences would be? Sure. Um, so a statistical test would be using um, methods like regression, uh, correlation, um, just so using a, a way to essentially determine statistically how how confident we are that the variation is 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 either a result of or not result of a particular variable like gender or race. Descriptive um, analysis is just looking at a pattern overall. So it's looking that that um, when we looked at those market ratios um, by gender or race, they're distributed across the entire range of market ratios, which um, shows us that there's no obvious pattern, but there isn't a, a a conf what we would call a confidence interval associated with it that you would get if you had a larger sample size or were able to apply some of those other techniques of analysis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question really goes to uh, uh, Chancellor Urquiaga. I want to catch him at this last meeting he's in. Uh, we had 
Cola and the really a pay raise for faculty last time. So bear with me, kind of humor me. And I like that. That's fine as long as we could afford it. Was anything done for uh, part time adjuncts? That's what I mean. For adjuncts, did they get a salary raise too, uh, sir? And if they didn't, why not? When all the other people lined up here and lined up in Reno and lined up everywhere to say, give us a raise. Did those guys get it? Those guys and gals get a raise, sir? Is it, ma'am? Do you know what? Um, uh, no. I, uh, excuse me, Regent. Uh, Boylan Council just uh, uh, advised me that perhaps this is not a, a piece of this particular agenda item in terms of um, the, the faculty members that you're referring to mm -hmm. and COLA. Mm -hmm. And so I think it might be better for us if we address specific questions to the salary study. And perhaps um, those questions that you have could be asked at a later time. Agreed. Thank you, sir. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Region Downs, for the record. Um, I forgot the name of the, <clears throat> of the gentleman from the Huron Group. Kurt? Okay. <laughs> Kurt, I, I just had a few questions about the nature of the study that was conducted. So you mentioned it was a st statistical analysis, but was it adjusted by the market cost of living for, um, for the different communities? So for this... Um, particular study, no. Um, the focus of the equity was comparison across uh, positions within the, um, well, for the staff within the NG staff organization and for the president. So there is not an adjustment um, based on geography. Um, it's based on uh, just the positioning relative to the overall national market. So that AAUP is a national market data point. Um, I do highlight the the recommendation that we did give, which is um, president paid data is fairly complex. Um, it does include things like geography. Um, it would be a different type of project to collect that data, um, make sure that it's reflective of total compensation as well as geography. So um, this particular analysis did not include an adjustment for that. Okay, so I need to, some clarification. I I was given a document earlier from uh, Vice Chair Escada, the salary. Vice Chair, I'll take that. Mr. What was this? Is this what you sent earlier in relation to this study here? No. Okay. What I was referring to when I sent that out to uh, yourself and to uh, Regent Brown document that was provided was an email that was disseminated to the regents of last year in 2022. It was relevant to a previous topic that was uh, on the agenda. And at that size structure, it just gave the breakdown. It was just helpful information for a uh, backstory about the increase of salaries and compensation to current employees on the systems level. Okay, thank you. Sure. You want some, uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, Dale or Kiaga, if I could provide some additional clarification between the two different studies. So in the fiscal year 22, the system engaged in a uh, per policy system-wide salary schedule study, which did include some of market analysis. That creates the salary schedules that you find in the procedures and guidelines manual okay. that are published. This is not that. Um, <laughs> those bans were established. This was a specific review to see w where our administrative faculty and lately our presidents fall within the existing salary schedules. It was not about the rightness okay. of those salary schedules. Okay. okay. I thought this agenda item, I, I was led to believe that it was from a question I had. And so it was put on the agenda from a few months ago. And so I'm, I'm more interested in the actual salary study that affects all the employees and how it was developed. Uh, those are my questions. And uh, was it Huron Group that did this one as well? No, it was a different group, and I apologize, I don't remember their name. But okay. I, I am familiar with your request, and I know that um, Executive Vice Chancellor Abba and HR are pulling that data. Oh, okay. Thank you. Separate item. Thank you. Easy to get confused. <laughs> 
Are there any other questions uh, regarding the equity study? Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record. Kurt, um, what can you let me know what computer program you use to run that data analysis? Um, I would actually have to refer to my um, my team that did the primary quantitative analysis. Um, we use typically a combination of different uh, tools, including Excel, but as as well as statistical analysis packages. Um, I don't have top of mind which which particular uh, statistical tool we used for this. Okay, I'd like that information in the future because there are some very effective tools and some tools that are kind of put together caveman style and it really has an effect on, on that. So thank you. Are there any other questions regarding the study? I don't see additional questions. Um, Mr. Dorschel, thank you very much for your time and, and for the information and for the analysis that you provided. I'm I'm sorry I was I'm sorry uh, Mr. Doshaw I was I was letting you slip out a little bit too early. Um, we do have a another question, uh, Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I I, I did uh, raise my hand a little late while you were while you were closing that out. But um, on the briefing paper, it um, does make mention that uh, there were some individual positions for potential review related to compression issues. Is that something that's going to be taken up within the chancellor's office to address that, or will that come to the board at all? Mr. Chair, no. if I may, uh, I'll end. I'll take that question rather than Kurt. Um, for the record, uh, Dale Urquiaga. So um, through the chair to you, Regent Carvalho, um, where the INSHI staff, system administration, system computing staff is concerned, those adjustments, if any, will be handled in the chancellor's office. That's a normal course of our building our budgets and setting um, position descriptions. Um, the uh, Huron folks had a number of other recommendations um, some of which apply to the presidential scale. And so as an, a future agenda item, as you contemplate, particularly since you will have two presidential turnovers in this year, uh, and maybe offering new contracts, one of the things that I would recommend that you do is ask um, either your HR staff or commission another group like Huron to look at the presidential scales. Because as uh, Mr. Dorschel has said, each of those contracts is negotiated one-on-one -on -one by a chair and that applicant, um, and sometimes a chancellor if there is one. And so they all sort of start in dis different places. And so um, while there is a scale, and we try to fo we start folks, for example, President Dalpy was started at the very bottom of the scale when he became president, not interim, um, you may wish to add things like market analysis. One is the president of a university in Las Vegas versus the president of a university in Reno, with due respect to presidents of Sandoval and Whitfield. Or one is the president of a small rural school versus an urban school, a college, for example. So none of that exists in today's schedules. And so as you move forward over this year, that may be a step for you to consider, would be my recommendation. That is, would be a board conversation versus the staff, which would be for your interim chancellor. Thank you. I, I appreciate that that explanation. I was going to ask about that second um, part in the institution presidents, that last bullet point. So thank you for addressing that. Mr. Doshaw, I don't, I don't think there are any other questions. Again, thank you very much for your time today and for your analysis. Thank you all. We'll now move right into agenda item number nine. This is regarding extension of employment. Um, and I will ask uh, President Hilgersum to start us off with uh, this conversation. Hi, President Hilgersum for the record. Um, I did not anticipate that, so I need to. I should pull up the actual, <laughs> the actual brief. But, but uh, to be uh, concise, is to say that um, I am asking the board for a one-year extension to my current contract. Uh, I love TMCC. 
It's been a, a fabulous seven years, and I look forward to doing uh, as much as I possibly can do for the next two years uh, prior to the sunset of what is a hopeful extension of my contract. Uh, I will continue to serve the college and the Board of Regents and the Chancellor to the very best of my ability and uh, to the very best of my efforts, and I would appreciate your consideration today. Uh, I understand that the Acting Chancellor and the NG legal team figured out how to craft this motion. In the past, uh, this, these extensions have been granted, but it was not necessarily per code, per code, but they did go to the regions. In December of 2022, you may or may not recall that you passed a, a update and a revision of the presidential periodic review process very detailed. And now some of those things that happened in the past in an unofficial capacity, although they did go to the board officially eventually, is now in code. So when a president is uh, saying, you know, I've been through a couple of periodic reviews, which I have, very rigorous, very, very thorough process. I've been through several positive annual reviews. Uh, then in the past, presidents who have requested an extension with the understanding that the contract would sunset at that point and the president would not be interested in a renewal, the periodic review was also waived. So those sort of informal arrangements have now been put in your code, which I appreciate very much. I think it's good that we're all transparent. We all play by the same, the same rules. And I'm just asking for the same consideration that was afforded to three previous presidents in, in, since I've been at NSHE, which was June of 2016. Thank you. Did I cover everything, Acting Chancellor Erkiaga? Thank you, President <coughs> Hilgerson. I appreciate you opening up the um, <coughs> conversation for this agenda item. I'd actually like to um, go to Regent Downs, who has uh, some questions regarding this. So we received, uh, I believe the whole, everyone on the board received um, the climate survey for the, the, the NFA did for the system last year. So for some people, it's repeat because you already saw it. For the new people, it's new. Uh, I'd like to have a chance to actually go into that. Um, is it possible to delay there? I could do, I mean, make a motion that we bring this back in a month so we have a chance to actually look at this uh, survey. I seconded. Regent Downs, was that a, um, I, I just want to make sure I, I heard you correctly. Um, are you making a motion to bring this item back within a month or the, the motion would be to table the item and then, what's that? I'm sorry, the correct word uh, from guidance of legal is to postpone the item. Um, and if, if so, I do believe that Regent Boylan is seconding that motion, but I, I want to make sure that I heard you Correctly, Regent Downs. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a motion to postpone um, the agenda item regarding a one-year extension of, of employment for President Hilgerson. That motion was seconded by Regent Boylan. Is there any discussion? Discussion by Regent Arascada. Vice Chancellor, just, go ahead. Just for, I mean, no, but, Vice Chair. Thank you. Careful on that. Um, thank you. Um, Regent Downs, just for clarification, are you requesting the postponement of this so we can review the campus, uh, climate campus surveys, or are you, can, are you asking to conduct a new climate camp, campus climate? I would just simply to review what has already been put out, and it is a system-wide comparison. Perfect. Thank you. You know, I do want to, I, I do want to, I'm interested in what the acting chancellor may offer in terms of what this um, looks like outside of, of, of the motion that was generated. Um, and, and this is still part of the, the discussion um, because I believe that, that not all of this is, is codified in code. Some of it may be in the procedural and guidelines manual. Um, and I'm, I'd like to hear from the uh, acting chancellor regarding this agenda item.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Urquiaga. So um, I'll prov let me provide information about how these processes work, um, which may be helpful to the motion of why you would like more time. So I want to be sure that I'm speaking to the agenda item and the motion in, in an appropriate way. So um, the as President Hilgerson mentioned, the, pre the evaluation code uh, and procedures were changed by the board in December. And that's where the this new 12-month period of a announcement of retirement or intent to separate comes from. And so she is correct. In the past, that was not part of the this process. And so uh, um, and a contract could be extended and there was not a trigger in the code that said you have to do this periodic. And so the reason this agenda item was constructed in the way that it was, it's both a contract extension and a waiver because I, as chancellor, don't have the authority to waive a periodic because of the way the code is now written. A periodic evaluation, if conducted, would include a campus survey. And so that, I think, is the, without putting words in his mouth, that if I understand the genesis of Regent Down's question is, if there is an existing climate study, Keep in mind that study is not conducted by NSHE, and this methodology could be flawed. Um, uh, but it, it would give you data that you do not have because a periodic evaluation is not before you today. So um, the reason this item is written in the way it is is because we've had many conversations here at Legal with the legal team about what is the order of operations here. Does the periodic have to begin? The answer is yes. The clock has to start. Um, unless that announcement is made. And this kind of constitutes that announcement, except it's not, it's within a 12 month period of the contract extension, but then the contract goalpost moves. So we felt it was better for the board to deal with this issue all at once. Contract extension and waive the periodic or contract extension, conduct the periodic or conduct a periodic so I can decide about a contract extension. Those are all, I think, your choices. Um, so we tried to present this to you in sort of those orders of operation. Um, it, uh, so I'll pause there, uh, Mr. Chair, and see if you have a follow-up. Thank you, uh, Acting Chancellor. I, I don't believe I have a follow-up to that specifically because I think you 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 addressed a sequence of events that um, that exist in 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 policy regarding a periodic evaluation. Prior to the sunset, we could say of a contract um, to then help establish the way that uh, a, a body would move regarding the contract. Um, I will. Let's see, Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I guess my question is: um, the survey that Regent Downs is speaking of wasn't that an NF? A conducted survey is that the same survey and and if so um, I, I feel like we should um, be reviewing surveys that are conducted by NSHE uh, with no disrespect to NFA but I'm not sure what that process is so I just I, I just wanted to throw that out there as a piece of information thank you you know what I'd like to do is um, ask uh, our uh, vice chancellor, um, Patty Charlton, to, to just provide some context in terms of policy and sequence of events regarding this particular agenda item. Yes, so thank you uh, for the record. Patty Charlton, acting vice chancellor for academic and student affairs. Uh, from the history, and again, I think I've been around the system for decades and decades, but um, I think as Chancellor Arkeaga uh, mentioned, the process that, that he has put forth is consistent with what we have historically done and to, looked at, to look at including the input um, that has been referenced uh, with the institution. Hope that helps. It, it, it did clarify something. So I guess I just want to make sure that I understand what you're, what you're stating is that Typically, there would be a, a periodic review prior to any type of contract extension. And, and this particular agenda item asks that to be waived. Um, and so I just wanted to be able to clarify um, 
that point. Yeah, so that's correct. And so again, I think as the chancellor mentioned, is that there's a moving of the goalpost within because it's the periodic is done within a certain period of time, and so then that we would be moving it out, or you would be moving it out another year. And so that's that's correct. Regent Downs. I'm sorry. Before we go to Regent Downs, it looks like Regent Brown. Thank you, uh, Regent Brown, for the record. So I go back to, you know, the last seven months being on this board, and I feel like we've had a couple of discussions about NFA versus Faculty Senate. Um, so to kind of echo what my colleague, Regent Goodman, said, you know, for me, I find the NFA's materials to be so helpful, and it really gets a conversation piece started. Um, but I think for... Um, processes of the regents, we have to take what Faculty Senate says and then what NSHE institution um, reports say. So I do unfortunately disagree with my colleague, uh, Regent Downs, about this uh, survey being a crux of this issue um, just because the source and who we are as an institution and the precedent that we've set. And I do think it is an important precedent that we um, we keep lines of communication and the way they are. So um wanted to just say that for the record for this point. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. So, I mean, there is um, concern about the validity of a study conducted by the NFA. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to um, asking NSHE to conduct a climate survey for all institutions itself, but then at that point, why don't we just go forward with the periodic review if we're looking for something that's more um, more substantive. But what does legal say about the uh, outside information? Is that something we could base decisions on or is that something we need to avoid? So I, I, certainly I'd like to defer to um, our, our, our counsel, um, Linda King. Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the record. The procedures and guidelines manual set out the criteria for considerations for presidential evaluations. And um, I, I would need a few moments to go back and, and review that. Um, I right now would say that it doesn't expressly exclude that consideration. And as a body, you could take an action to consider that information. Uh, but I think that your fellow regents have expressed their concerns about the distinction um, of the entities that are preparing that information and their roles within the system. I can provide. Mr. Chair. The, Mr. Chair, this is Dale Rickyard for the record. I'll, I'll add to what council has said because I have become intimately familiar with the evaluation. Um, process and procedure over the last several months as it has been revised. So it specifically says that a survey during a periodic evaluation, a survey is conducted through the faculty senate. The faculty senate has a representative on the evaluation committee um, and that individual is under the, the as revised procedure um, responsible for preparing uh, with chancellor approval that survey and bringing it to an evaluation committee. Council is also correct in that that evaluation committee holds meetings on campus, conducts interviews, and gathers information in other ways. And then the evaluation committee brings that information uh, to its consultant or chair of the committee. And that is turned into a recommendation of what the evaluation um, uh, the report would finally conclude. And then the board receives that report and acts upon it um, uh, in the normal process. So. I agree with council, not excluded from using other information sources. I agree with the other regions. The, the process specifically calls for um, an evaluation survey um, uh, under the auspices of the faculty senate, not the association for alliance. I apologize. Thank you. Regent Breger. Thank you. Um, really to echo, uh, Susan Breger for the record, sorry. To echo um, Regent Goodman, taking it as something 
kind of from an outside source, and I, re I respect NFA, and they do send a lot of information for us to uh, review and look at and make our own decisions, of course. So I think that would be really a mistake right now to move forward on anything with, like, something we didn't do. Just my comments. So, um, Regent Breger, just in that then, is there... Um, is, is there any type of suggestion that some type of evaluation or periodic review be done to advance the process? Um, or are you just simply reaffirming what, um, what uh, other regions have said regarding where some of the information came from? Yeah, I think reaffirming for one, but secondly, now that it would be possibly a two-year contract, I think that... Uh, President from TMC, or uh, yeah, TMCC, get all my schools mixed up, you know, is amazing in the work that's being done and going there, but I think that uh, an evaluation might need to be part of the process. I, I think bringing it back is not something I'm opposed to. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Um, I think we're all over the board here, and I feel like we're um, we're, you know, it looks like we're going to be treating her, President Herkelson, Herkelson differently than we've treated three other presidents of the past. And I mean, we've already kind of set our course in order. And if we want to do something differently in the future, then I think we need to go back and change our code and stuff. But if, if we've uh, given contract extensions under the same terms for, um, it was President Johnson, it was President uh, Patterson, help me somebody, it was um, uh, President Helens. I think there was one more in there that we should be very careful that we treat our uh, presidents equally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent DeCarlo. So I think I would, I'm gonna ask if um, legal has anything to add in that and perhaps Vice Chancellor Patty Charlton has anything to add in that only in some references were made prior to some of us being on the board um, and who weren't a part of any of those conversations regarding extension of contract with other presidents. Um, is there anything that might be added to this to help sort through some of the, um, some of the, the, the process part of, of how things are getting done? Excuse me, Chairman Brooks. I- Regent Tarkanian. Can you hear me? Yes. I uh, understand the concern Del, uh, Regent Del Carlo has about what's been done in the past, but I feel that we have uh, a feeling here that we should continue with this evaluation. I mean, that's what seems to be coming to me. If the year is granted the extension, that's one thing, but you don't just take information from an evaluation and use it for the person that you're evaluating. You also take it to give you ideas as far as what has worked, what has not worked, what characteristics of that individual have proven to be worthy and so forth and so on. So I just would like to say that I strongly believe that we should have the evaluation. The person had the year to work here. The evaluation was part of the understanding and that is information that we can use as we set up standards of uh, our own that we set over previous uh, boards. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I had initially posed the question to both um, Patty Charlton and, and our council just to ask if there's anything that you can provide to help us in terms of some of the context, uh, historical content mainly. Uh, for the record, Patty Charlton, I think the only thing I would add is that the code has changed multiple times since the referenced extensions um, were done, and so I would just yield to counsel. Linda King, Associate General Counsel, for the record. And Interim Vice Chancellor Charlton has explained that um, perfectly well. There have been code revisions or procedures and guidelines, manual revisions that have taken place over the years. 
um, where these individual decisions, past decisions are being referenced. Um, I've not had an opportunity or um, until now been asked to take a look at that, um, to analyze what the changes were and apply those to the applicable individual assessments that were made with those other executives. Um, and I think just from an HR perspective, um, that those are individualized assessments that are done. Thank you. Yes, Go ahead, Regent Breger. So just a, uh, Susan Breger for the record, just a question in regards to things that change, like let's say midterm of someone's uh, presidential reign. Do we ever grandfather anything or they just go into the new procedures? I, I can opine on this, but I think it's an excellent question for your permanent chief of staff. Um, <laughs> typically, um, if, if there's going to be a grandfather, it's going to be expressly provided in the revision. And Carrie, would you agree with that? Thank you. Um, President Hilgerson, we appreciate your patience. We know that you'd like to have another opportunity to speak about this agenda item. Well, I, I think I just uh, want to reiterate that in December of 2022, the board voted on new code that helped make transparent a process that has been done, uh, and even quite recently. I think uh, mo the majority of board members were here when the most recent extension was granted, and a periodic review, which would have been conducted this year, was unofficially waived. It did not happen. Uh, so I would encourage the board to treat me equitably, I have been through two very thorough, very thorough multi-month periodic reviews uh, with good success. I'm still here. I'm the longest senior president in the state of Nevada heading into my eighth year. I've also had uh, good annual evaluations, the one most recent conducted by Acting Chancellor Eric Yaga in December of 2022 as well. Uh, I, I, I do learn from evaluations. I, I learn a lot from both annual evaluations and periodic evaluations. However, and I was hoping I didn't need to mention this, but now I believe I do need to mention this. I was hoping it would be unnecessary. Uh, the new code that you voted on also changed the timing. Previous to the new code, the periodic review needed to be completed prior to one year at the end of the contract sunset date. The board voted in December to say within the year. When I completed my self-evaluation, the decision for a four-year contract would have arrived at the board in December. Uh, that would have been fine. That would have been very good. Would have liked that. Because the reality is community college presidencies, the bulk of, of job openings, are advertised in December, January, February, with many interviews conducted in February, March, and April, for typically a July start date. There was a delay in the process, and, and I think in part because all of us were extremely busy trying to do the best for this system for our colleges in the Nevada State Legislative Session. So I think we were all feeling uh, uh, very long work weeks, lots going on. But now the delay, should I go, should I rescind this whole thing? which I'm actually thinking about doing after this conversation, if I went for a four-year contract, that means that this would probably arrive maybe, because we don't know who the chancellor is, but maybe it would get to the March board meeting. That would put me in a very uncomfortable position of probably being a top four finalist at a couple of colleges while the board is deciding my fate for TMCC. What I'm trying to express here is that the timing of my periodic review has not been optimal, not just for me, but for my institution, for TMCC. It's, it's, it's never good when a president applies for another job. And I, I regret that I applied for the job in Washington State. I knew the minute I visited that even though it's a wonderful college, that I, I wouldn't be a good fit there. And, that TM, and I came back from that experience thinking TMCC really is where I wanna be. I love this college. I am the only president right now that has gone through not one, but two periodic reviews. The periodic reviews, for those of the regents who are new, take several months. It's a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of information. And, and it's, it can be really excellent, and it can be a great learning experience. 
But I truly believe that I, I, I have earned the privilege of asking for a one year extension. If you would like to say that, you know, the periodic review, uh, uh, you'd like that to happen, then I, I guess the code that you just voted on doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I'm just leaning into the new code that as regents you approved in December of 2022. Uh, but most importantly, I am asking for a one year extension. Uh, and, and if that is not granted today, uh, then I need my periodic review to be done in, in accordance with your new code and with my contract, which means that the, a chancellor, and it won't be acting Chancellor Dale Urquiaga because he's almost done with his time. A chancellor needs to get going and conduct that review in a timely way. And I'll apologize in advance that when the board is deciding my fate for TMCC no earlier than March, I am going to be compelled. I will need to uh, look, look elsewhere, which would break my heart. It would break my heart. So uh, the, the timing of this is 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 unfortunate, but I but I understand why it occurred. I know we all have great intentions. We're all doing our very best. So, so again, I, I'm simply asking to be treated like the other three presidents that I've seen. They received a one year extension, and if you need me to request a waiver of the review closer to my new sunset date of July 2025, which means I would request a waiver of the review in June of 2024, that would be fine. That's a nice compromise, but I do really appreciate that Acting Chancellor Eric Yaga and the legal team thought, well, why would we do that? Why don't we just try to find a way to streamline this process? You know, um, and again, I, I believe I've earned it. Thank you. Thank you, President Hilgerson. There, <clears throat> we, we certainly appreciate the, the candidness of the conversation that you're having with us. Um, I, I, I do believe that because you brought up the evaluation, um, directly relating to um, Acting Chancellor Dale Urquiagua that um, perhaps he should have a moment um, to add any additional um, thoughts he might have regarding that because it was something that was very specific outlined to us. Um, and, and I think I'll just start with there. Um, Acting Chancellor uh, Urquiagua. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Urquiaga. So, um, I'll give the board uh, as much information as, as I can. Uh, so as President Hilgerson has said, she had um, positive evaluations done in, uh, I'll use calendar years, so it's easier for me, uh, calendar 21 and calendar 22, one by Chancellor Rose, one by me. Uh, that's the annual review process. The chancellor does that um, based on information received from the president and then um, writes up a memorandum, typically. Um, we don't use a rating scale for presidents uh, the way we do for staff. So that, so you have that information. That has been done. Those were, as the president has represented to you, positive. Um, we did begin the process um, for a periodic evaluation uh, this spring, um, and we began that for all three community college presidents whose... Uh, Contracts would expire on June 30, 2024, that being President Hilgerson, President Helens, and President Zaragoza. Um, President Helens and President Zaragoza indicated to me privately early in that process and then publicly later in that process that they did not intend to ex request an extension and that they would comply with the policy's requirement to announce um, by the end of the 12 month period or the beginning of the 12 month period. And so they both did that at the end of June. President Hilgerson, um, began, we began to move forward with her periodic evaluation, went through the process of identifying outside consultants, went through the process of, uh, identifying an evaluation committee. Um, the president, uh, had raised some questions about the selection of the consultant. And as she has indicated, we were in the middle of legislative session. So I paused the evaluation until July 1, and which would still be within the policy to begin her evaluation at that time. And had we begun on July 1, uh, we would be done by December uh, under our timeline. And in June, the president asked for this item in lieu of that periodic evaluation that she would extend by one year and would forego the periodic. And so we've constructed this item. So that's how we got to here. Um, 
She is correct. This is a month long, months plural long process. The timeline is in place um, currently because we created it uh, previously. So um, to address her concern, uh, obviously I will be gone and cannot make promises, but to address her concern, the um, if there is not an interim chancellor on August the 4th, the officer in charge could initiate that process and, and turn it, hand it off to an interim chancellor who to be named later. Um, because the beginning of that process is the chair chooses a consultant and the chancellor appoints a committee. And then you must begin a survey process, which couldn't happen until September anyway, because the faculty is not there. So it's feasible, but tight that that document would be prepared in time for the December meeting, keeping in mind that moves it to a November submission date. Um, and there are three other evaluations, President Sacharya, Whitfield, and Sandoval in that order um, that are due for their periodic in this period, but they have a longer runway. So it's a really long, probably convoluted answer um, to your question for clarification, Mr. Chair, but... I, that's how we got to here, and I want to try to be responsive to President Hilgerson's concern that the evaluation would might not be done by December. I understand the hesitancy to extend a contract without a periodic evaluation. Um, I truly do. Um, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Um, Regent Brown? Uh, thank you, Regent Brown, for the record. I don't know why I have to follow uh, Acting Chancellor Del Urquiaga, but because um, that was very helpful. But um, I think I just had one more small point that going back to the motion, which was to postpone because of this survey, um, the more I thought about it, it's uh, I stand by what I said earlier, but... Um, we do have a code for what this looks like. And if it's not, if something is not done by ENCHI, if it's done anonymously, we don't know the voting structure. We don't know, you know, the inputs. Um, I do just wanted to um, make sure that we don't go down like a slippery slope and start bringing um, bad precedent to the process. Um, having said that, um, I think we should continue on with this conversation. Um, maybe even take a vote on the motion so we can move on to. So I don't. I don't know what the right process is here, but I think President Hilgerson has laid out a good case where not only is this something that we've done in the past. She's our longest-serving president. We've put her in a different timeline. Um, a two-year transition period is is good for an institution. We've got three other evaluations and two other presidents we're going to search for. We're searching for a chancellor. Um, I feel like this is a process that we've put in as a precedent, and I'd like to see us withhold that, especially because the last couple of meetings we've talked very heavily on precedent and needing to um, keep precedent because for continuity's sake, and so I would urge us to do that here. Regent Goodman. I'd like to call the question on the current motion on the floor. Do that. Regent Goodman's <coughs> made a motion to uh, call the call to the question. Um, the question again okay. was a motion by uh, Regent Down, seconded by Regent Boylan, to postpone uh, the one-year extension of employment um, for TMCC President Karen Hilgerson. <coughs> Is there a second to? Um, Regent Goodman's motion to call the question. Regent Perkins here. I'll second that motion. Seconded by Regent Perkins. Um, we'll take a, if there's no discussion, we'll just move into a, a roll call vote um, for the uh, question that is on the floor right now, which is um, to simply call for, the, call for the question, which is the motion uh, presented again by Regent Downs, seconded by Regent Boylan to uh, postpone the extension. 
Carrie, we please take a And just for vote. clarification, a, a yes vote is to postpone and a no vote is to not postpone. The no, other way? Right, no, right now, Regent Brown, what, oh, this we're, is, what we're doing is this is a, a vote. I apologize. To, uh, yes, sorry. Okay, no problem. Regent Towns. And debate. No. Regent Goodman. No. I want to no, you're a yes. I'm confused. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I think you have it. I don't think it's right. Sorry. So, so just for clarification, we've called the question on their the on their question. item, which yeah. is right. to postpone, so, and so, I don't want to postpone. You need a vote. Um, you need a vote. <laughs> so, t t t oh. typically, Regent Goodman, this is a vote, right? Because we have two things going on at once. Oh. We have the motion, the discussion, and then you've called for the question. So when you call for the question, now we have to have a, a second and then the process of the votes to end the conversation and go directly right into the motion that was originally made. And that's the process that we're in now. Would you like to restate your um, your your vote to... <laughs> While council is letting me know that uh, <laughs> Linda King, associate there's general no counsel, backs. no, we're not going to take this back. We're going to go ahead. <laughs> Our recommendation is that you can um, that we restart the roll call vote. And just for clarification, you all are not voting on the initial motion on the substance of the item. You are voting whether or not to call the question, which be to which be to stop debate essentially. So you are voting right now if you are going to stop discussion and stop debate. Mm -hmm. Regent Downs. No. Regent Goodman. Yes. <laughs> Regent McMichael. Yes. Regent Perkins. Yes. Regent Tarkanian. Regent Tarkanian. We can't hear you. Regent Tarkanian, because there's a, a pro problem with the... I think, it, I think I got it fixed. Can you hear me now? Yes. My, I was, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Arascata. Yes. Regent Boylan. No. Regent Prager. Yes. Chair Brooks. Yes. Regent Brown. Yes. Regent Carvalho. Yes. Regent Cruz Crawford. Yes. Regent Del Carlo. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. So it has been moved by um, Regent Downs and seconded by uh, Regent Boylan to postpone agenda item number nine, the one year extension of employment agreement for TMCC president. Um, Karen, uh, uh, Karen Hilgerson, and, and for that, we will take a roll call vote. Regent Goodman. No. Regent McMichael. No. Regent Perkins. No. Regent Tarkanian. No. Vice Chair Arascata. No. Regent Boylan. Yes. Regent Breaker. No. Chair Brooks. Yes, only because I think we still have some. Yes. Regent Brown. No. Regent Carvalho. No. Regent Cruz Crawford. No. Regent Del Carlo. No. Regent Downs. Yes. Motion fails. Mr. Chair, if I may, Laura Perkins here. Sure. I would like to move that um, I'd like to move that we extend the one year uh, the one year extension of employment agreement for TMCC President Karen Hilberson with um, both number one and uh, number two waiver of the periodic evaluation. Regent Harris got a second. So uh, okay. So it's been moved then by Regent Perkins and seconded by Regent Arascata um, 
to approve the one-year extension for uh, President Hilgerson. Um, it would be an extension of her, her employment agreement through July 1st, 2025, um, authorizing the acting chancellor to execute an employment agreement upon review and approval by the chief general counsel and waive the periodic evaluation pursuant to the procedures and guidelines manual, chapter two, section 2.2, with an annual evaluation to be performed consistent with the procedures and guidelines manual, Board of Regents Handbook, Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 2.81.C, and the current employment agreement, Section 5.1.C, in lieu of the wave periodic evaluation. Is there any discussion on this motion? Regent Borland. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and maybe I should ask uh, Council King. Oh, I like the sound of the Council King. Yeah, I should ask Council King, am I uh, or can I? I think I will anyway. Ask <laughs> President <laughs> Hilgerson, <laughs> why, what is her concern about this evaluation? I refer to evaluations when we were talking about the chief of staff position to give them, to give that position uh, the money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to have evaluations of people. So what is her concern uh, about this evaluation? Linda King, Associate General Counsel for the record. From a legal perspective to answer your question whether you can ask her these things. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, you may because we've got an open meeting law waiver on file. Thank you, ma'am. See, I already asked it. That was pretty smart. So uh, President Hill, Hill, no, Karen Hilgerson. Please. Yes, well, well, thank you, Regent Boyland. My first concern is timing. Uh, and, and the timing relates to uh, the way in which uh, two-year college presidencies, uh, the, the timing that, that are happening nationally. Because uh, the, um, so, so another way of putting it, I'm, I'm less concerned about whether or not to do periodic reviews and annual evaluations other than the fact that they have been relatively recently waived for other presidents once a final sunset date is determined. Okay, so I, I'd like to be treated equitably. My primary concern is that my contract is extended. Uh, with the contract extension, that would definitely, could lead to better timing of a periodic review. Uh, and, and so then I would not have have a concern other than the fact that there we don't have a chancellor identified. The chancellor facilitates the review. It takes several months. Uh, and if there's no facilitator at the helm, I think that's not just a problem for me and my, my uh, career as a president, but I think it's a problem for the system staff. So I guess my primary concern about a periodic review without an extension is very poor timing on, on many, many fronts. And then my second concern is just being treated uh, equitably. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Hilgerson. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. And um, what I'd like to say too, there with the five new um, regions on the board. What's really broken here is our whole presidential evaluation system. And just to give you some context, that was being reviewed by our former general counsel. They, and, you know, you're going to go, he was looking at, you know, nationwide best practices. I thought the presidents were talking about it and things. We have lost excellent presidents since I have been a regent because of our evaluation process. And I know that none of the new regions understand what it is. It's, it's a very rigorous process and it's, a, it's very difficult because in Nevada with the stringent, stringent open meeting laws, we cannot go into an executive session. Everything has to be done out in the open and it, it's, it's really tough. And I, like I said, we have a president that's now back in Texas that looked me in the eye and said, regent, I will never go through that process again. And he stuck to his guns and got recruited and left after, I think, it was like three, four years. So um, I just think that has to completely be reviewed. And um, I wholeheartedly support this motion to um, extend President Hilgerson's contract. 
I think we have to look at what some of the fine qualities that she has. I mean, she's been a complete leader in this entire state on sustainability. You talk about a forward thinking leader that's into our environment. I don't know about you guys. I'm sitting here in San Antonio just dying. It's 100 degrees out, but the with the humidity, it's about 115, as bad as Las Vegas, and the record, it's about ready to break. And there's something going on in this world. And thank you to her. Her campus is completely sustainable. I think we should all be proud of that. That, that shows some real leadership in her commitment to the Nature Conservative Tory, which she's a member of. Um, I had some other things written down. We've had nothing but good accreditation visits for TMCC. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really our gold standard in higher education is that accreditation grade every uh, seven years when they come in. Um, she's just done many, many things. And with any strong leader, you're going to have positives and negatives. And I just think the biggest part for me is just to treat our presidents equitably. And by approving this motion, we will. So thank you. And we can always make changes later, but for now, we've got to stay within our framework. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Regent Downs, for the record. So I don't know who to ask if it's going to be council, system council. Is it um, the um, chief of staff? Is it the chancellor? Um, I, I have several questions, and I... It would frustrate me if a policy wasn't followed. If we're not following our, our current policy we voted on, I'd like to know. Uh, so the, what happened in December, is this request in compliance with that? Or is it asking for something beyond what's in that policy? Um, because my understanding of the policy is it allows for, to skip a, a periodic evaluation if you're in your final year of employment. But not, does it include giving people the opportunity to add a year and then skip it as well. I mean, that's, so that's really where I'm, I'm, I'm confused here because I don't want to do something outside of policy. I mean, there's precedence, but if policy changes, we have to follow policy. Um, I am concerned about the periodic evaluation being delayed, and that does create uh, extra stress for people. But I also understand at this point it could not resume until, uh, well, and now, but you, it'd have to take on faculty to get it back on campus. So I am going to also say this, um, and I, I am curious if Teams to see assume has the same policy, uh, but for academic faculty, you have an annual evaluation, and then every five years, you have a, a more in-depth evaluation where you have a committee formed. It's not like yours. It's not like this at all. But uh, you do have a, a committee form, you have observations, and um, so people are looking at your performance. And I don't know of anyone who's ever waived it because they're going to leave. So, um, in fact, the time I stepped into administration to the time I came back, that clock never stopped for me. So um, we don't get a lot of uh, exceptions to those rules. So, anyway, my question does go back to the the experts and authority, whether that be the... Um, the uh, system council, the chief staff, or the chancellor. Linda King, associate general counsel for the record. Um, you've asked about two distinct things, and they're, they're tied together. One is within your, your procedures and guidelines manual, which is chapter 2, section 2.2, .2, that deals with the periodic evaluation. There are two requests that are being made in this agenda item, as you, as you, you have noted. One is the extent, one-year extension of the employment agreement, which is quite simply that, a negotiation of the employment agreement. That's something that doesn't, it is not impacted by what's in our, in our code, what's in, or in the um, PGM. What is impacted in the PGM is the correlating evaluation that would be conducted during that time frame. So if you, if you go to that section that I've cited, chapter 2, 2.2, the contingencies or the conditions that are there, um, I think it's been described before as kind of moving the, moving the time frame, um, that the periodic evaluation would be waived if, you, if the board approves it, um, and, but you would have to have an annual evaluation that occurred 
during the contract extension. So as far, there are two separate things. One is controlled by contract negotiation. The other, the evaluation is tied to our procedure that we have. The conditions that are set forth in the PGM would be the timing of the request for the periodic um, waiver of the periodic evaluation and the announcement of retirement. So has there, well, that, that's another question. Has there been a formal announcement of retirement? I mean, is it out there? There, there has, as the briefing paper indicates, um, and it, the, in, there's been an expression of an intent to retire, but I don't believe that in the presentation of the agenda item, President Hilgerson has made an express um, announcement today. Okay, I guess that's part of my question then too, because I was led to believe there was, but I have not seen it. So um, that to me, that means we're not actually following precedents if we aren't exactly doing an apples to apples comparison. Thank you, Regent Downs. Um, President Hilgerson, I, I, I did want to bring this back to you only because uh, of the discussion that just took place Regarding the retirement announcement, um, council did point out that if we take a look at the briefing paper, um, there is a clause in which says uh, the president announces the retirement or separation at least 12 months prior to the end of the contract period. Um, and so the way that, that we're understanding that is effectively because the agenda item is coming before us today and there's reference to policy in the briefing paper that there would be the expectation that during this conversation that we're having that you would in fact um, announce uh, retirement or separation. Regent, Chair Regent Brooks, would you like me to respond? Yes. Uh, so Karen Hilgerson for the record. Uh, first of all, I believe the code uses the word retirement or separation, and it is my intention to retire or separate, whichever way you want to put it, uh, July 1, 2025. Uh, so, so that is um, part of the request. Uh, the periodic review process language that you voted on in December does not use the word publicly announce, it uses announce. And if the regents uh, would go back uh, into the month of May, uh, you were all sent my uh, announcement via the chancellor. Uh, so, so I thought I did my due diligence and apologize if that was not clear. Uh, so, but hopefully it is clear now because I believe I'm more than 12 months <laughs> from, from the, from what the code requires. The other thing that I would like to add, I really appreciate Regent Downs question because I had the very same question. And I believe that there was another very lengthy email that I sent to uh, Acting Chancellor Erkiaga uh, inquiring about, uh, because at that time I was told that originally, well, well, we'll probably need two separate votes, but then my understanding was the Inchi legal team uh, decided that no, that will not be necessary. So uh, I, I'm just I'm not the attorney. I'm just doing as I'm told and just trying to uh, meet uh, some personal pro and professional objectives that I have. I, I am of retirement age. And like most people, uh, when one retires, you you do want to sort of um, have terms that work well financially, but, but I also want to balance the institution. And the, right now, the, the timing of a, a periodic review for contract renewal does not work well for the institution. And that's a big problem for this system. And I agree that even though the periodic review process, what you voted on in December is an improvement. It is. We're making, we're making gains. It, it, I do think now, um, I have learned that the process still needs work. So I would encourage the Board of Regents, whatever happens today, to go back to that process, take another good look, take a little more time, because there are still some, some flaws. But at this point in time, I was told that um, what is before you today is the proper legal way to proceed with my request. I hope this helps. I and, and I really appreciate the support of Regents. And, and, and I'll just close by saying I will give you 200% for the next two years. 
Thank you, President Hilverson. Regent Borland. Thank you, Chair. Well, in my limited time on this earth, I've noticed that <laughs> when uh, organizations use precedence over policy, it usually is to hide their own mistakes. And well, we did it like that, so let's keep doing it. We screwed up, let's not clear it now, we'll just keep doing it, because that's the way we screwed up before. So I believe what uh, Regent uh, Down said, that po uh, policy is more important than precedence. Then why do we have all these policies? Karen, Karen uh, President Hilgerson, I think you're great, you're awesome. It is nothing personal, but I do believe your concern about being evaluated again is interesting, to say the least. I have no reason, I don't think you should have any reason or be afraid of being uh, evaluated again for this position. So I'm, I'm just tr uh, trying to get out the point that we can't just keep following uh, Precedents because we screwed up and we didn't go with our policy. But I do wish you all the best, whatever you choose, whatever you do. I think you've done a great job so far, but I'm always for policy over precedents. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Is there any other discussion regarding this agenda item? I don't see any. And so the, the question is on the adoption of the motion to, uh, the, to extend um, a one-year extension of employment through July 1st, 2025, authorizing the acting chancellor to execute an employment agreement upon review and approval by the chief uh, general counsel and waiver of the periodic evaluation pursuant to the procedures and guidelines manual, chapter two, section 2.2, with an annual evaluation to be performed consistent with the procedures and guidelines manual, Board of Regents Handbook, Title IV, Chapter 3, Section 28.1.C, and the current employment agreement, Section 5.1.C, in lieu of the waived periodic evaluation. I will ask uh, Carrie to take a roll call vote. Regent McMichael. Yes. Regent Perkins? Yes. Regent Tarkanian? He's on mute again. Regent Tarkanian, if you could unmute, please. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Vice Chair Arascata? Yes. Regent Boylan? Uh, Council King, before I make my answer, can I ask a question to clarify what this is again, just for me? Can I ask that question? Before I make my vote, before I. Linda King, Associate General Counsel, I'll provide the clarification for you. The motion was stated um, to approve the two items that are being requested in the agenda item as drafted, which is a one year contract extension with waiver of a periodic evaluation, which would then trigger an annual evaluation. No. Regent Prager? Yes. Chair Brooks? Yes. Regent Brown? Yes. Regent Carvalho? A very supportive yes. Regent Cruz Crawford? Yes. Regent Del Carlo? Yes. Regent Downs? Yes. Regent Goodman? Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations on that, uh, President Hilgerson. Thank you. We certainly look forward to working with you for the next several years. Okay, if, um, unless President Sandoval would like to bring that back, agenda item number 10. I'm, 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 I'm kidding with you, President Sandoval. It's already been, it's, it was already pulled. We can't, we can't bring it back. Um, we will move on to item number, the agenda item number 11. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is the NG update on uh, dual enrollment. And thank you very much, Acting Chancellor, for providing us with this information. Of course, uh, you got me there for a second. 
Uh, so for the record, um, Patty Charlton, Acting Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs. And so today I'm here to provide an update for you um, just really on the state of where dual and concurrent enrollment is within our Nevada system of higher education. And so I do have a PowerPoint prepared today. And so I'm going to just do this at a very high level uh, regarding um, the policies that um, stipulate how we come before and then some of the processes that have been used today. I could have Okay, so first, uh, guiding our work in this very, very important space is Nevada Revised Statute, your own handbook, and policies that are set forth within the, the handbook, as well as some additions to the PNG, and then also some processes that relate to specifically high school, career, and technical education programs. Uh, first, under the Nevada Revised Statute is our framework um, under NRS 389, specifically 160, and uh, NRS 389.310, and I'm not gonna read those to you, but it basically provides the access for our high school students enrolled in ninth through 12th grades to receive college credit towards graduation um, if approved by their, by their trustees, the charter school or the board, or the state board, and then also um, envelops the, the role of the system office to participate in that space as well. Uh, through establishing dual credit through cooperative agreements. Within your handbook, we also have gone in um, and developed and you have approved policy related to this space, uh, specifically in Title IV, Chapter 16, in dual concurrent and early enrollment. And that section specifically relates to those students that can enroll in an NC college or university with the institution's um, approval. And then also the collaboration amongst our institutions that exist today. Uh, for example, the gathering of any of our schools that are participating in the dual and concurrent enrollment space, as well as if an institution has an existing relationship with a school, that they also work with the president and an academic officer before another school um, works with them. In addition, we have set forth, and you have set forth in your pro processes for a reduced registration fee. Uh, for those costs for dual and concurrent enrollment students. And then also sets forth um, the CTE programs, those are those career technical education programs where students also um, do a, uh, can earn state certification through that skill attainment for college credits as well as that articulated program. Uh, in addition, it makes provisions for how homeschool students are treated because they are not part of uh, that formal district. And then also establishes for how um, individuals are deemed to be college ready or a readiness assessment. And then also sets forth the definitions of the difference between concurrent enrollment and a dual enrollment. So for those purposes, a concurrent enrollment student is a course or a course that is uh, provided uh, at a high school by a high school instructor. And that is a mutually agreed upon by that institution and the high school. The dual enrollment is where a student is participating in a college level course by a NSHE instructor, and that can occur either at a high school or it can occur on our um, institutions. So we have seen um, some significant growth in this area since, uh, and this is just really, it's a six year uh, window. I was gonna give five years, but we happen to get our 22-23 data in there. So through another um, updated more uh, slide into, or metric into that um, component. But as you see from 2017, 2018, where we were just under 5,300 students to this most recent academic year, just under 15,000 students. This is an important space. Uh, sorry. Uh, Regent Cruz Crop. Oh. Regent Cruz Crawford for the sorry. record. Um, um, is this dual enrollment chart right here inclusive of the concurrent enrollment? Yeah, and okay. thank you, I apologize. So for the purposes of our data collection, these are data points that are received through mm. the NCHI system administration office from the institutions and includes a reference to any high school level student, regardless if they're in a formal agreement under an MOU or, or a student enrolls themselves in a course uh, within the institution. So it can be, it's basically everyone that is captured within there. So it's dual and concurrent in a formal agreement or a student that registers themselves. So you just pull NGIDs for kids that are currently in high school and that's how you know if they're doing? The institutions, okay. um, I'm sorry, uh, 
Regent Cruz Crawford, uh, through Chair Brooks to you. Uh, actually, the institutions provide these data points to the System Administration Institutional Research Office. So those are data files that are provided by the institutions and then those that are captured. Thank you so much. You bet. Okay. And so then also looking at that same level of data for those same periods um, broken down by institution, uh, the top line is CSN, and then you'll see in the colors, I apologize, I know they might be a little bit difficult, you'll see uh, UNR is the rust colored, and then there's a varying level, but one thing that we have seen is that that data is continuing to increase. Um, especially after the pandemic where we did see um, a slight decrease at that time. Um, another positive factor, so this is also going to show you from the, the time that we started gathering meaningful data from institutions in 2014, 2015, here is how um, the breakdown of those student enrollments looked from a ethnicity and race perspective. We're at that time in 14, 15, and again, that's the first level of data that we had. You saw primarily 52% um, were students that were Caucasian and then a mixture of other races and ethnicities. And one thing that we know uh, when you look at 22, 23 is we we're making a really meaningful difference in our um, populations where we now see a very different mix of our student population with our largest and fastest growing our Hispanic population. But again, of those f almost 15,000 students, quite a difference in um, the makeup of those individuals. I'd say kids, but you know, sometimes they're quite adults already. So in December of 2020, the Nevada System of Higher Education in collaboration with uh, the state superintendent embarked on a dual enrollment task force. And this was representative of individuals in the higher education space, community leaders, and also with our districts across the state. And so I know that, in fact, our um, one of our representatives, Gia Moore from Clark County School District is here with us today, because uh, we do know Clark County is one of the largest, um, district. well, it is the largest district in the state and one of the largest in the country. And so that task force began meeting in December of 2020. They held about eight different meetings um, from there till October of 2021. And they had various committees that were, were put together to look at various uh, topics and to provide recommendations to the state superintendent of instruction as well as the chancellor. Four specific recommendations. Yes, uh, Regent Boylan through. Mr. Chair, yes. <laughs> may I through you to uh, sorry. Ms. Sorry, Charlton? Sorry. Yes. I'm trying to remember your name, Charlton. Just Patty. Yeah, Charlton Heston is easy for me, so I remember you. I don't think Char I look anything like him. No, 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 no. it's just the name. <laughs> It's just the name, yeah. But okay. yes, ma'am, yes, sorry about that. Now, uh, and maybe council can help me with this. If uh, the Supreme Court just knocked down uh, anything based on race for higher education, why are we still doing all these, value, these charts and studies and maps based on race? Okay, I will uh, defer to council, please. Council, thank you. Linda King, Associate General Counsel. Um, I think perhaps the, the scope of the Supreme Court's ruling um, is much more narrow than you've represented. Um, that ruling has to do with consideration of race as a factor in admissions, um, but it doesn't prevent data collection. How simple is that? Thank you so much. Look at that. Great. Thank you. And so again, the task force looked at four main areas. Uh, the first was a pricing model that was consistent across um, the institutions or just a standard predictable pricing model. Instructor qualifications, also the school district supports that's within the districts across the state, and then also a metrics and data dashboard. In December of 2021, brought forward to the Academic and Research Student Affairs Committee was that recommendation on consistent pricing for both dual and concurrent enrollment um, applied universally throughout NSHE. And so what came from that process, and this was a set fee for the 22-23 academic year as well as the 23-24 academic year. And just as a note, right now, the academic affairs officers are reviewing um, some different strategies of what we will do moving into 24, 25, and beyond. 
And so first, what it establishes for concurrent enrollment, and again, these are those courses that are taught in a high school by a high school instructor, there would be a consistent fee of $75. No additional fees, such as a special course fee, if you're in a welding class, often you are paying an additional fee for materials, et cetera, would be assessed. And then also um, for dual enrollment, there's, two, there's a tiered system. First is the first one, the top uh, section, is $150 at our universities. Um, per credit, state college is $118, community college is $85. And then the second one is to address those individuals that are on free and reduced lunch, which is a, a reduced registration fee for those individuals. And so those are the pricing recommendations, and those have been put into place. And again, uh, we will be bringing back um, a change, and we're under the review with the academic affairs officers right now, and we will be finalizing this in the fall. So the next one was the instructor qualifications, and there was a, a link to the recommendations from the task force that was included in your briefing materials. We did differ on this specific area because uh, there was a, a tiered somewhat system or an aspirational goal, and the reason that we did that, and we have put this in place into the P&G manual, and this was uh, brought forward to the academic affairs officers, and we all agreed that uh, we have a new section of the P&G manual called Concurrent Enrollment Instructor Qualifications, and we are following our Northwest Commission on Colleges and University guidelines because the Northwest Commission does put forward what we call eligibility requirements, standards, and they also have policies that specifically refer to um, transfer of credit, and dual, dual enrollment was also listed in there, and so we've adopted the language specifically from our accrediting body, and so that is included in the PNG. The third and fourth areas of, that recommend, of those recommendations included one, the school district supports, which provided recommendations for curriculum guidance, communication, to meet the national standards for the delivery of concurrent enrollment, and that was really a subgroup that was comprised of school district individuals, and so there's not really a recommendation for this body that came forward. And then the final point was a metrics and data dashboard, and I provided the, the link to that uh, dashboard that is available on the NC website. And so it's got a host of information, and so I certainly encourage you to go out and look at that. The final item that, that the academic affairs officers brought forward was actually related to how instructors are compensated within the school districts. And so what uh, was determined and we've had, there were conversations that began around September of 2022. I've been here since April. And so um, we brought this forward and we have finalized this initial language. And this is in a, in chapter three, section nine of the PNG manual. And so agreed to with our, with the academic affairs officers was basically that a per course section maximum, not a per credit, but a poor course section maximum of $1,000 um, at each of the universities, our state university, I know that President Pollard's not here, and the community colleges. And then also some consideration that an institution may provide a stipend um, for additional professional development, which would not exceed $500 per instructor per semester. So if an instructor in the high school is teaching three classes that are concurrent enrollment, they would only receive not more than $500. And so that was uh, brought forward to the chancellor's cabinet and was approved just recently. And so with that, that is a very high level um, dive on where we stand with the state of dual and concurrent enrollment. Really want to um, thank the academic affairs officers and everyone for their support as we've been moving for, through this very difficult uh, conversation, uh, but really have to say that our institutions are doing really great work and we really appreciate the partnership with the school districts around the state and our charter schools as well. Uh, this is great for students. Mm. So with that, I would be available for questions. And then we also have representatives from the institution, should you have anything specific. Thank you, we appreciate the presentation. Um, Regent Brager. Thank you so much. This is very near and dear to my heart. I did not get off the school board until it was um, happening. So I did have a, and as an experience, have a granddaughter that started at CS West Charleston campus, 11th and 12th grade. Her only disappointment was she didn't plan to go there and didn't get to get her associates. She got quite a few credits and went on and graduated from UNLV um, with social work and uh, 
something else, I can't remember, but she worked three jobs, dean's student and, or honor student and uh, debt-free, took a lot of work because she qualified for some. So my question is, when they went back then, she's going to now be, I'm going to age myself, she's going to be 30 on Sunday, um, and they only paid for books at that point in time, back in the very beginning. And I appreciate a fee schedule. My concern is, are we taking away the opportunity from the wrong students? And how can we work to make sure that the students in 11th grade um, that wouldn't more than likely be able to go to college, that we're not making more of a roadblock for them now that they have to pay for? And I, I get it that it costs the campuses money and everything like that, mm -hmm. but I'm just very student-oriented. And I feel like this will now stop them from being able to move forward and get two years at a very um, economic financial ability. So is there something that we can create from the foundation for a form of scholarships or what can we do to make sure, because I will, and I won't say her name, but so like my granddaughter, a single mom of five, I mean, not her, my daughter at that time. So for Taylor to be able to get two years, and now I said her name, but anyway, two years, <laughs> it's just how you instinctively speak. To be able to get two years of college and still go on to UNLV and be an incredible student, she probably couldn't have done that if it hadn't been for the dual credit system. So yeah. I guess to belabor it, I don't want to belabor it, but I, this is my passion, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, making sure that those that want can, and I need to know how we're able to do that. Yeah. So... Um Regent Brooks, for you to Regent Breger. So first, one of the things that has been put in place is that actually reduced registration fee. Um, that is one component. The other thing that we have also seen that is in existence right now, and we're really grateful to our partners at the Nevada Department of Education, they have also come forward and put money towards the institutions for this very space, dual and concurrent enrollment specifically. Um, I think also, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of any of the presidents, but I know that often, and many of them are also engaged in philanthropic work to support that, and perhaps they might want to add some comments to that. Well, and before they do, how would a student, um, how would they find that out? I mean, first of all, it's overwhelming. You're, you know, like we dropped her off. At, uh, she didn't drive. She wasn't even, I don't even know if she was 16. But how do we make sure they know? They don't always know the right questions. And so I find that that could be the deterrent also. What, even though that's out there, some of them, they're the first time that anyone in their family is even going to further their education. So mm -hmm. if I can, even in the future, get more information, I wouldn't mind working on this or finding out what we do because it's that important to me that those that couldn't can and that we make sure we get them there to know that even if it takes them, and I know we always talk about the four-year college being important. I don't care if it takes them 10 years. You know, if they're on a path, and I know it harms you to a degree, but we need to get over that. I shouldn't get on this kit because I could go forever, but um, we need to get over that. Not everybody has the means and the way to get through a two- or a four-year program. And so I formally believe more students, people, students, whatever, would go to school if they knew there was a six-year plan or an eight-year plan or a 10-year plan. I mean, goodness, they're 17 and 18 years old. I created my life over again at 43 when I decided I wanted to get into be a trustee and I had to leave the school district. They wouldn't, I, they wouldn't let me stay. A leap of faith. I was a single mom myself, quite frankly. So that's where I'm getting at, even though they might be offering. How does that person from 10th grade going into 11th already feeling overwhelmed, figure it out. So first, uh, Regent Brooks, for you to Regent Breger, I would say that uh, the institutions, and again, I don't want to speak for them, they're very engaged, and that's also why we, our partnerships with the school districts are okay. so very, very key. Uh, many of the institutions, I believe, also have recruiters that participate at the schools as well. Um, I think as far as finding, how do we find the students that are actually um, eligible, perhaps, if, even if they come into the schools, we know that they haven't graduated from high school yet. And so again, perhaps um, some of the presidents could answer that. Okay, and then one more quick thing before they do. Um, is it still set up to where my granddaughter had to get permission from her teach of certain teachers to be able to get into that program? Is it still the same way or they can opt in however they want? And it's a while ago, remind you, she's gonna be 30, but um, at that time she had to have a document that she had to take to, I think, the math teacher and two other teachers at that time. If that's gone, I really think it's great because some teachers think you can do it and some think you can't. It shouldn't really be their opinion. 
Yeah, so I might ask one of the presidents, okay. and perhaps. I don't mean to belabor it, but it's just my, yeah. it's just something very yeah. important. President Sandoval? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to you, through you to Regent Brager, I think Ms. Moore is in the best position because she comes straight from the Clark County okay. School District. Super. And, uh, and I apologize for taking the time. I just think this is the best way to get students involved in college, and this is what we, I believe, are about. Good afternoon, uh, Board of Regents and our great NG partners that are here today. Um, I believe that the question was, how do we make a determination of what students and how, how do they get into this coursework? So as a district, um, and again, for the record, my name is Gia Moore. I'm a director of college and career readiness and school choice for the Clark County School District. Um, we have made some real systemic changes over the last couple of years. Um, to your point, there, there was a recommendation process that we believe um, was limiting our access and equity um, initiatives in the district. It was limiting that. Um, so now we take a multi-tiered approach in terms of how we address students in terms of what their goals are. So we start actually much earlier than high school. We start at the um, middle school level. That's where we start to um, expose them to the opportunities of what they can actually enroll in once they're in high school. So once they're in high school, we are working with schools individually. I met with every CCSD high school. They are now required to work with students and develop, further develop those four-year plans. So if I am a student and I'm interested in going on to be a medical professional, then all of my coursework for that four-year duration needs to align with that. Um, that was one of the things that we were uh, lacking in. We know opportunity without support is um, essentially negligent. So what we're trying to do is making sure that if you want to go off to college or whatever your plans are after high school, every course that you're in should align with that. Um, it shouldn't be a shock to you once you've reached college, for an example, that you needed to have more math or more science or those kinds of things. In addition to that, um, we are looking at data in terms of course recommendations. So when we took a look at our data versus who was being recommended for these courses, there was a huge gap. So we're looking at PSAT data, MAP data. Uh, we have ad hocs built into our infinite campus system that's identifying students that have the potential to be successful in these programs. And that's what we're looking at in conjunction with other factors. But um, that has made a huge difference over the last couple of years in terms of um, our access to these programs and our data is reflective of that. So I hope that answers your question, Regent Brigger. No, it did. Thank you so much. And, you know, because of some of the shortage we have and students, a lot of times they know they want to be a doctor. I mean, they literally know that at about 15, 14 years old. So knowing that they can have course criteria or curriculum that meets that need and that they go into some of our systems so that they stay here. That, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that extended answer. Regent Del Carlo. Uh, thank you, Chair Brooks. And this is Regent Del Carlo for the record. And this to uh, Acting Vice Chancellor uh, Charlton. Thank you for the presentation on um, dual enrollment. When I was a brand new region in 2017, I was absolutely blown away by the whole dual enrollment uh, uh, program. And I couldn't believe these young people, as young as 18, 19, well, probably 19, were not only getting an associate degree, but then getting their high school diploma like a week later. I mean, and then, you know, that's two more years to get you through your bachelor's quicker, go on to your career, two more years of earning. It just, it was just phenomenal. And I'm so glad that it looks like we've quad quintupled the program in the, in the amount of time we've had this, and we can do even more, I think, ever, even more. So with that said, one of the things our board has never had, although I have requested it, and maybe I have to do this again in um, uh, new business, but we have never had this board talk about mission differentiation, and it, we've really got to have it. And nowhere in your presentation, um, Patty, did you talk about who really should be offering this? And I, I and this is a hard, probably, conversation to have. My question, I'll just say it. How many other R1 universities out in the United States, or the 131 R1s, 
are also in the dual enrollment space. And I, I think that whole mission differentiation question pertains to item 10 that was um, pulled today too. But I, I just think we need to know that as a board. I mean, if this is just a common practice and how the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities see that, it would be nice to know because I, I know it when um, UNR, for example, was going into this space so heavily, you know, it was said, hey, won't this look better to have a uh, degree from a university rather than a community college? Well, my heart and soul is with our community colleges too. I love UNR because I'm an alum, but I just want to know if you have an answer for that. Yes, Regent Brooks for you to Thank Regent you. Del Carlo. And so Regent Del Carlo, yes, I, I, I have looked specifically, not nationally, but I have looked within our accrediting region, which is comprised of Alaska, Montana, Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and Oregon. And yes, there is space in all of those examples where, um, for example, that uh, it is really our universities, including our one, as well as uh, community colleges, state universities, um, state college com composites as well. And so um, looking across our region, uh, there is process in which all of them uh, have some level of participation. Montana is a little bit different because of the way that the Montana university system is, is basically uh, developed. And Alaska is actually where most of the community colleges, with the exception of one, are actually folded in within the universities. So yes, it is common within our uh, our accrediting region for all of the institutions, and there's typically the collaboration uh, similar to what we have here. Okay, thank you for that, and um, I I'm glad to hear what your answer because I think our this is really about students, but we still need to have at some point that conversation, and um, it's just such a wonderful opportunity for our students to advance quicker in life with uh, dual enrollment or concurrent enrollment. So thank you. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Regent Downs for the record. I had to step out uh, or uh, uh, we're leaving early here for a trip, but I wanted to stay online if I can. Um, I just want to say about dual enrollment, it's such an opportunity for so many students and I've worked with them for years and uh, it's it's pretty uh, rewarding. And when they realize that hey, this isn't high school stuff I'm doing anymore, this is college stuff, they they often will just jump into gear and um, push themselves even more. So I just want to say that I'm glad that that NG has made this an initiative and made this a such a part of our mission. Thank you. Regent Goodman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. I, you know, just as a marketing person, my question would be, uh, I think that uh, President Zaragoza and myself had an interesting conversation um, along with Lawrence Weekly about those students that just automatically opt out. So it's the kids that are in high school that say, um, college isn't for me. You know, maybe their parents say, we can't do it. Like, are we doing a um, specific awareness program? Like, even as a high school parent, sometimes I'm like, oh, what's going on? Like, I have no idea what my children are doing in school sometimes. But is there a way for us to make sure that we talk to those kids and we talk to those parents and say, hey, this is something that you can do that gets your 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 toe in the water and, and just makes them realize that that access is there. I just think that um, if there's something that we can do to really kind of uh, promote um, those students who say college isn't for me to go, yeah, actually it can be. Um, I think that would just be really a great initiative for us to look into and and just try harder to to talk to those uh, those kids. They are kids; they're in high school, so to talk to them and and uh, see if they can uh, see that this is an opportunity. Thank you, Chairman Brooks. Yes, Regent Tarkanian. I was fortunate enough to be on the school board at about the same time uh, Regent Brager was. And I just want to say that at that time, one of the very first schools that became involved in the dual enrollment was Clark High School. 
And um, they worked very closely with the faculty at UNLV. They worked closely with other teachers at Clark High School. And I cannot tell you the success, I mean, I couldn't tell you well enough the success they had. We often have students that don't have, uh, and I've worked with many students who needed extra help, but there are so many students that go much further beyond what we offer in our high schools. And this gave an incentive to go to the college and to take courses there as dual courses and then go there for their own degree. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is when we started, there was no extra pay for anybody. There was no way of transportation because, you know, lots of our students had to go to the university class itself. And to see how much has come along since then is heartwarming. I just want to tell you that for any of you, uh, UNLV, UNR, it's, I've been able to work with the teachers involved, with the students and parents involved, and it's just been in a magnificent program. The only concern I have right now is I have a granddaughter who is attending a college in Spain. <clears throat> and I had a grandson who graduated with a master's in London. And every time any of my grandchildren go to uh, other countries, I ask them, how it was in comparison to what we had here. And they all tell me it's not as hard here as it was there. In other words, they had further to reach. And we have to, again, as I say, I've helped those who had special needs, but we have to have for all children, the ability to reach their full potential. And sometimes that full potential was at the other end of the line. And this was a start in it, and I just want everybody to know, I actually saw it, I worked with the teachers and UNLV, and it was magnificent. So just to let you know, from an old lady, Susan. Regent Carvalho. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this presentation, Patty. I appreciate it. Um, I do have a few different areas that I'd like to comment on. Um, first, um, the the pie chart that you showed um, on, on page 10 of the presentation that I think Regent Boylan um, referenced earlier. I do think it might be helpful for us to also understand it, um, kind of a comparator with what the students that we are serving through dual enrollment. I'd like to see compared to the total demographic of students in high school within the state. So we get a better picture of, of how well we are serving our students. Um, because while we're doing really well with our Hispanic students, um, our, our black students I'm, I'm concerned about. And I wanna make sure that, that we have um, equity and access for them as, as well. Um, which brings me to my second point. Um, on, on page five, it mentions that NC may establish, establish performance testing, performance or testing standards to determine readiness. My, my daughter was um, a high school student here uh, now almost four years ago um, or, or longer. Anyway, um, she took some um, concurrent uh, enrollment classes. And one of the things the barriers, I would say, for, for students at the time. Now, some of these things may have changed since then. Um, what, one was uh, paying for, for the class. Now, I felt that at least at her school, there were many, many resources for, for students who, who had struggles with, with paying for it. And so I agree with you that, that um, the school districts and our presidents work hard to make sure that that is not a barrier to overcome. But one thing that I did feel was, was a barrier, and, and Regent Breger, you brought this up too about being prepared for that. Um, they, the students were told that they had to go to, this was a CSN um, class, that they had to go to CSN to take a reading class, uh, not reading class, a reading test to be sure that they were, they were ready for that. Now, Again, not a problem for my daughter necessarily. CSN was right down the street from where we lived. But for other students, that, that may 
that may be a stop out, a hard stop right there. And so I don't know if there are, um, if any of that has changed, but for while I think it's wonderful for high school students to be on our institutional campuses, it that could be that could just be the stop right there for many students who who already have a question whether they can do this or not. Um, so I did bring that up to um, Superintendent Ebert when she um, was before this body a few years ago, but and I don't know if anything has changed with that, but I do feel that that is is a barrier. Um, and then also speaking of equity and access, um, with regard to what um, Regent Del Carlo mentioned um, with mission differentiation, I, I, I commend UNR for what you have done to come into this space. I think, I think what, how you've gone about it is, um, you know, it's, it's full bore. I mean, you, you really put a lot of attention and, 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 um, and people at the forefront to make sure that, that, that you did it right. And I appreciate that. I do wonder, so for students who are taking a, um, a concurrent or dual enrollment class from one of our R1 universities, what happens if after they graduate from high school, are they, if, if they are not able to um, reach the GPA level um, to, to get into those, to our R1 universities or four-year institutions um, here in the state, are there, what do we do for those students? Um, so if, if a student's taking, taking this, a class or a program, um, and they don't have the GPA, how, do you, do you work with them? How does, how does that, what does that look like? So at the high school level, maybe they've done well, but I just want to make sure that, that again, equity and access is, is top of mind for everybody and, and not saying that it's not, but what, what, um, services, wraparound services and supports do we give to those students who who tried it and maybe they did do well in that, but overall, I, I don't know, maybe this is a very small subset of students as well, but, but again, I, I wonder if in the past we've heard that dual enrollment has been really the, um, the work of mostly community colleges. And it's very interesting that you say, Patty, that, that you're seeing that, that four-year institutions are, are, are a part of this now. And I think we need to hear some more about that. Um, but how, how do we support those students um, who, are, who might be in this situation? So that's a very long-winded, repetitive uh, question. So sure. apologies. So, so Chair Brooks, through you to Regent Carvalho. So first, we will definitely get you that comparative de demographic data that's reflected on the pie chart on page 10. Uh, we do have that information statewide for our, uh, our districts of what their student population looks like. And so I'll work with the IR officers uh, to, in the system to see if we can also disaggregate that uh, as well. Um, in regards to the readiness assessment that you had mentioned regarding CSN, perhaps President Zaragoza can answer that question regarding how students are assessed. I know things have changed a little bit since that COVID timeframe as far as placement, but uh, perhaps President Zaragoza can answer that question. Yeah, a, a couple of uh, comments before I answer that question. And, and I just want to go back and, and make a couple of observations to the data that you're seeing. Uh, so the statement was made, uh, and I just want to make sure that I'm real clear uh, that we're doing okay with a group of of students, in this particular case, uh, Hispanic students, uh, I, I want to emphasize that that's not what the data is showing. It's showing that you have more Hispanic students, uh, but proportionately, that's because you have so many more in the pipeline. So you've got about 50% of the students that are in the uh, CCSD system are Hispanic. What the data really shows, and this is, a, in fact, uh, uh, th there are currently uh, a podcast going on by, by the U.S. Department of Education on dual enrollment and I think it's important to understand that they, they, they're they finding exactly uh, what this board I have just mentioned, and that is that, that we're going after the same students. We're going after college uh, level students, college ready students. Uh, and that that's not just uh, here in Southern Nevada uh, or in Nevada. I mean, that, that's a national trend in part because they are dual credit programs. So you have to go after students that can handle that, that, that work. And that's why you have as part of the process kind of this assessment. And so it's not always testing, but it's assessing 
that the individual can do that work because you want to set up the student to succeed. Uh, but there's more to that question too uh, because of the, the findings at the national level is that historically underutilized uh, uh, populations are the ones that are not getting into these systems and that includes the thousands of non-college ready students that are in the system. Uh, and then the, the issues that are emerging now is, should we be doing more of that kind of remedial work in partnership to dual enrollment? Uh, and, and I'm glad we're having this conversation uh, because I know that, that, that we've made some progress uh, uh, in this space, but I would argue that we're actually falling behind nationally in terms of this space, uh, uh, because a actually 88% of high schools already offer uh, dual enrollment. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example of, of, of what kind of the, co the, the competition looks like. In Indiana, 39% uh, of, of their students in 2012 uh, were in dual enrollment programs. In 2018, it was 60%. So you see kind of the, the, the movement in those spaces. But many of these uh, uh, states have a comprehensive framework, uh, a, a statewide policy framework for what they want to do with dual enrollment. So they have targets in terms of, uh, you know, how many uh, uh, should we have? What should be the characteristics? How are we dealing with the equity questions? Those gaps uh, have not been addressed here in the state of Nevada. You know, I, I, I would also kind of, uh, uh, going back to the issue of, of, of mission differential, in, differentiation, uh, you know, I think that that's part of the, uh, uh, of the conversation, uh, but there's also, and, and you've heard me say this before, the, there's also an important element and that is having a level field. Uh, and and uh, I don't think that community colleges have a level field. So I'll give you an example that thousand dollars, you know, that, that was mentioned as up to. Well, I can assure you that community colleges uh, have a, a very limited budget in terms of what we can pay. So we pay our, 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 our um, stipends uh, at the lower quadrant of you. Well, I think that's true uh, for community colleges. So when you're in this lazy, fair environment uh, and you're able to pay the $1,000 stipend, you're going to get a lot more of those high schools that, that, to go in that regard. Uh, and, and we're not having these conversations uh, to address how do we develop truly a system uh, statewide that benefits the students that we're trying to serve uniformly. One other element that I'll, that I'll mention, and that's the issue of access and tuition. That's real. That's a very real thing. It is a barrier for many students. Many other states have, in fact, uh, uh, established tuition-free systems, uh, uh, and it varies uh, from state to state. But those are the conversations, I think, that we need to have. Otherwise, we're going to have what we've got now. We're all going to be going after the same students in the same schools. Okay, thank you. And I don't know if President Sandoval wanted to respond to your question regarding um, the uh, students that perhaps don't have the GPA to admit to gain admittance to UNR. Uh, Mr. Chair, to you and through you to uh, Regent Carvalho, and thank you for the question. I really love this conversation. I, I suppose I have a, a couple comments similar to President Zaragoza in terms of, of background. And first and foremost, in my former job, um, my concern was college attainment. And we, being the state of Nevada, were worst in the country in college, in, in college attainment. In fact, I think a slide that was presented to this board a few months ago, and perhaps it was by um, Vice Chancellor Abba, showed us still in that position. And that I think, in fact, um, the only um, other territory or state that um, we were ahead of was Guam. <laughs> And so, you know, we're, um, Vice Chancellor um, Patty uh, Charlton started with was the state law. And, you know, it, I guess this is kind of awkward, but it's the truth is that um, the current acting chancellor was working in my office when I was governor, and we were seeking to develop ways to broaden that pipeline to provide exactly what we've talked about is more opportunity for high school students to have to have access to dual credit and when you read the state law it specifically says community colleges colleges and universities <laughs> and that was purposeful 
to to re because before that it was the community colleges that were providing that. And I think when you dig in the numbers, and I I will have to phone a friend in terms of um, Clark County School District um, to to ask them to you know provide some more background. But um, there are thousands of students that did not have access um, to dual credit programs. And I think perhaps that is part of what the genesis of our getting engaged in this area, particularly in Clark County, was a, was a contact from the Clark County School District to ask the University of Nevada, Reno, if it would consider getting into that space and starting to pilot programs in Clark County. Those two programs were at Centennial um, High School as well as um, Cheyenne High Schools. And we did as they asked, and they have turned out to be extremely successful. And because of that, that's why you've seen the expansion, because other schools um, have wanted similar programs. Um, to go to uh, Regent Brager, and again, I um, would, would ask the Clark County School District to put a little bit more meat on the bone for me, but um, they have access to federal grants that pay for the tuition. And so that's where the money comes from here in, in Clark County. So that has been extremely beneficial for access. And as you saw in the presentation today, the amount is fixed at $75 for that class. And so whether we're providing that class or any other institution, that is the same amount. Now we have chosen to use every penny to, to be able to properly compensate those teachers. Obviously teacher pay has been a, an issue um, throughout the state and their time is valuable. And so we felt it was appropriate to use that, seven, you know, the money that comes from that $75 to, to pay the maximum amount that we can. We also provide them um, a $500 stipend, as was mentioned, or previously it was 1000 but um, the institutions, um, I guess, came to an agreement or a resolution to reduce that to 500 because... Not only do they teach the class, they, they spend, they being the teacher, spend a lot of time working with our faculty. And our faculty works with those um, faculty members at the high schools on a weekly basis and go through every, every student, course mapping, syllabus. Um, what's, um, there is no difference in what is being um, provided or taught in that classroom, say at Centennial High School, than what is at the University of Nevada, Reno. Now we've just completed assessments and um, we have Vice Provost Dave Shintani who's here today who can answer your question with regard to um, those students that, you, that you've talked about. But what we're fi finding, at least in our first assessments, is that the students at the high schools are performing as well and in some cases better than the students that are on our campus. And I think that's part of the, the essence and the beauty of this is that these students are being exposed to college level work and will be even more prepared. I mean, they, you know, we, we all know the North Star for, for this board, which is access, success, close the achievement gap and workforce. And these courses go straight to that. We've also been, you know, at, at the invitation of the Clark County um, School District, been very intentional go, to go into the title schools. And so the super majority of the schools that the University of Nevada Reno is involved in are the title schools. And um, it has provided these dual credit classes, the students that wouldn't otherwise have um, access to those classes. But again, I'm kind of speaking on a hearsay basis. We have, you know, this more is here and can speak, you know, much more in a much more detailed manner. And then, as I said, I have Vice Provost um, Shintani, who is here, who it's his job on our campus to work closely with the Clark County School District, with the principals at each of the high schools, and with the instructors in, in the high schools as well. And again, we have um, assessments that are literally hot off the press, less than a week old, that um, we are going through right now, student by student, high school by high school. Thank you. Uh, Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford for the record. I think we all can agree that dual enrollment is the access um, piece that we're missing. 
Um, there are a couple of recommendations that I have after talking. I've been working on this for, for quite a bit, and I was talking to Gia, and I was like, I feel like we're just on the edge of greatness if we put some structures into place. And she said, I say that every day. So I want to thank Gia. I don't know if you guys know. It's her vac she's on vacation today, and she's here. Um, so um, I've been working on this quite a bit. I just, um, we just had AB 428 pass, which is uh, a concurrent enrollment bill. Um, it's going to start in the Clark County School District. Right now, we service about 14,000 students in the state of Nevada um, for dual enrollment, and we have approximately 145,000 high school students in the state of Nevada. So to put that in perspective, we service 10% of our students, okay? And so um, equity and access research is like my nerdy jam. And um, part of creating AB 428, which is a teacher pipeline equity concurrent enrollment bill. This is the this is the tip of the iceberg. It's going to expand to multiple concurrent enrollments. Why did we start with teaching and learning? Because everyone in high school, a high, every high school teacher, is also has a master's in teaching and learning, so they can teach those classes easily. Does that make sense? Okay. So, pretty soon, we will have an opportunity for every student in the state of Nevada to be offered this program of concurrent enrollment where they are in their high school and they get classes taught by their teacher. Yesterday, someone asked me, how are zone variances working at your school, you know, now that there's low enrollment? I said, that's not something that it will ever affect me because my families don't have vehicles at my school. So zone variances and charter schools and other things don't really matter to my family because they don't have the means to transport themselves, right? And so thinking about that piece, we need to bring the programs to the school. I think we all agree on that, right? We've been talking about that over and over again. So I'm framing right now, when we go from offering and providing for 10% of our students to what we want, what, what, do we, what do we want? We want 100%, right? If we multiply what we're doing right now by 10, we are not prepared. But as a board, we can make decisions and we can make policy so we are prepared. So I would like to suggest, and I don't know if this is gonna be on new business, three things. Number one, there's a National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment um, Conference. Regent Cruz Crawford? Yeah. I just wanted to interject. Um, it, all of those, I'm sure, are going to be wonderful, uh, and they would be perfectly placed in new business. Okay. Thank you. So that was just like the beginning of the story, storytelling there, so you have it ready. Um, hold on. Let me see if I had anything that's not new business. Oh, no, this all says new business with the three things oh, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> I get really excited about this. But I do want to thank um, the committee on the recommendations. There were three um, big issues we had, which were similar fees and instructor qualifications and the instructor stipends. And the fact that those were addressed, those removed three of the biggest barriers we already had. So I want to thank the committee for working, working through that. Regent Brown. Uh, thank you, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, I have a few questions, so I'm happy to run through them, and then we can go back through them one at a time if that's easiest for you, um, Acting Vice Chancellor Charlton. Um, okay, so I'm really glad to hear that we have set Tuition prices, faculty requirements, and compensation rates, having a standard is important. Um, so I'm happy to see that, you know, we're putting that language forward. However, um, I don't think that uh, Regent Carvalho's question about student eligibility was really answered. Um, and it's something that I've highlighted uh, a couple times. So 
my first question is student eligibility, and it's a two-parter. Um, what is the eligibility, eligibility um, for a student to actually sign up for a dual enrollment class? And then if they're signed up for dual enrollment, they do really well, but they graduate with a GPA that is lower than the admitted GPA needed to get into one of our higher ed institutions. What is the, um, how are we helping those students take the next step? Um, my second uh, part to this is like, I would like to have a follow-up mapped out conversation about what speci specialities, what regions, how do we actually divide the state up so it makes the most sense for our students? Um, how do our, and then one thing I wish that this presentation would have covered is how do our institutions actually sign up schools? Um, and then as a system, have we prioritized certain classes and topics that we want to make sure that our students are taking through the dual enrollment? Um, and then back to Regent Goodman's question, we do need to do a better job at marketing and whose budget pays for that. Will that need to be an ENCHI budget? Will that need to be each institution's as they're signing up schools? Are they using their budget for that? Um, and then the last thing I will say, and then we can backtrack, is I do think going back to ma mapping out specialities, regions, um, dividing up the system so we can work together as a system, systeminess, if you will, um, I, I do think we have to have that conversation about mission differentiation, and I don't use that lightly, and I don't throw that out as just a trigger word. I do feel like there are ways for every institution in the state to fill the gaps, because like Regent Cruz Crawford said, at the end of the day, we are still only serving less than 10% of our students, which means that we have 90% that need our attention if we can make it work. Um, and I think as a system approach, we could probably make that happen. So, um, yes, that's a lot. I know. Happy to backtrack one piece at a time. So, Regent Brooks, through you to Regent Brown. So, several points on that. And I, and I do believe that we're going to, I think this is, as you said, just the tip of the iceberg as our conversations will develop over time, um, specifically on how a student is made aware, either in their high school or those that may go to uh, perhaps one of our community colleges that actually have an early college, in some case, um, within their campus. Uh, so we'll need to reach out to our various districts. While we have a representative from CCSD, would uh, only be appropriate to reach out to Washoe as well as all of our other districts to find out how they uh, make these opportunities available to students, so that's definitely going to have to be um, a bring back item, and that would also include marketing, um, as Regent Goodman had mentioned. Uh, in regards to uh, the resources and how that would be funded, we can certainly have that conversation as well uh, between the institutions as well as the system office as a whole. We know that awareness is one of the, the biggest keys in making sure that students um, have this access, and that's one thing that we all know is, is absolutely a priority. Um, the other item that you brought back is regarding how we divide up the state. I think that is also another takeaway that's going to have to come back to this body and what that looks like. As far as the eligible courses, there is a list that is developed, I think, with each of the, the districts. And we do have a list of all the courses that each institution offers um, in this space. And so we can bring that back as information. It's updated annually. And in fact, I think we're about to do it in the fall semester. Uh, coming up, as well as the list of the schools. In fact, we'll probably be doing that more than just annually in the future to keep this board apprised of all the developments. Um, I would actually like to perhaps defer again to uh, both of our presidents um, regarding if the GPA is not adequate in order for a student to gain admittance to their universities if they've taken a dual enrollment course already with them, what that looks like for them and how we get them to that that actual next goal. And so I'd ask uh, President Whitfield and President Sandoval on that specific item related to what we do when a student has a dual enrollment course that they've done or concurrent enrollment, and yet they may not be able to gain access for admittance purposes. Thank you. Uh, so for the record, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV, um, there's, there's at least a few different uh, paths for students to go. 
um, let's open this up and think about it. One of the things that we're trying to do is to get kids college ready and college oriented. And so it's the idea of just thinking about going to college. And so going to a four-year college, um, if, if they started in their senior year and kind of got excited about things, they may not have the background, they may not have the grades. And that's part of the reason why our system is important as a system, because let's just talk about for GPA, they can start at the community college. And um, I've even had conversations with students where that's what I will encourage them to do. And in part, it's because that um, that first piece of dual enrollment helps to, uh, for many students, to be able to um, support and uplift them in terms of their confidence about doing college level courses. And I think that's one of the things that our, our community college colleagues do as well, is to be able to support that and continue that. And then if um, in the pathway that they're seeking, they need a four-year degree, uh, they then become better prepared to be able to uh, address the issues that, and challenges that they'll have at a four-year degree, a four-year college. Um, the other uh, pathway that comes to mind instantly for me is the idea that um, we did a little bit of it before, but actually one of the things the pandemic did for us is to create alternative ways to do admissions because there was a point in time during the pandemic where you couldn't take your SAT scores. And so how did you bring kids in? Because they weren't doing testing in groups and, and whatever. And so um, we set up those procedures and those still exist. And so there are other pathways for students to be able to get into those four-year colleges if that's what they're interested in through alternative measures. And believe it or not, I used to actually do admissions a long, long time ago. Well, I always try to tell people I wasn't always a college president, um, but I can't give you the details of how we actually do that, but it's a process where you look at other characteristics other than just test scores. And you look at other things other than just um, degree requirements, um, or excuse me, in terms of grades. Um, you look at uh, personal statements that's made. You, you get other information from people that write them letters of references. There's other ways in which you can actually get into that four-year college. Um, I'll, I'll conclude and, and uh, uh, see if uh, President Sandoval has anything to ask. Um, the only thing that we ever worry about is that we worry about student success. And we do not want to set students up for failures. So it's part of the reason if you take a step back and think, well, what, what is GPA for? GPA is just one indicator of a student's possible success. And so we take that seriously. We don't want to just ignore that, but at the same time, we don't want to make it the only thing. So we, we do have these other ways in which students can ultimately end up at a four-year school and get a four-year degree. Thank you. Federico Zaragoza, for the record, College of Nevada, I just wanted to clarify that at CSN, we accept all students that are endorsed by the high school. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno. Not much different than President Whitfield had to, to chat about, but to be specific to, to Regent Carvalho's questions. First, um, A, if a student has a, a GPA that's less than the level for admissions for the, for the university, if they've demonstrated that they can successfully complete college work doing a dual credit class on a um, high school campus, certainly that's going to be very relevant in terms of their ability to be admitted to the university. And we do, similar to what President Whitfield talked about, have a special admissions process. But another thing that, that is key for, for example, English 101, we, we provide those not only in a 15-week format, but in a 30-week format. And so there are some students that can't, comp you know, it, it's a challenge for them. And so it's, we want them to be successful, just like President Whitfield said. But, by doing the, the class over 30 weeks, then that gives them more time to, again, complete the exact same coursework, but over a longer period of time. And we're finding a lot of success with that. Um, with regard to your admission, uh, the question on the admission standards, again, I'd, I'd defer, we have a subject matter expert here, um, Gia Moore, who can respond specifically to that question, if I can defer to you, Ms. Moore. Excuse me, I'm not used to. Uh, good afternoon, Board of Regents. Gia Moore, for the record. Um, in terms of our admission standards, again, um, going back to what I had mentioned earlier, our target group are students that are typically underrepresented that would not otherwise have an opportunity to be part of these programs. And we look at multiple um, elements of data. We look at PSAT data, we look at MAP data, we look at teacher recommendations. 
Um, we look at their goals and have conversations with them about what their long-term goals are. Um, and those are very much in alignment and collaboration with our, our partners in this work as well, in terms of how we identify what those, um, those admissions requirements are. But in terms of our, our efforts that we've made in the last couple of years, we've grown dual enrollment by over 2,100%. That means that we have been missing a large group of students that would have not otherwise had the opportunity. And I say this with all due respect because I haven't been part of your prior conversations. I hear things like mission and division of duties in the state. Um, our effort should be very much unified. We have 97,000 students that are enrolled in the Clark County School District in grades nine through 12. We know that less than 50% of those students will go on to college. Those are thousands of students that don't have time to wait for us to make decisions about moving forward and getting those opportunities. So again, I say that um, with some urgency and with the utmost respect, um, but when we have conversations about pulling back on things that are helping us grow these efforts, I get very concerned. I get especially concerned when I haven't been before this board and we're talking about stipends and those kinds of things. I think the question should have been, what are those teachers doing in order to earn those dollars that are strengthening the programs, ensuring rigor, um, and spending those hours and hours extra a week required as being a partner of our particular institutions. So I say this in that our goals are clear with the Clark County School District. Our goal is to increase access. Our schools make a decision on who they're going to partner with. We've had schools that do not have partners for, for decades, have not had st strong partners in this work. And so we're making sure that that no longer is a barrier so I think collectively we can all work together and I think we can agree that we have some, a lot of work to do as a state in making sure that all of our students have access to college and career opportunities. And um, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mart. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Chair, I'd like a quick follow-up. Sure, go ahead, Regent Brown. Um, so I, I do just wanna quickly um, respect respectfully disagree with Ms. Moore. I think it is important that we understand that our higher ed institutions do have different purposes within our community. CCSD has a purpose to graduate their students and each of our institutions do have a different mission. And I think what our, I know I'll speak for myself, not my colleagues, but I do think it is important that we define what success looks like in dual enrollment for each of our institutions. I'm not suggesting that any one of our seven academic institutions should not play a part in dual enrollment. I wanna make that very clear. But I do want to make sure that we have this conversation, which I've been a regent for only seven months, so I can only speak to seven months of history. We have not had this conversation. And I do think it is an important one. Um, and that's why I'm happy that we have uh, acting chancellor, acting vice chancellor Charlton on staff right now, because I think she is the right person to lead this conversation. Um, going back to our two R1 presidents, I am happy to hear that there is special admission process for students who maybe don't have a 3.0 GPA. This is actually the first time I've heard that. Um, and I've read a lot of uh, paperwork. So this is this is a good, that's a positive thing. Um, but I would like to know the acceptance rate um, for students uh, in dual enrollment into your higher ed institute, into the R, into our R1 institutions, specifically the ones that fall in the special admission process. And I only ask that as a, as a reference and guiding point so we can help um, map out what the future looks like. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Brooks. I learned that mine's probably new business too. It will add to this conversation, but I will save it for new business. Thank you. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Regent Downs for the record. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, I mean, I, I heard it mentioned that we're only serving 10% of the population, but when the student enrolls, they develop a transcript. So we want to make sure when they enroll, if it's in high school, that they're not going to set themselves up to carry forward something that works against them. Uh, so we need to make sure that they're ready for it. Um, so it's not always 
that we're going to get to 100% of the students in the system, in the high school system. So um, it's just my my perspective there. Thank you. Regent Borland. Thank you, Chair Brooks. My question uh, and concern is for the young lady who's sitting there, who was just speaking. Sorry, I've lost your name. Come forward, huh? Gia. Gia Moore. Oh, oh nice. Okay. Uh, my concern is how are we graduating these students from high school if they need seven to 15 weeks of English 101? I think we're missing the elephant in the room because it's such a politically sensitive topic. Students are just graduated, passed through high school and get into college, but you can't speak English or do English or math or do something. How is that happening? I think that is a bigger concern to me than how we all work together. Ms. Moore, can you come forward? Thank you. Uh, is there General, any suggestion to that? Regent Boylan? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, pardon the interruption. Associate General Counsel Linda King, I believe that that question might be outside of the scope of this information item, and I'd ask that you, if you seek that information, to state it in new business. And it, oh, okay. Uh, okay, it's, it's about uh, dual uh, enrollment is why I'm asking that question. So if they're in dual en enrollment, but they have to have extra classes, that is why it's connected to this topic that it's all about dual uh, enrollment. Yes, no, I think it is. Then per perhaps um, Vice Chancellor Charlton could clarify for you the nexus. Ms. Yes. Charlton, would you please, because it's part of dual enrollment yeah. is why I asked. So Chair Brooks, for you, you Regent Boyne. Um, so first, I think your question is, how do we have students that are graduating from high school that may not have English English readiness or be able to to, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're participating in a dual enrollment at that level. So uh, again, we're at 10%. We know that the goal is to continue to increase for those students that can be successful and that are ready as well. And so um, we can certainly have additional conversations. Um, and I know that our presidents all have those conversations across their institutions about students being ready for college when they get there. And, and I think some of the work that this body has also done, for example, on co-rec, uh, English and math to ensure that students are, um, and I think there's a president that uses the term, not just college ready, but college proven. And so the dual and concurrent enrollment is a way that students can dip their toes in. And it's a little less intimidating, I think, when they're doing it when they're in high school so that they can make sure that they're in the right pathway. Not everyone's gonna go on to um, a four-year institution or we'd love for everyone to get a graduate degree as well. Um, some are very, very successful in our career and technical education, which is also a factor where they're taking those classes within high school. They're also taking a state, uh, statewide approved or a state level approved credential or an assessment and they get a, a certificate or whatever that credential might be for a specific field of study. So maybe it's welding. Maybe it is automotive. And so we have a lot of great examples. And so we really want to find the right fit for every, every kid, every adult that's coming to us. And so um, I think the question is, you know, not every student, and I think the ones that you uh, were referencing that may have some barriers, um, there's always work that needs to be done at that level. And I think our colleges also give great um, support services, perhaps through some of the non-credit programs to get those students ready. Because we also know that, not everyone in our community has a high school equivalency or a high school diploma. So we want to, as our role in ENCHI is to serve all of them. Thank you, ma'am. That's a great answer, but it really doesn't answer my question that I had because that is the elephant in the room. You know, our high school, our education is the lowest in the country, like 48th of, you know, and I want to address that. So we are not getting to this dual enrollment uh, question of why are people even in that if they don't pass certain classes and have to go through 7, 15 weeks of whichever class, it doesn't matter, underwater basket weaving, I, I don't care. But th that's where the problem is, that we are graduating students who are not ready for dual enrollment 
or for actual enrollment into college. And yes, I think they should uh, go for other vocational studies and all. I get that. Yeah. But the whole idea is to bring people forward that should be ready. Correct. So your question was awesome, but it didn't help me. <laughs> no, Thank I appreciate so that in uh, chair books for you to Regent Boylan. I think um, a great opportunity, and I think it's one that Regent Cruz Crawford mentioned, is also this interim study. Um, under AB 428, which also is going to be looking at uh, the professional standards in education. And so it is a very, very lofty bill. There's a lot of pages to that bill, but there's a lot of work that's being done. And many of our institutions, particularly our universities, the state college as well, or I'm sorry, the state university and GBC are also participating through that process. And so there's a lot of great work in partnership with the Nevada Department of Education um, to improve our educational environment from early, early childhood education all the way through post-secondary. So I think we have great opportunities, and this is going to be an important part for us to keep a focus on as we prepare for the 2025 legislative session and what your budget ask will be to shore up this space. Probably also not on the agenda, sorry. All right, thank you, ma'am. That's why my question mainly was for the young lady, Gia Moore. But Vice Chair Arascata. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Uh, I have a few questions, and I'm going to be starting from the top. So on page 17 of the, of the slides, there was a additional information about instructor stipends. How does the compensation for the teachers work for instructions? <laughs> Regent Brooks, through you to Regent Arascata. Uh, Regent Arascata, can you clarify what is the compensation? I'm sorry, I didn't understand for instructions or? The, the compensation for the teachers while in the high schools, how does it work for the instructors? So how does the compensation balance out? So I know President Zogosa articulated that not all of the faculty members are being compensated per instructor. Mm -hmm. Uh, the certain yes. dollar amount, not to exceed a do uh, certain dollar amount of five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. How is the compensation for teachers working? So, d is there a is there leeway in which each teacher is compensated by their level of education, by their level of competencies, by their level of, of experience? Yeah, understood. Thank you so much and apologize for the request for clarification. I would ask that uh, perhaps each of the institutions can address that question specifically. Uh, we set a cap for the course of not more than $1,000 and I think as mentioned is that there may not be that wiggle room for each of the institutions. Whether or not they differentiate between the education or experience by the, by the instructor, uh, the institutions would have to answer that, so I'm not sure which order you would like to start with. Let's go down that road another day, because going with each one right now is not going to be um, suitable for the time allotted in this okay. presentation. Let's go down. Um, there was some information or some conversation about the Clark County School District and, and their availability to scale dual credit offerings. So with that, did does Clark County reach out to the campuses of which campus they would like to utilize for their districts? Because I think it was Regent Brown brought up the fact that there are a lot of students available for or in Clark County that have the opportunity for dual credit. Does Clark County School District reach out to the campuses, regardless if it's CSN, UNLV, you or even UNR? Uh, certainly, I would probably have to defer to if we're going to use uh, Clark County School District as an example. Um, ask uh, GMR to to come to the record to respond to that. However, you do have within your um, handbook provision that if an institution. Um, I'll give UNLV as an example of they're within a high school and another institution wants to engage with that institution. There's supposed to be a conversation between the president and the academic officer in advance. And so I'll ask uh, GMOR how they make arrangements to work with institutions. Good 
Good afternoon, Board of Regents, GMO for the record. Um, we work collaboratively on a regular basis with all of our NG partners. So um, weekly, bi-weekly, we are meeting with CSM, with UNLV, with UNR, with NSC. We're, we're working diligently to create plans about how we um, engage with our schools. Um, we have a strategic plan for every school, for every partner. And then um, we work specifically with the high schools to determine what goals, what deficits they have, and then work with them on what their options are on what would be the best partner from, for them. And in many cases, we have multiple partners at school. So it depends on what the track is that the student's going through. Um, if they are going through a career and technical education track, that might be one specific partner. If they're going through um, another track, that might be another partner. While that doesn't happen that often, we do have situations where we do have multiple partners at a school, but um, ultimately it's driven by the school and then through our ongoing collaboration um, that we have with our partnering institutions. Ms. Moore, you just spearheaded a uh, question. Then why did Clark County School District choose to partner with UNR? Uh, we're seven, seven hour away drive or an hour, 15 minute flight. Was there a concrete reasoning or evidence why Clark County reached out to UNR? Clark um, County School District, excuse me. Uh, yes, sir. So we have, as I mentioned before, 97,000 students that are enrolled in our high schools. Mm -hmm. um, and each of our institutions, um, we, have, we have strong relationships with. I think we're talking about the sheer volume of students that need access to these programs, which is why we've expanded our partnerships um, to make sure that our, we, we know our students can't wait for these opportunities. So we are partnering um, in ways in which we can expand those opportunities. And again, we have robust partnerships with all of our NG partners. Um, we have great relationships with them. I think it's just a matter of increasing the access for our students. Excellent. Is the rigor of the UNR coursework and UNLV and CSN, since I see President Zaragoza, is it is it is the coursework sufficient? Is the requirement sufficient? So Chair Brooks, but, for you to Regent Arascada. So first, um, Regent Arascada, one of the, the basic tenets of a dual and concurrent enrollment for credit to be granted and for that to also be transferable in many cases is absolutely that the rigor is required and it's got to be a like for like course and that's established also within the um, parameters of our accreditation as well. So English is English, yeah. math is math, history is history. And uh, Ms. Charlton or even Ms. Moore, I think when you all touched upon uh, the partnership is different with each campus, but how is the partnership with UNR different from the work at the other NC schools? with the R1 being right there at UNLV? Or is it just the sheer mass? I, I don't want to answer for, for Gia Moore. Um, I believe she indicated that it was just the sheer capacity and access, but I will ask her to come to the, to the podium. Um, good afternoon again, Gia Moore for the record. Um, again, we, we have a large volume of students that need access and each student has individual needs. Each campus has individual needs. And so um, we are looking to expand those options um, as, as fast as we can, because again, our students cannot wait. Um, so th again, those partnerships uh, come out of a strategic conversation with those schools. Um, our superintendent works directly with our, our NG partners. Um, we talk about common goals and what, what we need to do for our students. And I, I think that, that that's the clear mission for us is access to our students to ensure that we have more than 43% of our students going on to um, college. Great, so Ms. Moore, just, and I'm just gonna speak that it sounds like fairly concrete evidence that having the University of Nevada Reno there with the Clark County School District has increased access for Clark County School District students for college level courses, especially at another tier one institute, just as a fine as an institute as UNLV with UNR. Is that a fair statement? 
Um, sir, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, is it safe to say that UNR has increased access for Clark, Clown for Clark County School District students to have access to college level courses? Yes. With UNR being down in Clark County. We've increased access for our students with all of our in institutions. Um, you know, again, I, I think UNR is where we, we have a, a lot of growth in that area. We've expanded our options um, pretty significantly, but we, we have expanded efforts with all of our partners. Excellent. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. Regent Goodman. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Gia, thank you for being here. 2100% increase is significant, amazing, incredible. Thank you for all your hard work. And, um, you know, our school district gets a bad rap, but there's so many wonderful people out there like you that are just doing this great work. And I just wanted to say thank you. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Chair. And I'm sure uh, Ms. Charlton can answer this one. So did I get it right along the way that uh, teachers in schools who are doing or teaching uh, college level classes, they get paid more to do that? Yes, it's someone. in addition to their compensation. Yes, so they Correct. get paid more, right? Yes. So by the same token, do teachers, instructors, faculty in college get paid more because they've got students who are, uh, you know, uh, what's the term right now? I just forgot it. Dual enroll, uh, enrolled students. No, our compensation no. for faculty um, is guided by the handbook okay. and the procedures and guidelines manual. Um, it's basically right. driven off of a workload. Yeah. No, I was totally sure of that, but I just wanted to yeah. confirm it. That's correct. So that's really nice that in high school they're paid extra, but in university level they're not. Correct. That's very nice. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, with all. Sorry. Go ahead. We do pay our faculty for their time for when they consult with the high school faculty that's teaching the dual credit course because they are the instructor of record for these classes and they meet with these high school instructors. That's why that other $500 compensation is because not only do they teach the class at the high school level, the high school faculty, but they also spend an extensive amount of time with our faculty to ensure what you've all talked about, that the rigor is the same, whether you're in a seat here in Clark County or whether you're in a seat on any other college campus. And that also, that obviously, requires our faculty to incur more time. So it's similar to an overload. They're spending more time, and so they are compensated for that time. So, President uh, Sandoval, you're saying that they are paid then? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. That's what I was asking. Yeah, I, I apologize. For I must have no. asked. Oh, no, that's okay. I, I appreciate the correction, and the other presidents may want to correct if they also are providing any additional compensation for any advisory capacity for their existing faculty. Oh, okay. okay, that's great. That's all I needed. Thank you so much. I think I was just looking at the list. We've got about uh, an additional five regents who would like to ask some questions. I'm, uh, listen, we appreciate your time. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. It feels better to stand up anyway <laughs> yeah. right now. So <laughs> I, I, I get that. We really do appreciate all of the information that you provided. Obviously, um, these are conversations that are going to continue. Um, I'm sure by now you can see the level of important, importance that regents are placing on dual enrollment and what the conversations could or should look like and how this shapes um, the relationships between the institutions and the communities. Absolutely. Um, and so thank you. Um, I appreciate Keep that you're leading going. the effort. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We'll now move into uh, item or agenda item oh, number two. 12. Um, this will be for suggested new business. And, you know, just as a, just a, a, a quick reminder that the, the suggested, suggested items are, are usually limited to description and clarification about 
um, what what the item could be and maybe a reference in terms of why it's being brought forward. Um, with that, I will uh, move to hear from Regent Cruz Crawford. Regent Cruz Crawford, for the record, um, new business. Um, I would like to um, move forward with the discussion or planning, and I don't know where this would be, if it would be in this or committee. Um, but for in regards to dual enrollment slash concurrent enrollment, um, a decision on the distinction of what institutions serve what high schools and programs. So, for example, like Nevada State is specialty in nursing, maybe another institution doesn't. So basically a distinction of who serves who as we are expanding. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'd like to also have a, a discussion of teacher stipends for dual enrollment with a set price rather than a suggested um, amount. And um, I would like to invite, uh, which I've already said, um, but also like to put on record, um, as we are going to grow and grow in the space, in October we have that conference for concurrent enrollment. And as regents, um, if, we, if you would like to attend, I think it will make us be able to make better decisions to see what um, top states are doing um, with that. So those are those three things. And then the fourth thing is separate. I would like perhaps, and I don't know if I say this in the, it, for the committee, that I would like IDEA committee um, to look into um, Sindio. It's S-Y-N-D-I-O. This is the equity database that I'm familiar with. And it's a beautiful database that is made to find equity disparities in um, in hiring practices and pay. And they also, uh, the program also looks in the forefront of what trending things might occur. And it has beautiful graphs that we can all understand. And it is a, a highly rated, highly effective company. So just, just to take a look at that and see what an effective um, equity salary study looks like present station wise. Thank you. Regent Breger. Thank you very much. Susan Breger for the record. I would like to find out if we could have a discussion on a way to calendar that the third or fourth Thursday of every month, we would have a board meeting. And that way we would know we can schedule it. And if we don't have it, then you have a free day or I would go work. And I think that might be, and it doesn't have to be Thursday, but I'm just starting out with a suggestion that uh, might work for all of us to know that it's there. We know what we're doing, when we're doing it, and we don't have to wonder what pops up and I have to cancel my clients or something or try to find someone. I do work for a living, sorry, but $80 a, uh, a meeting doesn't cut it. <laughs> Regent McMichael. Yes, I have, uh, this is uh, Regent McMichael for the record. I have three items for new business. One, I'd like to see that uh, the foundation that deals with these uh, uh, financial gifts uh, come up with some sort of arrangement uh, rather than having this money sit on a shelf because certain terms are not met, that they be able to uh, reach an agreement with the donor that uh, after a certain period of time uh, and if the donor dies, these funds automatically go into the um, uh, general uh, uh, scholarship fund. Uh, two, uh, we receive a stipend uh, of $2,500 every year as regents. And this money is used um, uh, primarily for entertainment. I would like to see that these funds uh, have a dual purpose if they're not used because they tell us they're either used or they're lose, you lose it. That we 
able to uh, put that money into the scholarship fund at the end of uh, the year. And third, but not the least, I would like to look into our legacy programs to see if and when we can uh, uh, disavow ourselves of uh, such an antiquated system uh, where uh, the Supreme Court has already determined that affirmative action should also include legacy programs. If we could find what is the percentage of uh, legacy applicants are accepted uh, and what exactly merits that position, you know, because I think legacy is past due and should be eliminated. Thank you. Vice Chair Arascata. Thank you, Chair Brooks. A um, couple of items. One is I really would like to have a future presentation on the data dashboard by Jose Martinez who I see sitting in the back of the room today. I have been accused by more than one person on that dais and this one, as I look to my left at the acting chancellor who's accused me of geeking out on the data dashboard. I got a little nerdy on it and I really think it's such a helpful item because it truly shows the numbers of the system. And it's updated on a yearly basis when the numbers come in from the school districts and from the campuses Jose does an admirable job of placing it on the data dashboard and not enough people know about this. It is a great source. Um, second, I would just like to give a um, strong recommendation to the entire board that on October 20, I don't have my date. I think it's October 22nd through 25th, the National Alliance of Con Control Concurrent Enrollment and Partnerships is going to be holding their national conference that is going to be held in St. Louis. That is on, I think it's October 22nd through 25th. Is it? Thank you. Um, I just want to give a, a big promotion of that because I unquestionably will be in attendance for this. Um, thank you for your day today. Uh, Chair Brooks, you have seven hours. Let's go another seven, buddy. Yeah, we're moving right along, aren't we? Yeah, glacial pace. <laughs> Regent Boylan. Thank you, Chair Brooks. My new business uh, is about uh, adjunct instructors. I would like the chancellor or the acting chancellor after him and the presidents to bring, bring to this board some way that we can increase the salaries of the adjunct instructors. I know all the instructors were here for COLA. They all got a nice big, uh, everybody got a nice big uh, increase. And my second thing would be, especially if those adjunct instructors are teaching uh, dual enrollment classes, that they too be given an extra amount of money. But the first thing, of course, everybody's wondering, where do we get this money from? Our adjunct instructors teach the same classes with more world experience. They don't get benefits. They don't get anything. They just get a simple, miserable salary, which I know I used to get it. So I do believe that we need to change this so we can improve education and improve entry. They're extremely important to us. Thank you, sir. Regent Alcarlo. Thank you, I had to get unmuted. Um, I'd like to remind my colleagues, I'm the only one signed up to attend the Association of Community College Trustees Leadership Congress right there in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, October 9th through the 12th. So there's not any travel for 10 of you regions anyway, and it, they're always excellent conferences. And we do teach those ourselves, in fact, President Dolpy and I will be doing a presentation. So that's one thing. And the early bird uh, registration is coming up soon. So that's one item. Second item would be at a future meeting to explain our whole 
presidential evaluation process. So we all know what we have right now. And that could always be changed. But if you don't know what we have, how are you going to change it? So, and then my third one would be with the dual enrollment. I've said this multiple times that we know that what we measure matters. We have five strategic goals. We were working on expanding some of those goals, but within our goals, I'd love to see us measure some of this dual enrollment um, stats, uh, make some metrics on them. I don't know if it go into access or success, maybe both. Um, and to be able to collect the data on the dual enrollment students, like the rate of acceptance into our universities, and possibly even have that task force come back and give us their recommendations. So I'd really, you can see this board is really hungry for knowledge. And that always is a great sign. I, I think that's great. Um, you can see dual enrollment really is the future. And uh, we're doing our state a disservice by not tripling it. If, if Indiana can do it at 60%, we certainly can too. Thank you. Thank you all for the uh, patience regarding the, um, the meeting today. We appreciate all the input, the reports, the analysis that we've been provided. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I got, I, got, I got a little ahead of myself. And it like everybody came in with the public comment, which I appreciate. Um, yeah. Okay. Is there any public comments in Elko? There is no public comment in Elko. Is there any public comments in Reno? There is no public comment in Reno. Is there any public comments here in Las Vegas? I, I, don't, I don't see any public comment in Las Vegas. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>